Preface to the Romance of Modern Sieges. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Preface to the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. These chapters are not histories of sieges, but narratives of such incidents as occur in beleaguered cities and illustrate human nature in some of its strangest moods. That facts are stranger than fiction, these stories go to prove. Such unexpected issues, such improbable interpositions, meet us in the pages of history. What writer of fiction would dare to throw down battlements and walls by an earthquake, and represent besiegers as paralyzed by religious fear? These tales are full indeed of all the elements of romance, from the heroism and self-devotion of the brave, and the patient suffering of the wounded, to the generosity of mortal foes, and the kindliness and humor which gleam even on the battlefield and in the hospital but the realities of war have not been kept out of sight now and then the veil has been lifted and the reader has been shown a glimpse of those awful scenes which haunt the memory of even the stoutest veteran we cannot realize fully the life that a soldier lives unless we see both sides of that life we cannot feel the gratitude that we ought to feel unless we know the strain and suspense the agony and endurance that go to make up victory or defeat in time of war we are full of admiration for our soldiers and sailors but in the past they have been too often forgotten or slighted when peace has ensued not to keep in memory the great deeds of our countrymen is mere ingratitude hearty acknowledgments are due to the authors and publishers who have so kindly permitted quotation from their books every such permission is more particularly mentioned in its place the writer has also had many a talk with men who have fought in the crimea in india in france and in south africa and is indebted to them for some little personal touches such as give life and color to a narrative End of preface Chapter One of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One Siege of Gibraltar, seventeen seventy nine, seventeen eighty two. The Position of the Rock, State of Defense, Food Supply, Rodney Brings Relief, Fire Ships Sent In, A Convoy in a Fog, Heavy Guns Bombard the Town, Watching the Cannon Ball catalina gets no gift one against fourteen red-hot shot save the day lord howe to the rescue gibraltar what a thrill does the very name evoke to one who knows a little of english history and england's heroes but to those who have the good fortune to steam in a p and o liner down the coast of portugal and catch sight of the rock on turning by cabrita point into the bay of algeciras the thrill of admiration is intensified for the great rock lies like a lion couched on the marge of the mediterranean it is one of the pillars of hercules it commands the entrance to the inner sea from seven twelve to the beginning of the fourteenth century gibraltar was in the hands of the saracens then it fell into the hands of the spaniards in seventeen o four the year of blenheim a combined English and Dutch fleet under Sir George Rook captured the rock from the Marquis de Salinas, and Gibraltar has since then remained in the possession of the English, though several attempts have been made to wrest it from us. Before we follow Captain Drinkwater in some details of the great siege, a few words must be said about the rock and its defences as they then were the rock itself juts out like a promontory rising to a height of thirteen hundred feet and joined to the spanish mainland by a low sandy isthmus which is at the foot of the rock about two thousand seven hundred feet broad on a narrow ledge at the foot of the northwest slope lies the little town huddled up beneath the frowning precipice and bristling batteries excavated out of the solid rock at different heights up to the very crest batteries are planted half or wholly concealed by the galleries 
all along the sea line were bastions mounted with great guns and howitzers and supplied with casemates for a thousand men in all the fortifications were armed with six hundred and sixty three pieces of artillery conspicuous among the buildings was an old moorish castle on the northwest side of the hill here was planted the grand battery with the governor's residence at the upper corner of the walls many caves and hollows are found in the hill convenient both for powder magazines and also for hiding places to the apes who colonize the rock the climate even at midwinter is so mild and warm that cricket and tennis can be played on dry grass wherever a lawn can be found in the neighborhood as the writer has experienced but at gibraltar itself all is stony ground and barren rock only on the western slope a few palmettos grow with lavender and spanish broom roses and asphodels in seventeen seventy seven a good opportunity seemed to be offered for spain to recover the rock from england the north american colonies had seceded and the prestige of britain had suffered a severe blow the fleets of france and spain sixty six sail of the line were opposed by sir charles hardy's thirty eight but with these he prevented the enemy from landing an invading army on the english shore but spain was intent on retaking gibraltar and had already planted batteries across the isthmus which connects the rock with spain general elliot the governor of gibraltar had a garrison of five thousand three hundred and eighty two strong four hundred and twenty eight artillerymen and one hundred and six engineers admiral duff had brought his ships a sixty-gun man-of-war three frigates and a sloop alongside the new mole all preparations were made to resist a siege towards the middle of august the enemy succeeded in establishing a strict blockade with the object of reducing the garrison by famine there were not more than forty head of cattle in the place and supplies from africa were intercepted by the spanish cruisers in november the effects of scarcity began to be felt though many of the inhabitants had been sent away mutton was three shillings a pound ducks fourteen shillings a couple even fish and bread were very scarce general elliot set the example of abstemious living and for eight days he lived on four ounces of rice a day the inhabitants had for some time been put upon a daily ration of bread delivered under the protection of sentries with fixed bayonets but even with this safeguard for the week there was a scene of struggling daily many times the stronger got more than their share the weaker came away empty-handed and eked out a wretched existence on leeks and thistles even soldiers and their families were perilously near starvation so that a listless apathy fell on the majority and they looked seaward in vain for a help that did not arrive it was not until the fifteenth of january seventeen eighty that the joyful news went round the little town of a brig in the offing which bore the british flag she cannot pass the batteries she is standing in for the old mole hurrah the brig brought the tidings of approaching relief and many a wet eye kindled with hope but the lookout on signal point could see the spaniards in algeciras bay preparing for sea eleven men of war to cut off the convoy again the hopes of the garrison went down they did not know neither did the spaniards that admiral sir george rodney an old harrow boy was escorting the convoy with a powerful fleet of twenty-one sail of the line he quickly drove the eleven spaniards into headlong flight but before rounding into the bay he fell in with fifteen spanish merchantmen and six ships of war which became his prize then for a time the town and garrison enjoyed themselves frugally and life became worth living but on the departure of rodney the spaniards tried to destroy the british vessels in the bay with fire ships it was on a june night that the fire spread and the gleam shot across the water lighting up algeciras and the cork forests that clothe the mountainside then the alarm was given the panther a sixty-gun man-o-war and the other armed ships opened fire on the assailants 
officers and men sprang into their boats and grappled the blazing ships making fast hawsers and towing them under the great guns of the rock where they were promptly sunk again the blight of ennui sickness and famine came on the little garrison but in october a cargo of fruit came just in time to save them from scurvy in march seventeen eighty one the want of bread became serious biscuit crumbs were selling for a shilling a pound how long was the anxious cry that was felt if not expressed in words had england forgotten her brave men on the twelfth of april to the joyful surprise of all a great convoy was signalled escorted by a strong fleet every man woman and child who could walk came out upon the ramparts and gazed seawards with glistening eyes at daybreak says the historian of the siege admiral darby's much expected fleet was in sight from our signal house but it was not discernible from below being obscured by a thick mist in the gut as the sun rose however the fog rose too like the curtain of a vast theatre discovering to the anxious garrison one of the most beautiful and pleasing scenes it is possible to conceive the ecstasies of the inhabitants at this grand and exhilarating sight are not to be described but alas they little dreamed of the tremendous blow that impended which was to annihilate their property and reduce many of them to indigence and beggary for this second relief of the garrison stung the spaniards into the adoption of a measure which inflicted a large amount of suffering on the citizens they at once began to bombard the town with sixty-four heavy guns and fifty mortars all amongst the crowds in the narrow winding streets through the frail roofs and windows came shot and shell so that one and all fled from their homes seeking cover among the rocks this was the time for thieves to operate and many houses were rifled of their contents then it was discovered that many hucksters and liquor dealers had been hoarding and hiding their stocks and a fire having broken out in a wine shop the soldiers tasted and drank to excess then in a few days the discipline became relaxed many of the garrison stole and took away to their quarters barrels of wine which they proceeded to stow away to their own peril and ruin at length general elliot was compelled to issue orders that any soldier found drunk or asleep at his post should be shot what surprises us in our days of long-distance firing is the strange fact that a man with sharp vision could see one of the cannon-balls as it came towards him one day we are told an officer saw a ball coming his way but he was so fascinated by it that he could not move out of the way another day a shot fell into a house in which nearly twenty people were gathered together all escaped except one child on another occasion a shop came through the embrasures of one of the british batteries took off the legs of two men one leg of another and wounded a fourth man in both legs so that four men had seven legs taken off and wounded by one shot a boy who had been posted on the works on account of his keenness of vision to warn the men when a cannonball was coming their way had only just been complaining that they did not heed his warnings and while he turned to the men this shot which did all this hurt was fired by the enemy a large cannon-ball in those days weighed thirty pounds others much less the author remembers admiral Cullum telling the harrow boys in a lecture that a captain of those days could carry two or more cannon-balls in his coat-tail pocket the balls of modern guns have to be moved by hydraulic machinery yet it is astonishing how much damage the old cannon-balls could inflict lopping along like overgrown cricket-balls as they did sometimes incidents happened of an amusing character one day a soldier was rummaging about among the ruins of a fallen house and came upon a find of watches and jewels he bethought him at once of a very pretty spanish girl who had coquetted with him in the gardens of the alameda now let me see he murmured to himself how can i put this away safe little catalina will laugh when she sees them there jewels i'll be bound hm 
i can't take this lot to quarters that's sartin them sergeants as feel one all around on return from duty will grab the lot so he walked on musing and pondering over his weighty affair as he was passing the king's bastion a happy thought struck him by george sir he said to himself it's just the very thing who would think of looking for a watch inside a gun and he chuckled to himself it was high noon the sentinel seemed half asleep the soldier tied up his prize in his handkerchief took out the wad of the gun and slipped his treasure trove into the bore of the cannon replacing the wad carefully that evening he met catalina and managed to inform her that he had a pleasant surprise for her if she could come to the king's bastion her dark eyes glanced mischievously no not in the evening i thank you jacko i will come to-morrow an hour off for sunrise very well catalina i see you do not trust me to-morrow then you shall come with me to the king's bastion and see with your own eyes how rich i can make you catalina understood enough english to laugh heartily at her lover's grave and mysterious words he has stolen a loaf and a bottle of wine she thought in her simplicity however catalina did not disappoint jack and together they paced towards the semicircular platform of the king's bastion jack was a very proud man as he tried to explain to his lady-love what a surprise was in store for her he touched her wrist to show how the bracelets would fit and her shapely neck to prove the existence of a splendid necklace and catalina began to believe her boy but as they came out upon the gun platform jack stopped suddenly and uttered a fearful oath oh dios cried the maid what is there to hurt jacko don't you see oh catalina the game is up that devil of a gunner is wiping out the bore of his gun jack ran up and seizing the man by the arm said i say mate if you have found a parcel in that gun it's mine i put it in last night i tell you it's mine mate don't you try to make believe you have not seen it cause i know you has the gunner stared in open-mouthed astonishment at the speaker at last he said with a touch of sarcasm what for do you think i am wiping out her mouth you silly you must have slept pretty sound not to know that them gunboats crept up again last night the devil take them then where's the gold watch of mine and them jewels i put em for safety in that fool of a gun oh then you may depend upon it my lad that the watch-glass has got broke for we fired a many rounds in the night what for you look so to cry asked little catalina in wonder oh come away sweetheart you will get no rich present this year them spaniards have collared em all oh lord oh lord on the seventh of july the spaniards at cabrita point were seen to be signalling the approach of an enemy as the mists melted away the garrison could see a ship becalmed out in the bay fourteen gunboats from algeciras had put out to cut her off on this captain curtis of the brilliant ordered three barges to row alongside and receive any dispatches she might have on board this was done just before the leading spanish gunboat got within range then came a hideous storm of round and grape shot as the fourteen gunboats circled round the helma but captain roberts though he had only fourteen small guns returned their fire gallantly the english sloop was lying becalmed about a league from the rock and the garrison in gibraltar could do nothing to help her they looked every minute to see the helma sink but still she battled on against their twenty-six pounders then when hope seemed desperate a westerly breeze sprang up the waters darkened and rippled round the helma her canvas slowly filled out and she came away with torn sails and rigging to the shelter of the mole in september seventeen eighty two a grand attack was made by the spaniards with ten men-of-war gunboats mortar-boats and floating batteries they took up their position about nine hundred yards from the king's bastion four hundred pieces of the heaviest artillery were crashing and thundering while all the air was thick with smoke general elliot had made his preparations the round shot was being heated in portable furnaces all along the front and as the furnaces were insufficient 
huge fires were lit in the angles between buildings on which our roast potatoes as the soldiers nicknamed the hot shot were being baked but the enemy's battering ships seemed invulnerable our heaviest shells often rebounded from their tops whilst the thirty-two pound shot seemed incapable of making any visible impression upon their hulls frequently we flattered ourselves they were on fire but no sooner did any smoke appear than with admirable intrepidity men were observed applying water from their engines within to those places where the smoke issued even the artillery themselves at this period had their doubts of the effect of the red-hot shot which began to be used about twelve but were not general till about one or two o'clock after some hours incessant firing the masts of several spanish ships were seen to be toppling over the flagship and the admiral's second ship were on fire and on board some others confusion was seen to be prevailing their fire slackened while ours increased then as night came on the gleams spread across the troubled waters the cannonade of the garrison increased in rapidity and power at one in the morning two ships were blazing mast high and the others soon caught fire from the red-hot shot or from the flying sparks the light and glow of this fearful conflagration brought out the weird features of the whole bay the sombre rock the blood-red sea the white houses of algeciras five miles across the dark cork forests and the spanish mountains all stood out in strange perspective amid the roar of cannon were fitfully heard the hoarse murmurs of the crowds that lined the shore and the screams of burning men sometimes a deep gloom shrouded the background of earth and sea while gigantic columns of curling serpent flame shot up from the blazing hulls brigadier curtis who was encamped at europa point now took out his flotilla of twelve gunboats each being armed with a twenty-four pounder in its bow and took the floating batteries in flank compelling the spanish relieving boats to retire daylight showed a sight never to be forgotten the flames had paled before the sun but the dark forms of the spaniards moving amongst the fire and shrieking for help and compassion stirred all the feelings of humanity some were clinging to the sides of the burning ships others were flinging themselves into the waves curtis led his boats up to the smoking hulks in order to rescue some of the victims he and his men climbed on board the battering ships at the risk of their lives and helped down the spaniards who were profuse in their expressions of gratitude but as the english thus worked for the rescue of their enemies the magazine of one of the spanish ships blew up with a crash at about five o'clock and a quarter of an hour after another exploded in the centre of the line burning splinters were hurled around in all directions and involved the british gunboats in grave danger in the brigadier's boat his coxswain was killed his stroke wounded and a hole was forced through the bottom of the boat after landing three hundred and fifty seven spaniards the english were compelled to retire under the cover of the rock leaving the remainder to their dreadful fate of the six ships still on fire three blew up before eleven o'clock the other three burned down to the water's edge thus ended the attempt to take the rock by means of floating castles the loss sustained by the spaniards was about two thousand killed wounded and taken prisoners whereas the losses in the garrison were surprisingly small considering how long a cannonade had been kept up upon the forts sixteen only were killed eighteen officers sergeants and rank and file were wounded yet the enemy had been firing more than three hundred pieces of heavy ordnance while the english garrison could bring to bear only eighty cannon seven mortars and nine howitzers but even for these they expended seven hundred and sixteen barrels of powder as admiral lord howe was sailing with a powerful fleet to the help of gibraltar he heard the news of general elliot's splendid defence on the night of the eighteenth of october seventeen eighty two a great storm scattered the french and spanish ships and soon after 
the delighted garrison saw lord howe's fleet and his convoy containing fresh troops and provisions approaching in order of battle the blockade was now virtually at an end the siege had lasted three years seven months and twelve days since then no attempt has been made to capture gibraltar end of chapter one chapter two of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two defence of acre seventeen ninety nine jaffa stormed by napoleon sir sidney smith hurries to acre takes a convoy how the french procured cannon-balls the turks fear the mines a noisy sortie fourteen assaults a damascus blade seventy shells explode napoleon nearly killed the siege raised a painful retreat napoleon bonaparte had crushed all opposition in central and southern europe but there was one power which foiled him great britain the french government compelled spain and holland to join in a naval war against england but jervis and nelson broke and scattered the combined fleets bonaparte had conceived a bitter hatred against the only power which now defied the might of france and was causing him to miss his destiny i will conquer egypt and india then attacking turkey i will take europe in the rear so he wrote in the spring of seventeen ninety eight he set out for egypt reducing malta on the way and just eluding nelson's fleet he had got as far as cairo when he heard of nelson's victory at aboukir bay where his french fleet was destroyed but bonaparte undaunted pressed on to attack syria he stormed jaffa and put the garrison to the sword not content with this cruelty he marched the townsfolk to the number of thirty seven hundred into the middle of a vast square formed by the french troops the poor wretches shed no tears uttered no cries some who were wounded and could not march so fast as the rest were bayoneted on the way the others were halted near a pool of dirty stagnant water divided into small bodies marched in different directions and there shot down when the french soldiers had exhausted their cartridges the sword and bayonet finished the business sir sidney smith a captain commanding a few ships in the levant hearing of these atrocities hurried with his ships to st jean d'acre which lies north of jaffa on the north end of the bay which is protected on the south by the chalk headland of carmel jutting out like our beachy head far into the sea sir sidney arrived in the tiger at acre only two days before bonaparte appeared on the seventeenth of march he sent the tiger's boats by night to the foot of mount carmel and there they found the french advanced guard encamped close to the water's edge the boats opened with grape and the french retired in a hurry up the side of the mount the main body of the army hearing that the sea road was exposed to gunfire from british ships went round by nazareth and invested acre to the east a french corvette and nine sail of gun vessels coming round mount carmel found themselves close to the english fleet and seven of them were made prizes manned from the ships and employed to harass the enemy's posts the french trenches were opened on the twentieth of march with thirty-two cannons but they were deficient in balls the french general montholon tells us how they made the english provide them with cannon-balls it reminds us of our own plan at jellalabad he says that napoleon from time to time ordered a few wagons to be driven near the sea in sight of which sir sidney would send in shore one of his ships and pour a rolling fire around the wagons presently the french troops would run to the spot collect all the balls they could find and bring them in to the director of artillery receiving five sous for each ball this they did while laughter resounded on every side the french could afford to be merry under bonaparte they had become the masters of the greater part of europe 
nothing seemed impossible to them under that military genius here they were besieging a little trumpery syrian town which they calculated they could take in three days for said they it is not so strong as jaffa its garrison only amounts to two thousand or three thousand men whereas jaffa had a garrison of eight thousand turks on the twenty fifth of march the french had made a breach in the tower which was considered practicable a young officer with fifteen sappers and twenty-five grenadiers was ordered to mount to the assault and clear the tower fort but a counterscarp fifteen feet high stopped them many were wounded and they hastily retired on the twenty eighth a mine was sprung and they assaulted again but the turks exerted themselves so far on this occasion writes sir sidney as to knock the assailants off their ladders into the ditch where about forty of their bodies now lie montelon writes the breach was found to be too high by several feet and mailly an officer of the staff and others were killed when the Turks saw Adjutant Le Sugier fixing the ladder, a panic seized them, and many fled to the port. Even Jezar, the governor, had embarked. It was very unfortunate. That was the day on which the town ought to have been taken. Early in April a sortie took place in which the British Marines were to force their way into the French mine, while the Turks attacked the trenches the sally took place just before daylight but the noise and shouting of the turks rendered the attempt to surprise the enemy useless but they succeeded in destroying part of the mine at considerable loss the turks brought in above sixty heads many muskets and entrenching tools we have taught the besiegers writes sir sidney to respect the enemy they have to deal with so as to keep at a greater distance on the first of may the enemy after many hours heavy cannonade from thirty pieces of artillery brought from jaffa made a fourth attempt to mount the breach now much widened but were repulsed with loss the tiger moored on one side and the theseus on the other flank the town walls and the gunboats launches etc flank the enemy's trenches to their great annoyance nothing but desperation can induce them to make the sort of attempts they do to mount the breach under such a fire as we pour in upon them and it is impossible to see the lives even of our enemies thus sacrificed and so much bravery misapplied without regret i must not omit to mention to the credit of the turks that they fetch gabions fascines and other material which the garrison does not afford from the face of the enemy's works by the ninth of may the french had on nine several occasions attempted to storm but had been beaten back with immense slaughter on the fifty-first day of the siege the english had been reinforced by hassan bey with corvettes and transports but this only made bonaparte attack with more ferocity having protected themselves with sandbags and the bodies of their dead built in with them it was a touch-and-go whether the french would not fight their way in a group of generals was assembled at Coeur de Leon's mount among whom napoleon was distinguishable as he raised his glasses and gesticulated at this critical moment sir sidney landed his boats at the mole and took the crews up to the breach armed with pikes the enthusiastic gratitude of the turks men women and children at sight of such a reinforcement is not to be described the few turks who were standing their ground in the breach were flinging heavy stones down on the heads of the advancing foe but many of the french mounted to the heap of ruins in the breach so close that the muzzles of their muskets touched and their spearheads locked jezir pasha on hearing that so large a force of the english were fighting in the breach left his seat where according to turkish custom he was sitting to distribute rewards to such as should bring him the heads of the enemy and coming behind our men the energetic old man pulled back his english friends with violence saying if any harm happens to the english all is lost a sally made by the turks in another quarter caused the french in the trenches to uncover themselves above their parapet so that the fire from our boats brought down numbers of them a little before sunset a massive column came up to the breach with solemn step 
by the pasha's orders a good number of the french were let in and they descended from the rampart into the pasha's garden where in a few minutes their bravest lay headless corpses the sabre proving more than a match for the bayonet the rest seeing what was done fled precipitately the breach was now practicable for fifty men abreast we felt says sir sidney that we must defend it at all costs for by this breach bonaparte means to march to further conquest and on the issue of this conflict depends the conduct of the thousands of spectators who sit on the surrounding hills waiting to see which side they shall join with regard to the cutting off of heads by the turks one day when out riding sir sidney questioned the superior metal of the damascus blade when jezar pasha replied that such a blade would separate the head from the body of any animal without turning the edge look said the pasha this one i carry about with me never fails it has taken off some dozens of heads very well pasha said sir sidney could you not give me ocular proof of the merit of your damascus and at the same time of your own expertness by slicing off en passant the head of one of the oxen we are now approaching ah qui monsieur c'est déjà fait and springing off at a gallop he smote a poor ox as it was grazing close to the path and the head immediately rolled on the ground a damascus sabre regards neither joints nor bones but goes slicing through and you cannot feel any dent on the edge thereof on the fourteenth of may sir sidney writes to his brother our labour is excessive many of us have died of fatigue i am but half dead and nearly blinded by sun and sand bonaparte brings fresh troops to the assault two or three times in the night and so we are obliged to be always under arms he has lost the flower of his army in these desperate attempts to storm as appears by the certificates of former services which we find in their pockets we have been now near two months constantly under fire and firing we cannot guard the coast lower down than mount carmel for the pasha tells me if we go away the place will fall so that the french get supplies from jaffa to the south i sent captain miller in the theseus yesterday to chase three french frigates off caesarea but alas seventy shells burst at the forepart of captain miller's cabin killing him and thirty-two men including some who jumped overboard and were drowned the ship got on fire in five places but was saved by the sixteenth of may bonaparte had lost eight generals and most of his artillerymen in all upwards of four thousand men the turks were becoming quite brave and confident they boldly rushed in on the assaulting columns sabre in hand and cut them to pieces before they could fire twice but they were struck with terror at the thought of the mines which they imagined might blow up at any time and could not be forced to remain on the walls or in the tower however the knowledge which the garrison had of the massacre at jaffa rendered them desperate in their personal defence in the fourteenth assault general kleber led his victorious troops to the breach it was a grand and terrific spectacle the grenadiers rushed forward under a shower of balls kleber with the gait of a giant with his thick head of hair and stentorian voice had taken his post sword in hand on the bank of the breach the noise of the cannon the rage of the soldiers the yells of the turks were all bewildering and awful general bonaparte standing on the battery of the breach looking rather paler than usual was following the progress of the assault through his glasses when a ball passed above his head but he would not budge in vain did berthier ask him to quit this perilous post he received no answer and two or three officers were killed close to him yet he made no sign of moving from the spot all at once the column of the besiegers came to a standstill bonaparte went further forward and then perceived that the ditch was vomiting out flames and smoke it was impossible to go on kleber in a great rage struck his thigh with his sword and swore but the general-in-chief judging the obstacle to be insurmountable gave a gesture and ordered a retreat 
after this failure the french grenadiers absolutely refused to mount the breach any more over the putrid bodies of their unburied companions bonaparte for once seems to have lost his judgment first by sacrificing so many of his best men in trying to take a third-rate fort and secondly because even if he had succeeded in taking the town the fire of the english ships must have driven him out again in a short time one last desperate throw was made for success by sending an arab dervish with a letter to the pasha proposing a cessation of arms for the purpose of burying the dead during the conference of the english and turkish generals on this subject a volley of shot and shells on a sudden announced an assault but the garrison was ready and all they did was to increase the numbers of the slain to the disgrace of the general who thus disloyally sacrificed them the game was up after a siege of sixty days in the night following the twentieth of may the french army began to retreat but as they could not carry their guns and wounded with them they were hurried to sea without seamen to navigate the ships in want of water and food they steered straight for the english ships and claimed and received succor their expressions of gratitude to sir sidney were mingled with execrations on their general for his cruel treatment of them english boats rowed along the shore and harassed their march south the whole track between acre and gaza was strewn with the dead bodies of those who had sunk under fatigue or from their wounds at gaza bonaparte turned inland but there he was much molested by the arabs the remnant of a mighty host went on creeping towards egypt in much confusion and disorder sir sidney smith had thus defeated the great general of france who grudgingly said this man has made me miss my destiny in the hour of victory sir sidney was generous and humane for he had a good heart good humour and much pity nor did he forget the giver of all victory as the following extract from a letter testifies nazareth seventeen ninety nine i am just returned from the cave of the annunciation where secretly and alone i have been returning thanks to the almighty for our late wonderful success well may we exclaim the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong w s s end of chapter two Chapter Three of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: The Wounded Captain at Talavera, 1809. Talavera between two fires. Captain Boothby wounded. Brought into Talavera. The fear of the citizens. The surgeon's delay. Operations without chloroform. The English retire. French troops arrive. Plunder french officers kind and protect boothby a private bent on loot beats a hasty retreat captain boothby of the royal engineers left behind him a diary of his experiences in spain during part of the peninsular war in eighteen o nine it will help us to understand how much suffering war inflicts and how much pain we have been saved by the inventions of modern science he tells us he had been provided with quarters at talavera at the house of doña polonia de monton a venerable dame she was the only person left in the house the rest having fled to the mountains in fear lest the french should come and sack the city for in the streets those who remained were shouting in their panic the french have taken the suburbs or the english general is in full retreat or o oh, dios los ingleses nos abandonan oh god the english are deserting us the fact was that wellesley was not sure if he could hold his ground at talavera captain boothby went out one morning towards the enemy's position he was brought back in the evening on a bier by four men his leg shattered by a musket ball the old lady threw up her hands when she saw him return what she exclaimed while the tears ran down her cheeks can this be the same this he whose cheeks in the morning were glowing with health blessed virgin see how white they are now she made haste to prepare a bed 
oh what luxury to be laid upon it after the hours of pain and anxiety almost hopeless i had undergone the surgeon mr bell cut off my boot and having examined the wound said sir i fear there is no chance of saving your leg and the amputation must be above the knee he said the operation could not be performed until the morning and went back to the hospital i passed a night of excruciating pain my groans were faint because my body was exhausted with the three hours stumbling about in the woods daylight was ushered in by a roar of cannon so loud so continuous that i hardly conceived the wars of all the earth could produce such a wild and illimitable din every shot seemed to shake the house with increasing violence and poor doña polonia rushed in crying they are firing the town no no said i don't be frightened why should they fire the town don't you perceive that the firing is becoming more distant so the poor lady became less distraught and watched by him with sympathizing sorrow but at length finding the day advancing his pains unabating and no signs of any medical help coming he tore a leaf from his pocket-book and with a pencil wrote a note to the chief surgeon mr higgins saying that as he had been informed no time was to be lost in the amputation he was naturally anxious that his case should be attended to the messenger returned saying that the surgeon could not possibly leave the hospital he sent a second note and a third and towards ten o'clock a m the harassed surgeon made his appearance captain boothby said he i am extremely sorry that i could not possibly come here before still more sorry that i only come now to tell you i cannot serve you there is but one case of instruments this i cannot bring from the hospital while crowds of wounded both officers and men are pressing for assistance i did but wish to take my turn said the captain i hope he added that towards evening the crowd will decrease and that i shall be able to bring mr gunning with me to consult upon your case will you examine my wound sir said boothby and tell me honestly whether you apprehend any danger from the delay he examined the leg and said no i see nothing in this case from which the danger would be increased by waiting five or six hours there was nothing for it but patience i taxed my mind to make an effort but pain far from loosening his fangs at the suggestion of reason clung fast and taught me that in spite of mental pride he is and must be dreadful to the human frame mr higgins came to him about three o'clock bringing with him mr gunning and mr bell and such instruments as they might have occasion for mr gunning sat down by his bedside and made a formal exhortation explained that to save the life it was necessary to part with the limb and he required of him an effort of mind and a manly resolution whatever is necessary that i am ready to bear said the captain then the surgeons having examined his wound went to another part of the room to consult after which they withdrew to bring the apparatus as he imagined hours passed and they did not return his servant aaron having sought mr gunning was told that he was too much occupied this after having warned him that there was no time to be lost go then said the captain to aaron go into the street and bring me the first medical officer you happen to fall in with he returned bringing with him mr grasset surgeon of the forty eighth regiment after examining the wound mr grasset declared that he was by no means convinced of the necessity of the amputation and would not undertake the responsibility but said the wounded man i suppose an attempt to save the leg will be attended with great danger so will the amputation he replied but we must hope for the best and i see nothing to make your cure impossible the bones to be sure are much shattered and the leg is much mangled and swollen but have you been bled sir no said captain boothby mr grasset conceived bleeding absolutely necessary though he had already lost much and at his request he bled him in the arm he guessed that mr gunning's departure proceeded from his conviction that a gangrene had already begun and that it would be cruel to disturb his dying moments by a painful and fruitless operation 
as he had taken nothing but vinegar and water since his misfortune his strength was exhausted and the operation of bleeding was succeeded by an interval of unconsciousness from this state he was roused by some one taking hold of his hand it was his friend dr fitzpatrick if i had you in london said he with a sigh i might attempt to save your limb but amid the present circumstances it would be hopeless i had been told that the amputation had been performed else ill as i could have been spared i would have left the field and come to you do you think you are come too late asked the captain he said no but he dissembled at that time boothby was under strong symptoms of lockjaw which did not disappear until many hours after the operation the doctor took a towel and soaking it in vinegar and water laid it on the wound which gave much relief he stayed with him till late changing the lotion as often as needed the operation was fixed for daylight on the morrow the patient passed another dismal night at nine o'clock next morning fitzpatrick and miller higgins and bell staff surgeons came to his bedside they had put a table in the middle of the room and placed on it a mattress then one of the surgeons came and exhorted him to summon his fortitude boothby told him he need not be afraid and fitzpatrick said he could answer for him they then carried him to the table and laid him on the mattress mr miller wished to place a handkerchief over his eyes but he assured them that it was unnecessary he would look another way i saw that the knife was in fitzpatrick's hand which being as i wished i averted my head i will not shock the reader by describing the operation in detail but as it is a common idea that the most painful part of an operation lies in sundering the bone i may rectify an error by declaring that the only part of the process in which the pain comes up to the natural anticipation is the first incision round the limb by which the skin is divided the sensation of which is as if a prodigious weight were impelling the severing edge the sawing of the bone gives no uneasy sensation or if any it is overpowered by others more violent is it off said i as i felt it separate yes said fitzpatrick your sufferings are over ah no you have yet to take up the arteries it will give you no pain he said kindly and that was true at least after what i had undergone the pain seemed nothing i was carried back to my bed much exhausted soon hope returned to my breast it was something to have preserved the possibility of yet being given back to happiness and friendship for some time after the operation his stomach refused sustenance and a constant hiccup was recognized by the surgeons as a fatal prognostic his faithful friend edmund mulcaster hardly ever left his bedside general sherbrooke came to see him often and evinced the most earnest anxiety for his welfare they wrote to his friends for him and to his mother this last he signed himself in the night of the thirtieth by the perseverance of mulcaster he managed to retain some mulled wine strongly spiced and in the morning took two eggs from the same welcome hand this was the turn the unfavorable symptoms began to subside and the flowing stream of life began to fill by degrees its almost deserted channels on the second of august some officers entering his room said that information had been received of soult's arrival at placentia and that general wellesley intended to head back and engage him if the french come while we are away boothby said goldfinch you must cry out capitaine anglais and you will be treated well on the third of august his friends all came to take leave of him it was a blank rugged moment mr higgins the senior surgeon was left behind to tend the wounded the mass of the people of england is hasty and often unjust in its judgment of military events they will condemn a general as rash when he advances or revile him as a coward when he retreats news of the battle of talavera had been announced by the trumpet of victory the people of england expected the emancipation of spain now were they cast down when told that the victors had been obliged to retire and leave their wounded to the mercy of a vanquished enemy if lord wellington knew the strength and condition of the force under soult it would be hard to justify his conduct in facing back 
in spain however it was impossible to get correct information the spaniards are deaf to bad news and idiotically credulous to all reports that flatter their hopes thus the rashness of lord wellington in placing himself between two armies salt and ney the least of whom was equal to himself may be palliated the repulse and flight of the french after the battle of talavera restored confidence to the fugitive townsfolk they left the mountains and re-entered talavera the house was again filled with old and young who strove to wait on the captain but soon the evacuation of the town by the british awoke their fears but with thankfulness let us record that a british officer wounded and mutilated was to the women of the house too sacred an object to be abandoned the citizens of talavera had clung to the hope that at least their countrymen would stay and protect them but on the fourth seeing them also file under their windows in a long receding array they came to the captain those near his house beating their breasts and tearing their hair and demanding of him if he knew what was to become of them boothby sent aaron to take a message to the colonel left commandant by general wellesley but he came back saying that the colonel was gone having given orders that those in the hospitals who were able to move should set off instantly for oropesa as the french were at hand the sensation this notice produced is beyond all description the captain lay perfectly still other wounded men had themselves placed across horses and mules and fruitlessly attempted to escape the road to oropesa was covered with our poor wounded limping bloodless soldiers on crutches or sticks they hobbled woefully along for the moment panic terror lent them a new force but many lay down on the road to take their last sleep such were the tales that aaron and others came to tell him he tried to comfort them and said the french were not so bad as they fancied still his mind was far from being at ease he thought it possible that some foraging party might plunder him and commit excesses in the house or on the women who would run to him for protection however uselessly the evening of the fourth however closed in quietness and a visit from the senior medical officer mr higgins gave him great comfort the fifth of august dawned still and lovely a traveller might have supposed talavera to be in prolonged peace until gazing on her gory heights he saw they were covered with heaps of ghastly slain the tranquil interval was employed in laying in a stock of provisions pedro argued with him but signor the brancon asks a dollar a couple for his chickens bye 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 was all the answer he could get from the captain wine eggs and other provender were laid in at a rate which provoked the rage and remonstrance of the little italian servant about the middle of the day a violent running and crying under the windows announced an alarm the women rushed into his room exclaiming los francescas los francescas the assistant surgeon of artillery came in well mr steneland said the captain are the french coming yes he answered i believe so mr higgins has gone out to meet them that's right said boothby in about an hour mr higgins entered saying i have been out of town about two leagues and can see nothing of them if they do come they will have every reason to treat us with attention for they will find their own wounded lying alongside of ours provided with the same comforts and the same care on the sixth reports of the enemy's approach were treated with total disregard between eight and nine o'clock the galloping of horses was heard in the street the women ran to the windows and instantly shrank back pale as death with finger on lip los demonios they whispered and then on tiptoe watched in breathless expectation of seeing some bloody scene they have swords and pistols already cried maniola trembling how's this cried old doña polonia why they pass the english soldiers they go on talking and laughing jesus mary what does it mean presently mr higgins came in 
he had ridden out to meet the french general and had found that officer full of encomiums and good assurances your wounded are the most sacred trust to our national generosity as for you medical gentlemen who have been humane and manly enough not to desert your duty to your patients many of whom are frenchmen stay amongst us as long as you please you are as free as the air you breathe the town owed much to mr higgins to prepare for the approaching crisis to ride forth and parley with the enemy and persuade him that he owes you respect gratitude this is to be an officer of the first class throughout mr higgins displayed the character of no common man we should say something of the household among which the captain was placed servants and masters and mistresses in spain associate very freely together but the submissive docility of the servants keeps pace with the affability with which they are treated first after don manuel and doña polonia came catalina a tall elegant woman of forty a sort of housekeeper held in high estimation by the signora then came two old women tia maria and tia pepe tia means aunt then maniola a lively simple lass plain and hardy capable of chastising with her fists any ill-mannered youth then the carpenter's daughters two pretty little girls often came to play in his room martita aged about ten and maria dolores perhaps fifteen pensive tender full of feminine charm these fair sisters used to play about him with the familiarity and gentleness of kittens and lightened many an hour well it was not all plain sailing for stories of pillage and plunder came to their ears three troopers had gone to the quarters of his wounded friend taylor and began coolly to rifle his portmanteau taylor stormed and said he was an english captain major tis very possible said they but your money your watch and your linen are never the worse for that no nor your wine either and the ruthless savage swallowed the wine and the bread which had been portioned out as his sustenance and comfort for the day feeling that such might be his case boothby put his money and watch in a little earthen vessel and sent it to be buried in the yard then calling for his soup and a large glass of claret he tossed it off defiantly saying to himself you don't get this my boys next morning they heard that the french infantry were coming and the town was to be given up to pillage as so many of the citizens had deserted it the women came to him shall we lock the street door don carlos they asked by all means said he make it as fast as you can and don't go near the windows soon they heard the bands playing and the women rushed to the windows as if to see a rare show forgetting all his injunctions soon after thump 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 sounded at the door virgin of my soul cried old polonia tottering to the window there they are but peeping out cautiously she added no tis but our neighbor open pepe you had better not suffer your door to be opened at all said the captain but pepa pulled the string and in came the neighbor shrieking jesus mary dio santissimo the demons are breaking open every door and plundering every house all the goods chests everything dragged out into the street maria di mi alma o oh, signora the crashing of doors breaking of windows loud thumpings and clatterings were now distinctly heard in all directions all outside seemed to boil in turmoil ere long thump thump at their own door but it was only another neighbor peppa pulled the string and in she came her head was piled up with mattresses blankets quilts and pillows under one arm were gowns caps bonnets and ribbons her other hand held a child's chair add to all this that her figure was of a stunted and ludicrous character and she came in puffing and crying under that cumbrous weight of furniture they could not resist laughing for the love of god signora she whined let me put these things in your house she was shown up into the garret others followed after her but soon there was a louder knocking with a volley of french oaths the house shook under the blows pedro tell them in french that this is the quarter of an english captain pedro cautiously peeped out of the window 
dios there is but one said pedro and he carries no arms hello sir la maison poor english captain go to hell this strange language and his abrupt jabbering way of talking forced a laugh out of his master ouvrez la porte bête shouted the frenchman i want some water holy virgin cried polonia we had better open the door no 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 said boothby tell him pedro that if he does not take himself off i shall report him to his general pedro had not got half through this message when suddenly he ducked his head and a great stone came in and struck the opposite wall il demonio groaned the women as they too ducked their heads then the fellow who was drunk just reeled off in search of some easier adventure pedro had hardly finished boasting of his victory when the door was again assailed oh said polonia it's only two officers servants and she shut the window well what did they want asked the captain they wanted lodgings for their masters but i told them we had no room and have you room doña polonia yes but i didn't choose to say so run pedro run and tell those servants that there is plenty of room don't you see senora that this is the best chance of preserving your house from pillage they returned one a prussian lad who spoke french very ill the captain's hope that these fellow lodgers would prove gentlemen lent him a feeling of security little pedro was watching the motions of the two servants like a lynx senor said he those two diavoli are prying about into every hole and corner on this aaron was sent to dig up the watch and money and bring the wine upstairs soon after in came pedro strutting with a most consequential air the french captain senor said he there followed him a fine military-looking figure armed cap a pie and covered with martial dust he advanced to the bedside with a quick step i have had the misfortune sir to lose a limb said boothby and i claim your protection my protection he replied putting out his hand command my devoted services the name of an englishman in distress is sufficient to call forth our tenderest attention the captain was a good deal affected by the kindness of his manner kindness can never be thoroughly felt unless it be greatly wanted he begged he would visit him sometimes and he promised to bring a friend signora polonia was charmed with monsieur de la platiere who with his young friend captain simon came often in for a chat alas they had to go away after a few days stay but de la platiere wrote his name in chalk on the door in the hope that it might discourage any plunderers one day boothby was suddenly aroused by the appearance in his room of an officer whom he had seen before but did not much like eh capitaine comment ça va-t-il comment va mieux ah bon then he explained that the blade of his sword was broken as prisoner of war he said you will have no use for a sword give me yours and if you will keep mine where is yours it stands said boothby in yonder corner take it by all means je vous laisserai la mine he said and hurried off boothby wished his sword to the frenchman's gizzard he was so rough and rude one afternoon pedro rushed in excited and said the general himself is below sir bring him up pedro quickly he ushered in an officer of about the age of five-and-thirty he was splendidly dressed of an elegant person his face beaming with good nature and intelligence he came up to the bed and without waiting for the form of salutation seated himself in a chair close to the pillow and laying his hand on boothby's arm he said in a mild and agreeable voice uh, ne vous dérangez mon ami solely i am here to see if i can possibly lighten a little the weight of your misfortune tell me can i be useful to you have you anything you want for all these kind inquiries the captain expressed his gratitude and added i have really nothing to ask for unless you could send me to england ah if you were able to move captain i would exchange you now but by the time you will have gained strength to travel you will be at the disposal of the major-general of the army that visit gave much comfort and hope in the evening de la platiere and simon returned with the news that sir arthur wellesley had met with disasters 
taisez-vous mon cher said simon it may have a bad effect on his spirits but he insisted on hearing all they knew and while they were talking a french soldier walked calmly up into the room and coming up to the foot of the bed stood before his officers astounded petrified when after sternly eyeing him a while they sharply demanded his business his faculties returned and he stammered out mon capitaine i i took it for a shop i beg pardon and off he went in a hurry but what would he have done if he had found the english officer alone on october first captain boothby was allowed to go out on crutches he says the sense of attracting general observation hurried me the french soldiers who met me expressed surprise at seeing the success of an amputation which in the hands of their field surgeons was nearly always fatal the spaniards were more sympathizing what a pity so young too poor young englishmen were pathetically passed along the street as he hobbled by in july eighteen ten captain boothby was exchanged with a french prisoner and returned to his father and mother in england this gives us the kindlier side of war but there is another side in the prison of toro were some french soldiers kept by the spaniards nothing could be worse than the cruelty under which these frenchmen suffered in their prison was a cell with a window strongly barred and covered by an iron shutter pierced with small holes the dungeon was about ten feet square and five feet high at the furthest end was a block of stone for a seat with an iron collar for the neck fixed by a short chain in the wall another chain was passed around the body the poor wretches were chained in one position all day which often hurried them to a miserable death their food was a little bread and water it is easy however to bear any amount of suffering when you know the time will soon come when you will be free it is not so easy to bear a whole lifelong penalty for having dared to fight for one's country one would think that a national gratitude would rescue our wounded soldiers from a life of beggary or the workhouse yet after every war how many one-armed and one-legged soldiers or sailors are pitifully begging along our streets and roads there is no animal so cruel as man corruptio optimi pessima from a prisoner of france by captain boothby by kind permission of measures a and c black and miss boothby end of chapter three chapter four of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the capture of ciudad rodrigo eighteen twelve a night march waiting for scaling ladders the assault ladders break shells and grenades a magazine explodes street fighting drink brings disorder and plunder great spoil after talavera sir arthur wellesley became lord wellington he was opposed by soult marmont and messina on the first of january wellington crossed the agueda and advanced to the assault of ciudad rodrigo which had to be hurried on because marmont was advancing to its relief fortunately we have descriptions from more than one eyewitness of the siege ciudad rodrigo is built on rising ground on the right bank of the agueda the inner wall thirty-two feet high is without flanks and has weak parapets and narrow ramparts without the town at the distance of three hundred yards the suburbs were enclosed by a weak earthen entrenchment hastily thrown up it was six o'clock on the evening of the nineteenth of january the firing on both sides had slackened but not ceased the chiefs were all bustle and mystery they had had their instructions soon the fifth and seventy-seventh were ordered to fall in and halted on the extreme right of the division whilst the men hammered at their flints the order was read to the troops they were to take twelve axes in order to cut down the gate by which the ditch was entered the fifth regiment was to have twelve scaling ladders twenty-five feet long to scale the fourth barrage clear it of the enemy throw over any guns and wait for general mckinnon's column in the main attack 
whilst waiting in the gloom for the return of the men sent for the ladders we mingled in groups of officers conversing and laughing together with that callous thoughtlessness which marks the old campaigner i well remember how poor mcdougall of the fifth was quizzed about his dandy moustache when next i saw him in a few short hours he was a lifeless and a naked corpse suddenly a horseman galloped heavily towards us it was picton he made a brief and inspiriting speech to us said he knew the fifth were men whom a severe fire would not daunt and that he reposed equal confidence in the seventy seventh a few kind words to our commander and he bade us godspeed pounding the sides of his hog-maned cob as he trotted off major sturgeon and the ladders having arrived the troops again moved off about half-past six the night was rather dark the stars lending but little light they were enjoined to observe the strictest silence it was a time of thrilling excitement as they wound their way by the right at first keeping a distance of twelve hundred yards from the town then bending in towards the convent of santa cruz and the river the awful stillness of the hour was unbroken save by the soft measured tread of the little columns as they passed over the green turf or by the occasional report of a cannon from the walls and the rush and whiz of its ball as it flew past or striking short bounded from the earth over their heads receiving perhaps most respectful though involuntary salaams every two or three minutes a gun was fired at some suspicious quarter they had approached the convent and pushed on nearer the walls which now loomed high and near they reached the low glass sea through which was discovered a pass into the ditch heavily palisaded with a gate in the centre through the palisades were visible the dark and lofty old moorish walls whilst high overhead was the great keep or citadel a massive square tower which looked like a giant frowning on the scene the english still were undiscovered though they could distinguish the arms of the men on the ramparts as they fired in idle bluster over their heads eagerly though silently they all pressed towards the palisade as the men with hatchets began to cut a way through them the sound of the blows would not have been heard by the enemy who were occupied by their own noises had it not been for the enthusiasm so characteristic of his country which induced a newly joined ensign fresh from the wilds of kerry to utter a tremendous war-hoop as he saw the first paling fall before the axes the cheer was at once taken up by the men and as they instantly got convincing proofs that they were discovered the men on the walls began to pepper them soundly they all rushed through the opening at the ditch the assailants were heavily fired on from rampart and tower the french tossed down lighted shells and hand grenades which spun about hissing and fizzing amongst their feet some of these smashed men's heads as they fell whilst others exploding on the ground tossed unlucky wretches into the air tearing them asunder seldom could any men have passed three or four minutes more uncomfortably than the time which was consumed in bringing in and fixing the ladders against a wall towards which they all crowded amongst the first to mount was the gallant chieftain of the fifth but the love they bore him caused so many of the soldiers to follow on the same ladder that it broke in two and they all fell many being hurt by the bayonets of their own comrades round the foot of the ladder i was not one of the last in ascending writes an officer of the seventy seventh and as i raised my head to the level of the top of the wall i beheld some of our fellows demolishing a picket which had been stationed at that spot and had stood on the defensive they had a good fire of wood to cheer themselves by and on revisiting the place in the morning i saw their dead bodies stripped strangely mingled with wounded english officers and men who had lain round the fire all night the fortune of war having made them acquainted with strange bedfellows our ascent of the ladders placed us in the fosse rage a broad deep ditch in which we were for the moment free from danger when about a hundred and fifty men had mounted we moved forward at a rapid pace along this ditch cowering close to the wall whilst overhead we heard the shouts and cries of alarm 
our course was soon arrested by the massive fragments and ruins of the main breach made by our men and here we were in extreme danger for instead of falling into the rear of a column supposed to have already carried the breach we stood alone at its base exposed to a tremendous fire of grape and musketry from its defences for a minute or two we seemed destined to be sacrificed to some mistake as to the hour of attack but suddenly we heard a cheer from a body of men who flung down bags of heather to break their fall and leaped on them into the ditch it was the old scots brigade which like us having been intended as a support was true to its time and was placed in the same predicament as we were on the appearance of the ninety fourth the fire of the garrison was redoubled but it was decided by the officers that it was better to die like men on the breach than like dogs in a ditch and so with a wild hurrah they all sprang up absolutely eating fire the breach must have been seventy feet wide and consisted of a nearly perpendicular mass of loose rubbish in which it was very difficult to obtain a footing the enemy lost no time they pointed two guns downwards from the flanks and had time to fire several rounds of grape working fearful destruction on the british on the margin of the breach were ranged a quantity of shells which were lighted and rolled down on them but they acted rather as a stimulus to push up and to avoid their explosion the top of the breach was defended by a strong body of the garrison who maintained a heavy fire of musketry and hurled down hand grenades and fireballs however a night attack with all its defects has the advantage of concealing from the view much of danger and of difficulty that if seen might shake the nerve but there was no time for hesitation no choice for the timid the front ranks were forced onwards by the pressure of those in the rear and as men fell wounded on the breach there they lay being trodden into and covered by the shifting rubbish displaced by the feet of their comrades some few more lucky when wounded fell or rolled down the slope into the ditch and they added by their outcries to the wildness of the scene the enemy's resistance slackened and they suddenly fled some guns they left behind in their panic it was now seven o'clock the breach was carried and the town virtually ours about that time a wooden magazine placed on the rampart blew up destroying our general and many with him as well as a number of the garrison patterson of the forty third and uniac of the ninety fifth were of the number i distinctly remember the moment of the explosion and the short pause it occasioned in our proceedings a pause that enabled us to hear the noise of the attack still going forward near the little breach i met uniac walking between two men one of his eyes was blown out and the flesh was torn from his arms and legs i asked who it was he replied uniac and walked on he had taken chocolate with our mess an hour before at this time a gigantic young irish volunteer attached to our regiment observing a gallant artilleryman still lingering near his gun dashed at him with bayonet fixed and at the charge the man stepped backwards facing his foe but his foot slipping he fell against the gun and in a moment the young irish fellow's bayonet was through his heart the yell with which he gave up the ghost so terrified b that he started back the implement of death in his hands and apostrophizing it said holy moses how easy you went into him this saying became celebrated afterwards through the whole division colonel mcleod caused lieutenant madden of the forty third to descend the small breach with twenty-five men to prevent soldiers leaving the town with plunder at eleven o'clock i went to see him he had very judiciously made a large fire which of course showed up the plunderers to perfection he told me that no masquerade could in point of costume and grotesque figures rival the characters he stripped that night well to go back to the storming party the men who lined the breastwork having fled our men dropped from the wall into the town and advanced in pursuit at first they were among ruins but gradually made their way into a large street which led nearly in a straight line from the principal breach to the plaza or square 
up this street they fought their way the enemy slowly retiring before them at about half the length of the street was a large open space on the left hand where was deposited the immense battering train of the army of portugal amongst this crowd of carriages a number of men ensconced themselves firing on the british as they passed and it required no small exertion on their part to dislodge them in the meantime many of the french ahead of them had entered the square for which place our fellows pushed on with as many men as they could lay hands on formed without distinction of regiment into two or three platoons for the great proportion of the men who had started with the column had sneaked off into the by-streets for the purpose of plundering a business which was already going on merrily as they reached the head of the street which entered the square at one angle and wheeled to the left into the open space they received a shattering volley which quickly spoiled their array the french were drawn up in force under the colonnade of the cathedral and we were for the moment checked by their fire at length when they were meditating a dash at the fellows they heard fire opened from another quarter which seemed to strike the french with a panic for on our men giving a cheer and running forward they to a man threw away their arms as if by word of command and vanished in the gloom like magic it was the light division who entered the square by a street leading from the little breach and their opportune arrival had frightened away the game which had been brought to bay leaving the pavement of the square littered with arms and accoutrements but now begins a part of the story which does not reflect much credit on our fellows when the men had sipped the wine and brandy in the stores which they plundered most extreme disorders began which it was impossible to check a whole division could not have restored order three or four large houses were on fire two of them were in the market-place and the streets were illuminated by the flames the soldiers were growing very drunk and many of them for amusement were firing from the windows into the streets i was myself talking to the barber evans in the square when a ball passed through his head this was at one o'clock in the morning he fell at my feet dead and his brains lay on the pavement i then sought shelter and found colonel mcleod with a few officers in a large house where we remained until the morning i did not enter any other house in ciudad rodrigo if i had not seen it i would never have supposed that british soldiers would become so wild and furious it was quite alarming to meet groups of them in the streets flushed as they were with drink and desperate in mischief singing yelling dealing blows at man woman or child like so many mad things loose from bedlam in the morning the scene was dismal and dreary the fires were just going out all over street and square were lying the corpses of many men who had met their death hours after the town had been taken at eleven o'clock i went to look at the great breach the ascent was not so steep as that of the small one but there was a traverse thrown up at each side of it on the rampart i counted ninety-three men of the third division lying dead on the rampart between the traverses i did not see one dead man on the french side of those traverses i saw general mckinnon lying dead he was on his back just under the rampart he had i think rushed forward and fallen down the perpendicular wall probably at the moment of receiving his mortal wound he was stripped of everything except his shirt and blue pantaloons even his boots were taken off there were no others dead near him and he was not on the french side either it is said that he was blown up but i should say not there was no appearance indicating that such had been his fate neither his skin nor the posture in which he was lying led me to suppose it when a man is blown up his hands and face i should think could not escape mckinnon's face was pale and free from the marks of fire how strange but with his exception i did not see a man of the third division who had been stripped besides possession of the fortress the whole of Masenya's battering train had become prize as well as an immense quantity of light artillery which marmont brought against us on the retreat from bowden 
The fortress was so well supplied with warlike stores that not an article of any kind was wanting, in spite of the great expenditure during the siege. What would not the French and English say now? Ciudad invested, bombarded, stormed, and taken in twelve days, and this it cost Messina fifty-one days to do, sixteen of which he was bombarding the town. Every part of the proceeding seems to have astonished the garrison, as in erecting works, opening batteries, etc., they were always a day or two out in their calculations. The George and Dragon had nearly disappeared from the king's colors by a shell passing through it, but the men were splendid in attack and followed their leaders unto death. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The Storming of Badajoz, 1812. Rescue of Wounded Men, A Forlorn Hope, Fireballs Light Up the Scene, A Mine Explodes, Partial Failure of the English, Escalade of the Castle, Pat's Humor and Heroism, Saving a General, Wellington Hears the News, the day after the storm. Marajos is situated on the left bank of the Huariana, which is about four hundred yards broad, and washes one-fourth of the Ancenta. The defences along the river are confined to a simple and badly flanked rampart, but on the other sides there are eight large and well-built fronts with covered way. The scarp of the bastion is more than thirty feet in height, in advance of these fronts are two detached works, the Badaleros and the Picurina, the latter being a strong redoubt four hundred yards from the town. As the bombardment went on for some days, preparing a breach for an assault, incidents were few. Officers sometimes strolled round to explore for themselves. One writes, One day I saw two men stretched on the ground. One was dead, a round shot having passed through his body. The other had lost a leg. His eyes were closed. He seemed to be quite dead. An adventurous Portuguese, one of our allies, was beginning to disencumber him of his clothes. The poor man opened his eyes and looked in the most imploring manner, while the villain had him by the belt, lifting him up. I ran forward and gave the humane Portuguese a sharp blow with my blunt saber, so that with a yell he threw himself down by the side of the soldier whom he was stripping, thinking his last hour had come. Soon after I saw a heavy shot hopping along and kicking up the dust. It struck one of our soldiers on the hip, and down he went, motionless. I felt confident that the wounded man was not dead, and I begged that some of his comrades would carry him off to the rear. They were retiring under a heavy cannonade. Two soldiers, at the risk of their lives, rushed back and brought him in, or he would have been starved to death between our lines and the ramparts of the town. His hip was only grazed and his clothes untorn, but of course he was unable to walk and seemed to feel much pain, for he groaned heavily. Towards the end of the siege the weather became beautiful. One day I called to mine. The enemy scarcely fired a shot. All our troubles were forgotten, and two or three of us amused ourselves by reading a novel in the trenches. The garrison of Badajoz fired every morning for a few days before the grand assault a certain number of rounds, as if for practice and to measure the ground. On the 6th of April a long order was issued relative to the position the troops were to occupy. The day was fine, and all the soldiers in good spirits, cleaning themselves as if for a review. About two o'clock I saw poor Harvest. He was sucking an orange and walking on a rising ground, alone and very thoughtful. It gave me pain, as I knew he was to lead the forlorn hope. He said, My mind is made up, old fellow. I am sure to be killed. At half-past eight that night the ranks were formed, and the roll called in an undertone. The division drew up in deep silence behind a large quarry, three hundred yards from the breaches. They had to wait long for ladders and other things. At ten a very beautiful fireball was thrown up from the town. This illuminated the ground for many hundred yards. 
two or three more followed showed a bright light and remained burning some little time the stillness that followed was the prelude to one of the strangest scenes that could be seen soon after ten a little whisper went round that the forlorn hope were stealing forward followed by the storming parties composed of three hundred men in two minutes the division followed one musket shot no more was fired near the breaches by a french soldier who was on the lookout still our men went on leisurely but silently there were no obstacles the fifty second forty third and ninety fifth closed gradually up to column of quarter distance all was hushed the town lay buried in gloom the ladders were placed on the edge of the ditch when suddenly an awful explosion took place at the foot of the breaches and a burst of light disclosed the whole scene the very earth seemed to rock and sway under their feet what a sight the ramparts stood out clear crowded with the enemy french soldiers stood on the parapets while the short-lived glare from the barrels of powder and stuff flying into the air gave to friends and foes a look as if both bodies of troops were laughing a tremendous fire now opened upon the english and for an instant they were stationary but the troops were no ways daunted the ladders were found exactly opposite the centre breach and the whole division rushed to the assault with amazing resolution the soldiers flew down the ladders into the ditch and the cheering from both sides was loud and full of confidence fireballs were rising lighting up the scene the ditch was very wide and when they arrived at the foot of the centre breach eighty or ninety men were clustered together one called out who will lead death and the most dreadful sounds and cries encompassed all it was a volcano up they went some killed others impaled on the bayonets of their own comrades or hurled headlong amongst the crowd the chevaux de frise atop looked like innumerable bayonets when i was within a yard of the top i felt half strangled and fell from a blow that deprived me of all sensation i only recollect feeling a soldier pulling me out of the water where so many men were drowned i lost my cap but still held my sword on recovering i looked towards the breach it was shining and empty fireballs were in plenty and the french troops standing upon the walls were taunting us and inviting our men to come up and try it again what a crisis what a military misery some of the finest troops in the world prostrate humbled to the dust colonel mcleod was killed while trying to force the left corner of the large breach he received his mortal wound when within three yards of the enemy a few moments before he fell he had been wounded in the back by a bayonet of one of our men who had slipped it was found out afterwards that the woodwork of the cheval de frise was heavy bristling with short stout sword blades and chained together it was an obstacle not to be removed and the french soldiers stood close to it killing every man who drew near to get past such obstacles by living bodies pushing against it up a steep breach sinking to the knees every step in rubbish while a firm and obstinate enemy stood behind it was impossible round shot alone could have destroyed these defences which were all chained together and vastly strong had it not been for this the divisions would have entered like a swarm of bees it was fortunate that lord wellington had made arrangements for assaulting the town at other points next morning i was searching for my friend madden at last i found him lying in a tent with his trousers on and his shirt off covered with blood and bandaged across the body to support his broken shoulder laid on his back and unable to move he asked for his brother why does he not come to see me i turned my head away for his gallant young brother was amongst the slain captain mary of the fifty second was sitting on the ground sucking an orange he said how are you you see that i am dying a mortification has set in a grape shot had shattered his knee he had told the doctor that he preferred death rather than permit such a good leg to be amputated escalade of the castle general picton with the third division was ordered to attack the castle by escalade 
the castle was an old building on the summit of a hill about a hundred feet high on the northeast of the town at about ten o'clock on the night of the sixth of april eighteen twelve the third division advanced in that profound silence that rendered the coming storm more terrible our men were not perceived until they arrived at a little river not very distant from the works when they distinctly heard the entire line of the french sentries give the alarm and all the guns of the garrison opened at once volley after volley of grape-shot was fired upon our troops as they advanced fireballs rose and showed the enemy where they were they quickened pace and got so close under the wall that the guns could not bear upon them but the fireballs burned so vividly that they were enabled to direct their musketry upon the assailants and hurl with fatal precision every kind of missile the ladders were placed the troops cheered and swarmed up and nothing was heard but mingled cries of despair and shouts of victory several ladders broke down under the weight and men were precipitated on the heads of their comrades below the ladder i mounted was like many others too short and i found that no exertion i could make would enable me to reach the embrasure or descend in this desperate state expecting immediate death from the hands of a ferocious frenchman in the embrasure i heard a voice above call out mr blank is that you yes i shouted the same voice cried out oh murder murder what will we do to get you up at all at all with that scrodine of a ladder but here goes ow my leg pat and throwing himself flat on his face in the embrasure he extended his brawny arm down the wall seized me by the collar with the force of hercules and landed me as he said himself clever and clean on the ramparts in the same manner five more were landed thus did this chivalrous soldier with noble generosity prefer saving the lives of six of his comrades at the risk of his own to the rich plunder which everywhere surrounded him and this was tully o'malley a private in my company one of the ragged rascals well i found myself standing amongst several french soldiers who were crowding round the gun in the embrasure one of them still held the match lighted in his hand the blue flame of which gave the bronzed and sullen countenances of these warriors an expression not easily forgotten a grenadier leaned on the gun and bled profusely from the head another who had fallen on his knees when wounded remained fixed in astonishment and terror others whose muskets lay scattered on the ground folded their arms in deep despair the appearance of the whole group with their huge bushy moustaches and mouths all blackened with biting the cartridges presented to the eye of a young soldier a very strange and formidable appearance don't mind them boys sor said tully they were all settled just afore you came up and by my soul good boys they were for a start fought like riled devils they did still mr s and the grenadiers came powdering down on them with the war-hoop och my darlin they were mid smithereens of in a crack barring that big fellow you see there with the great black whiskers see yonder bleeding in the side he is and resting his head on the gun carriage ah he was the boldest of em all he made bloody battle with jim riley but tis short he stood afore our jim for he gave him a row waterford puck that tumbled him like a ninepin in a minute and by my own soul a puck of the buck end of jim's piece is no joke i tell you he tried it on more heads than one on the hill of busaco away then flew tully to join his company forming in double quick time to oppose the enemy who were gathering in force at one of the gates of the citadel they had already opened a most galling fire of musketry from this dark gateway which was warmly returned by our men who under lieutenant davern charged up to the massive gate this however the french closed so little impression was made at last a number of the light infantry of the seventy fourth and eighty fifth helped each other to climb up on the archway over the gate and thence they fired down so unexpectedly that a general panic seized the enemy and they fled in confusion followed by many of our men who now dashed through the gateway here captain c came upon major murphy of the eighty eighth quite exhausted and unable to move from loss of blood as he had not been able to bind up his wound this he did for him and they moved on 
one more bayonet struggle in the castle and the french again fled leaving the place literally covered with dead and wounded several of them being officers whose long narrow-bladed sabres with brass scabbards instantly changed masters one officer who was wounded made several thrusts at the sturdy ranger who was trying to disarm him but had awkwardly caught the sharp sword blade in his hand and was so angry at being cut that he was preparing to rush upon his antagonist however the frenchman unbuckled his waist belt and threw away his sword but pat was angry and was not now satisfied with the sword only for perceiving a handsome silver-mounted calabash or flask by the officer's side he coolly transferred it to his own shoulders after first taking a copious swill then gravely addressing the wounded man said while reloading his piece now my tight fellow you see what you lost by your contrariness ah monsieur je suis grivement blessé rendez moi mon calabash je vous prie grieving for your calabash is that what you mean said pat why then i'll tell you what my boy no man shall say that pat donovan ever deprived either friend or foe of his little drop of drink so there tis for you grand merci grand merci murmured the officer oh don't bother about axing mercy from me said pat but take my advice and keep roaring out mercy mercy to all our fellows as they come up on to ye and by gore they'll not take the least notice of you ah oh, merci merci mais c'est fait de moi c'est fait de moi repeated the poor wounded young french soldier fatal presentiment one hour afterwards the irishman returned and found him lying on the same spot but the gallant fellow was at rest where the wicked cease from troubling as we were occupied in disarming and securing the prisoners captain c happened to capture and save the life of the colonel commanding the artillery in the citadel at the very moment our men were pursuing him at the point of the bayonet he threw himself upon the captain and finding he understood french entreated he would save him from our infuriated soldiers but this he found it extremely difficult to do as each successive group on perceiving his large gold epaulets and orders evinced a strong anxiety to make further acquaintance with him upon one occasion the captain was obliged to use his sword to protect him from a few of the sixtieth who advanced upon him in rather a suspicious and business-like manner the poor colonel was in a state of violent agitation and kept a firm hold of his protector's arm through all the changes of the fight until they met a field officer of the british artillery to whom he gave him in charge the frenchman wanted to bring c to the bomb-proof where his baggage was secured to give him some token of his gratitude and overwhelmed him with thanks but duty called and he left him with the field officer who he heard afterwards reaped a rich reward for his small service the first rays of a beautiful morning showed the incredible strength of badajos and how dearly the capture of it had cost us the gallant hearts that beat with devoted bravery the night before now lay in the cold grasp of death silence had succeeded to the dreadful din of arms and rendered more awful the contemplation of this fearful scene of death and suffering and desolation a vast number of the enemy lay dead in a heap close by the spot where our men were forming and while they gazed on these unhappy victims of a fierce and deadly fight they were not a little astonished to observe a very young french officer who lay amongst them and whom they thought to be dead also slowly and cautiously raise himself up then after looking about him with a wild stare he coolly walked over to the other side where the prisoners were standing and delivered himself up this wily hero had not been wounded nor had he received the slightest scratch but being more frightened than hurt he lay concealed in this manner until all fear of danger as he thought was over and gone it excited a good deal of merriment amongst our men but the french curled their moustaches gave him a hearty sac and their deep contempt another account i was on a hill with the medical staff during the night of the assault of badajos for two hours we watched the fire the bursting of shells and hand grenades then the wounded began to arrive and we were busy 
lord wellington rode up with his staff and soon after a staff officer came up at a gallop shouting where is lord wellington there sir my lord i am come from the breaches the troops after repeated attempts have failed to enter them so many officers have fallen that the men dispersed in the ditch are without leaders if your lordship does not at once send a strong reinforcement they must abandon the enterprise colonel macleod of the forty third has been killed in the breach a light was called for and instantly brought and lord wellington noted the report with a steady hand his face was pale and expressed great anxiety in his manner and language he preserved perfect coolness and self-possession general hay's brigade was ordered to advance to the breaches you may think that it was nervous work hearing this our general had wisely planned two extreme attacks by escalade on the castle by the third division and on the south side of the town by the fifth division and on fort pardaleros by the portuguese it was known that salt was within a few leagues marmont had pushed his advanced dragoons as far as the bridge of boats at villa Veja. the river guadiana was in our rear it was a crisis and we wondered what thoughts were passing through the mind of our gallant chief as he sat motionless on his horse presently another staff officer galloped up out of breath general picton has got possession of the castle sir who brings that intelligence exclaimed lord wellington the officer saluted and gave his name are you certain sir are you positively certain i entered the castle with the troops i have only just left it general picton in possession he sent me picton in possession with how many men his division it is impossible to describe to you the change this news produced in the feelings of all around a great sigh of relief could almost be heard return sir and desire general picton to maintain his position at all hazards having dispatched this messenger lord wellington directed a second officer to proceed to the castle to repeat his orders to general picton next morning at dawn i set out to visit the breaches i was just thinking of two friends major singer and captain chollock of the royal fusiliers both of whom had been with me two evenings before i was wondering how they had fared in the assault when i met some fusiliers and asked for major singer we are throwing the last shovels of earth upon his grave sir is captain chollock safe i inquired in the act of climbing over that palisade he was wounded fell into the water and we have seen nothing of him since that did not make me disposed to be very cheerful i found the great breach covered with dead from its base to its summit many were stripped amongst them i recognized the faces of many well known to me in climbing up the breach my feet receded at every step in the debris so as to make my progress slow and difficult behind the chevaux de frise a broad and deep trench had been cut into which our men must have been precipitated had they succeeded in surmounting this huge barrier above was a battery of twelve pounders completely enfilading the great and the small breach near to each other no wonder we failed there to enter i next visited the castle at the bottom of whose walls nearly forty feet high were lying shattered ladders broken muskets exploded shells and the dead bodies of many of our brave men amongst the dead i recognized the body of the gallant major ridge of the fifth regiment lying near the gate that leads to the town in forcing which he had fallen riddled with balls i met a soldier of the connaught rangers overpowered by excitement and brandy the fellow looked at me suspiciously and appeared disposed to dispute my passage he held his loaded musket at half present and i was prepared to close with him but fortunately flattery succeeded he allowed me to pass soon after entering the town a girl about nine years of age implored my protection por el amor de dios for her mother a number of soldiers of a distinguished regiment were in the house armed and under the influence of every evil passion alas i was powerless i met a man of the eighty eighth dragging a peasant by the neck with the intention of putting him to death so he declared in atonement for his not having any money in his pockets i appealed to the gallantry of his corps and saved the life of his victim 
the town had now become a scene of plunder and devastation our soldiers and our women in a state of intoxication had lost all control over themselves these together with numbers of spaniards and portuguese who had come into the city in search of plunder filled every street many were dispossessed of their booty by others and these interchanges of plunder in many cases were not effected without bloodshed our soldiers had taken possession of the shops stationed themselves behind the counters and were selling the goods contained in them these were again displaced by more numerous parties who became shopkeepers in their turn and thus continual scuffling and bloodshed was going on in addition to the incessant firing through the keyholes of the front doors of houses as the readiest way of forcing the locks a desultory and wanted discharge of musketry was kept up in the streets placing all who passed literally between cross-fires many of our own people were thus killed or wounded by their own comrades an attempt was made next day to collect our soldiers the troops however that were sent into the town for that purpose joined in the work of plunder we may feel shocked at the excesses which our soldiers committed after the storming of such towns as ciudad rodrigo and badajos folk sitting by their quiet firesides may wonder how sane men can be so dead to the higher and better feelings of humanity but when the fever of war is followed by the poison of drink it is no wonder if the minds of rude men are thrown off their balance war is a most awful thing to witness and many officers have declared to the writer that had they known what war meant in all its dreadful reality they would not have been so eager in their youth to join the army all the more reason is there that every youth in our islands should be compelled by law to learn the use of the rifle that when the time comes as come it will when an invader shall set foot upon our shore we may not be helpless and unarmed perhaps it is necessary that we should sometimes hear the horrid truth about war we may thus be stimulated to use a little self-denial for our country's security when we realize that life is not made up of games and money-making and when we can see what our fatherland would be to us devastated by a savage enemy with farms and barns blazing women and children starved to death towns sacked and plundered and the honor of old england trodden beneath the foot of a foreign invader the story of these sieges has many lessons military ethical and economic let us at least learn one the duty that is incumbent upon all of us men and boys to defend mother and wife and child End of chapter five Chapter six of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six A Prisoner in Saint Sebastian, 1813. The Coup de Gras, the Hospital, a Cruel Order, an Attempt at Escape, Removed to the Castle, the English at the Breach, Many Are Wounded, French Ladies Sleep in the Open, a Vertical Fire, English Gunners Shoot Too Well, a good sabre lightly won. Colonel Harvey Jones, R.E., has left us an interesting account of the siege of St. Sebastian by the British forces. The town, situated close to the French frontier, just south of the Pyrenees and by the sea, contains 10,000 inhabitants and is built on a low peninsula running north and south the defences of the western side are washed by the sea those on the eastern side by the river urumia which at high water covers four feet of the masonry of the scarp the first assault in july failed colonel jones was wounded and taken prisoner his diary begins after witnessing the unsuccessful attempts of lieutenant campbell ninth regiment and his gallant little band to force their way on to the ramparts and their retreat from the breach my attention was soon aroused by a cry from the soldier who was lying disabled next to me oh they are murdering us all looking up i perceived a number of french grenadiers under a heavy fire of grape sword in hand stepping over the dead and stabbing the wounded my companion was treated in the same manner 
the sword plucked from his body and reeking with his blood was raised to give me the coup de grace when fortunately the uplifted arm was arrested by a smart little man a sergeant who cried out oh mon colonel êtes-vous blessé and he ordered some men to remove me they raised the colonel in their arms and carried him up the breach on to the ramparts here they were stopped by a captain of the grenadiers who asked some questions then kissed him and ordered the party to proceed to the hospital they met the governor and his staff on the way who asked if the colonel was badly wounded and directed that proper care should be taken of him after descending from the rampart into the town as they were going along the street leading to the hospital they were accosted by an officer who had evidently taken his drop he demanded the englishman's sword which was still hanging by his side the reply came you have the power to take it but certainly have no right to do so as i have not been made a prisoner by you this seemed to enrage him and with great violence of manner and gesture he unbuckled the belt and carried away the sword upon reaching the hospital the surgeon major was very kind in his manner after he had enlarged the wounds according to the french system and then dressed them the colonel was carried across the street and put into a bed in one of the wards of the great hospital which a soldier was ordered to vacate for his use this man returned later in the day for his pipe and tobacco which he had left under the pillow in the course of the morning they were visited by the governor who made inquiries as to their wounds and whether they had been plundered of anything for a great number of english soldiers had been taken and were lodged in the town prison the only person permitted to visit them were some staff officers a few spanish ladies and a spanish barber from the former the colonel was made acquainted with all that passed in the british lines at least as far as the french could conjecture although boats arrived nightly from bayonne the other side of the frontier bringing shells medicine charpy or lint engineers etc the garrison remained in great ignorance of the movements of the two armies salt kept sending word that he would soon come and raise the siege thus by promises of immediate relief he kept up the spirits of the garrison he also rewarded the gallantry of particular defenders during the assault and in the sorties by promotion or by sending them the decoration of the legion of honor in the french army there seems to have been a system of reward for good and gallant conduct by promotion into the grenadiers or voltigeurs which had an excellent effect a french soldier was extremely proud of his green yellow or red epaulets they were badges of distinguished conduct and only those who had shown great gallantry in action were admitted into their ranks what with the success attendant upon the sorties and the numerous decorations which had been distributed among the officers and privates such a spirit of daring had been created that the idea of a surrender was scouted by all after the stones had been extracted which had been blown into his leg and thighs by the bursting of shells and grenades the colonel was enabled to move about and get into the gallery running round the courtyard of the hospital and into which all the doors and windows of the rooms respectively opened it was the only place where they were allowed to breathe the fresh air one day whilst sitting in the gallery he observed a table placed in the balcony below him on the other side of the courtyard soon he saw an unfortunate french gunner laid upon the table they amputated both his arms his hands having been blown off by an accident in one of the batteries in the course of the morning whilst conversing with the surgeon who had performed the operation he told the colonel that he had acted contrary to his instructions which were never to amputate but to cure if possible when he was asked for the reason of such an inhuman order having been issued his reply was that the emperor napoleon did not wish numbers of mutilated men to be sent back to france as it would make a bad impression upon the people you must be a bold man to act in opposition to this order he replied affairs are beginning to change and moreover it is now necessary that the soldiers should know they will be taken proper care of in the event of being wounded and not left to die like dogs we send as many as we can at night to bayonne by the boats thus we clear out the hospitals a little 
in conversation with many of the officers they detailed acts committed by their soldiers in spain so revolting to human nature that one refuses to commit them to paper a chef de bataillon once asked him how the english managed with their soldiers when they wanted them to advance and attack an enemy the reply was simply forward ah that way will not do with us we are obliged to excite our men with spirits or to work upon their feelings by some animating address and very often when i have fancied i had brought them up to the fighting pitch some old hand would make a remark which in an instant spoiled all i had said and i had to begin my speech all over again the colonel asked how they managed to provision their men when they went out on expeditions that lasted ten or twenty days the answer was our biscuits are made with a hole in the center each biscuit is the ration for a day sometimes twenty are delivered to each soldier who is given to understand that he has no further claim on the commissariat for those days but it is impossible for the soldier to carry twenty we know that very well but he has no claim and how he lives in the meanwhile we do not ask perhaps he lives on the country in other words he steals in the hospital he was attended by a spanish barber as he could speak spanish fluently they had a good deal of talk the barber used to tell all he heard and saw of what was passing both inside and outside the fortress when he learnt that the colonel was an engineer he offered to bring him a plan of all the underground drains and of the aqueduct the attendant although a good-natured man kept a sharp eye on the barber so it was a difficult matter for him to give anything without being detected at last one morning when preparing to shave him he succeeded in shoving a plan under the bedclothes the colonel seized the earliest opportunity of examining it and from the knowledge he had before acquired of the place he soon mastered the directions of the drains etc from that moment his whole attention was fixed on the means of making his escape he knew that the hospital was situated in the principal street the ends of which terminated upon the fortifications bounding the harbour if once he could gain the street he had only to turn to the right or left to gain the ramparts and so make his escape from the town in the best manner he could one evening just at dusk when the medical men took leave of them for the night one of them left his cocked hat on the bed as soon as the colonel noticed this he put it on his head hurried downstairs and made direct for the great door but he found it so completely blocked up by the guard that unless by pushing them aside it was not possible to pass undiscovered he therefore retreated upstairs in despair and threw the hat down on the bed scarcely had he done so when in rushed the doctor asking for his chapeau they were more than once visited by the crews of the boats which arrived nightly from france the sight of the prisoners seemed to afford the frenchmen great gratification but there was nothing in their manner which could in any way offend very unexpectedly one evening the governor's aide-de-camp came to the prison and told the officers to prepare immediately to go to france a portuguese captain one of the party of prisoners was dreadfully in fear of being sent there and with great warmth of manner told the aide-de-camp that lord wellington would soon be in possession of the place and if the prisoners were not forthcoming he would hold the governor answerable in person it is supposed that the aide went and reported this conversation to the governor as he did not return for some time and then told them it was too late to embark that night as the boats had sailed they were never afterwards threatened to be sent away about the middle of august the garrison began to flatter themselves that the siege was turned into a regular blockade and that they would be relieved by the success of marshal soult their spirits ran high their hopes were elated the fifteenth of august the birthday of napoleon was observed as a day of rejoicing among the garrison and at nightfall the letter n of a very large size was brilliantly lighted up on the face of the donjon when the operations of the second siege began a captain who visited the colonel kept him au fait of all that was going on one day a spanish captain who had sided with the french came into the hospital it was on the evening of the assault he was wringing his hands tearing his hair and swearing he had heard the shrieks of his wife and daughters and had seen his house in flames 
the french officers took the poor man's outcries with great merriment and the spaniard must have bitterly regretted the day when he deserted the english the french officers did not fail to taunt him with having done so and ridiculed his frantic actions in the course of the next day colonel jones was asked if he would like to speak with a corporal of sappers who had been made prisoner during the sortie to his surprise a fine tall youngster a stranger to him walked into the ward dressed in a red jacket now blue was the color when the colonel was taken prisoner when did you join the army corporal he asked yesterday morning colonel i was put on duty in the trenches last night and in a few minutes i was brought into the town by the enemy i could not help laughing though he wore a rueful expression said the colonel one morning a captain of artillery whom he had never before seen came into the ward and commenced conversing about the siege he observed that the whole second parallel of the british trenches was one entire battery and if there were as many guns as there were embrasures he said we shall be joliment fouette the colonel's reply was most assuredly you will depend upon it there are as many guns as embrasures it is not our fashion to make batteries and stick logs of wood into the embrasures in the hope of frightening the enemy he made a grimace and with a shrug of the shoulders left the ward next morning the surgeon came as usual to dress the wounds this was about half past seven all was still and he joyously exclaimed as he entered so gentlemen we have another day's reprieve in about half an hour afterwards whilst colonel jones was under his hands the first salvo from the breaching batteries was fired several shot rattled through the hospital and disturbed the tranquillity of the inmates the instrument dropped from the surgeon's hands and he exclaimed le jeu sera bientôt fini then very composedly the good doctor went on with his work the opening of the batteries made a great stir amongst all hands a hint was given the prisoners to prepare to be removed into the castle a private hint was given to the colonel to be sage on the way up as the captain of the escort was méchant and that it would be better to be quiet and orderly this perhaps was intended to deter any of them from attempting to escape the wounded prisoners were moved in one body up the face of the hill to the entrance of the castle under the mirador battery they were exposed to a sharp musketry fire some of the party were wounded the portuguese captain severely a building on the seaside which had been constructed for a powder magazine was now converted into their hospital the interior being fitted up with wooden beds in the area surrounding the building were placed the unwounded prisoners as the number of wounded from the ramparts increased the hospital filled rapidly and to prevent the fire from the english batteries being directed upon them some of the prisoners were desired to hoist a black flag on the roof while they were doing so the colonel told the french officer that it was labor in vain as the british had learnt that this building was their great depot for powder and so hoisting a flag would be regarded as a ruse to preserve their ammunition little benefit did they get from the ensign after the capture of the island santa clara hardly could any one move about that part of the castle opposite to the island without the risk of being hit grape and shrapnel swept the whole of the face and it was only at night that fresh water could be fetched from the tank the garrison had a fixed idea that the assault would take place at night so each morning they rose with happy faces another twenty-four hours reprieve on the thirty first of august when the first rattle of musketry was heard in the castle an inquiring look pervaded each countenance but no one spoke as the firing continued and the rattle grew and grew little doubt remained as to the cause every soldier seized his musket and hurried with haste to his post the colonel was then ordered not to speak or hold converse with the unwounded prisoners outside one french officer asked him if he thought that the english prisoners would remain quiet if an assault of the breach should take place adding if they were to make any attempt they would all be shot colonel jones replied do not fancy you have a flock of sheep penned within these walls happen what may shoot us or not you will be required to give a satisfactory account of us when the castle is taken from the commencement of the assault until the rush into the castle upon the capture of the town not the slightest information could they obtain as to the state of affairs at the breach 
the period that intervened was to the prisoners one of the most anxious and painful suspense at last the tale was told by the awful spectacle of the interior of the hospital in an instant the ward was crowded with the maimed and wounded the amputation table was in full play and until nearly daylight the following morning the surgeons were unceasingly at work to have such a scene passing at the foot of one's bed was painful enough added to this the agonizing shrieks and groans and the appearance of the sappers and grenadiers who had been blown up by the explosion in the breach their uniforms nearly burnt off and their skins blackened and scorched by gunpowder all this was truly appalling the appearance of these men resembled anything but human beings death soon put an end to their sufferings and relieved all from these most distressing sights of all wounds whether of fractured limbs or otherwise those caused by burns from gunpowder seemed to produce the most excruciating pain in the rear of the donjon was a small building in which was stored much gunpowder shells were falling fast and thick around it so a detachment of soldiers was sent to withdraw the ammunition this dangerous service they were performing in a most gallant manner and had nearly completed their work when some shells fell into the building exploded the barrels that remained and blew the building with some of the soldiers into the air not leaving a vestige to show that such an edifice had stood there there were three french ladies in the garrison they were on their way to france when the investment took place these ladies were permitted to enter the hospital and were allowed a small space at one end of the wooden bedsteads there they were for several days and nights the only water they could obtain to wash in was sea water as the number of the wounded increased some of the officers who were lying upon the floor were loud in their complaints that madame and her daughters were occupying the space which properly belonged to them they succeeded in getting the ladies turned out to find shelter from shot and shell where best they could the day the castle capitulated colonel jones went in search of his fair companions and found them nearly smoke-dried under a small projecting rock one of the young ladies was extremely pretty shortly after the siege she was married to the english commissary appointed to attend upon the garrison until sent to england the change from the hospital to the naked rock relieved them from witnessing many a painful scene as the amputating table was placed near their end of the ward after the capture of the town a heavy bombardment of the castle took place by salvos of shells from more than sixty pieces of artillery there were only a few seconds between the noise made by the discharge of the mortars and the descent of the shells those of the mutilated who were fortunate enough to snatch a little sleep and so forget their sufferings were awakened by the crash of ten or a dozen shells falling upon or in the building whose fuses threw a lurid light through the gloom the silence within unbroken save by the hissing of the burning composition the agonized feelings of the wounded during those few moments of suspense are not to be described many an unlucky soldier was brought to the table to undergo a second operation the wretched surgeons were engaged nearly the entire night rest was impossible you could not choose but hear the legs and arms were thrown out as soon as amputated and fell on the rooks it was not an agreeable sight those who vote for war do not realize these little details in the program war they say breeds heroes it is but justice to the french medical officers to state that their conduct during the whole period of their harassing and laborious duties was marked by the greatest feeling and kindness of manner as well as by skilful attention to the relief of all who came under their hands the unfortunate prisoners who were not wounded had been placed in the area around the hospital and being without cover suffered at every discharge the colonel exerted himself to obtain a few pickaxes and shovels to throw up some sort of splinter proof but it was in vain he pleaded and in the end fifty were killed or wounded out of a hundred and fifty from the surgeons and hospital attendants they experienced great kindness their diet was the same as that of the french wounded soldiers their greatest luxury was three stewed prunes 
the effects of the vertical fire on the interior of the castle were so destructive that had it been continued six hours longer the garrison would have doubtless surrendered at discretion they had lost all hope that salt would relieve them everybody now sought shelter where best he could among the rocks still no nook or corner appeared to be a protection from the shrapnel shells a sergeant of the royals standing at the foot of a bedstead was struck by a ball from a shrapnel shell and fell dead while talking an italian soldier while trying to prepare some broth for dinner was blown into the air soup bowl and all the excellence of the british artillery is well known nothing could surpass the precision with which the shells were thrown or the accuracy with which the fuses were cut during the siege our men in the british trenches little heeded the lazy french shells which were thrown into our batteries from the length of the fuses sufficient time was often allowed before they burst to put themselves under cover and when they did burst the splinters flew lazily around but when the sound of an english shell was heard in the castle or when the men stationed in the donjon cried garde la bombe everybody was on the alert touching the ground and bursting were almost simultaneous and the havoc from the splinters was terrible it appeared to be of little avail where a man hid himself no place was secure from them a french officer of engineers who was very badly wounded kindly lent the colonel some of the professional books which were supplied to him many were works which he had never been able to procure much pleasure and instruction did he derive from their perusal he found out that the french engineers were supplied with them by the government and their generals also with the best maps of the country one day the colonel was called to the door of the ward by a french officer who exclaimed as he pointed to a large convoy of english transports coming in under full sail voila les fiacres qui viennent nous chercher there are the cabs coming to fetch us it was a most cheering and beautiful sight the cabs that were sent to fetch us home when colonel jones was told shortly after that he was no longer a prisoner he began to look around for the best sword in the castle to replace the one which that rude french captain had taken from him he discovered a handsome sabre belonging to a wounded staff officer so he sent and desired that it might be taken down from the place where it was hanging as he wanted such a weapon i have it still by me it was the only sword i wore until the end of the war and often when at the outposts with a flag of truce have i seen the french officers regard the eagles on the belt with anything but a gratified look in eighteen fifteen i was quartered at paris being engineer in charge of the fortifications on montmartre there i frequently saw several of the st sebastian officers and from my old friend the chirurgian major i received many visits we both agreed that though the tables were turned our present position was far more agreeable than when our acquaintance began in st sebastian from muswell's peninsular sketches henry colburn publisher end of chapter six chapter seven of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven jellalabad eighteen forty two position of the town sales brigade rebuilds the defences a sortie bad news a queer noise a ruse that did not succeed the only survivor comes in story of a massacre the earthquake the walls are down are rebuilt english magic pollock comes fight outside the peril of lady sale in november eighteen forty one the english resident at the afghan court of kabul was treacherously assassinated general elphinstone who was left in command of the english troops being in feeble health attempted to leave the country with his forty five hundred troops and three times that number of camp followers on the eleventh of march eighteen forty two akbar khan with a large army attacked general sale at jellalabad jellalabad is a walled town on the right bank of the kabul river the upper end of the valley is very fertile and picturesque studded with forts and villages but all around the city it is sandy and arid 
snow mountains close in the valley on all sides south of jellalabad at a distance of twelve hundred yards is a low range of limestone hills and on the southwest other low hills command the town at two hundred yards distance all around the walls were houses mosques old forts gardens and trees in fact every species of cover that an enemy could desire the walls of the town were twenty one hundred yards in extent all in ruinous condition and in many places not more than nine feet high and easily scaled through breaches in the wall laden cattle and droves of asses went in and out daily into this town on the evening of the twelfth of november eighteen forty one wearied footsore hungry short of ammunition sales brigade entered to undertake the desperate task of defending it against the whole power of the country the people of which not only hated us as invaders but regarded us as infidels to be rooted out at a distance of six hundred miles from our own frontier with the formidable defiles of the khyber pass to cross what would it be our condition if runjik singh should refuse to allow another army to traverse his territories in the meantime these ruinous walls were better than the open plain so after viewing the fortifications sale marched the brigade in and the inhabitants fled out at the other side as we entered it was decided to hold the whole town and try to make it defensible our supply of provisions was so low that the troops had to be put on half and the camp followers on quarter rations as to ammunition we had only a hundred and twenty rounds per man we set to work and collected grain flour pulse and food of all sorts which had been left behind and in a few hours supplies for several days had been gathered in as parts of the walls had no parapets and the sentries were quite exposed hundreds of camel saddles were arranged too deep and too high for the sentries to kneel behind the next day many thousands of the enemy came swarming round and set fire to the grass huts and sheds on the eastern side some of them seemed to be bent on getting into a small mosque near the town so a party of sappers under major broadfoot were sent to see what it contained they discovered a quantity of carbine ammunition which proved to our men a timely and welcome supply from dusk till midnight they kept firing on our sentries with wild yells then they withdrew and the troops could snatch some rest at early dawn sale determined on a sortie and all were aroused without sound of bugle seven hundred infantry and two guns commanded by colonel monteith were ordered to sally out at sunrise and attack the afghans there were some six thousand afghans waiting to meet them in the rocky hills at the southwest angle of the city but they did not resist long and the cavalry rolled them over and pursued the fugitives while abbott's guns ploughed through them wherever they massed together by ten o'clock it was all over the panic was so great that they deserted the forts and we secured all the grain and fodder two great results followed this fortunate victory it gave the garrison a little breathing time and we had a few days of uninterrupted quiet to repair our walls and destroy cover the people of the valley now adopted the usual oriental policy of trying to keep well with both parties and sent in donkey loads of flour wheat etc working parties were told off to clear away the rubbish to destroy houses outside and to build parapets on the walls for with the enemy's marksmen so near no one could look over the walls or show a cap without getting a shot through it jellalabad means the abode of splendor but our men found it squalid and mean there were two main streets crossing each other at right angles the rest were narrow filthy lanes the mountain tribes have fair complexions and the grecian type of face they are believed to be the descendants of the greeks left by alexander the great all their implements and household utensils are totally different from those used by the afghans as soon as the enemy was driven off by our sortie the troops set to work on the defences no one was allowed to be idle officers and men with spade pickaxe billhook or mining tools in hand all were at work from daybreak to sunset 
parties of the enemy hovered about but never dared to molest us strong detachments of cavalry were sent out every day to protect our grass cutters on the twenty first of november the garrison received bad news the little fort of pesh bolak halfway between jellalabad and the khyber had had to be evacuated and captain ferris had been seen going over the mountains away to peshawar in hasty retreat then from kabul they heard that our troops there were shut up by the insurgents in their fortified cantonment that there was a general rising of the whole country and the roads were closed against messengers every night now parties of the enemy used to creep round and fire at our sentries at twelve o'clock on the night of the twenty eighth there was a tremendous report like the firing of a heavy gun the alarm was sounded and in two minutes every man was at his post seaton was captain of the day so he hurried off to learn what all the row was about he found sale and his staff in the west gate looking earnestly in the direction of the enemy and discussing with the heroic havelock the probabilities of an attack it was a bright moonlit night everything visible near or far all at once some one called out here they come sir don't you see those two dark columns of men five hundred yards off ah yes every one saw them clearly enough i looked a little and then laughed right out the general called to me in his short sharp way seaton what is it sir general where is the back wall of the old fort eh? uh, what what said he testily why general you sent me out yesterday to destroy the back wall of that old fort behind which the enemy used to muster the clay was too hard for us so as the wall was just over a sunk road and the bank below the wall soft i threw a dam across the lower part of the road and turned in yon little stream i guess it has softened the bank and the wall has fallen with a slap into the water and produced the explosion the columns of men are only the shadows of the north and south walls so we all had a hearty laugh seaton was on guard every third day though the duty was hard it was comparatively a day of rest during the night officers visited the guards and sentries every two hours and made the sentries report everything they had seen or heard they patrolled the streets too every two hours and the picket in the centre of the town sent patrols to each gate every hour during the night every day when not on special duty we went out with a large working party to destroy the old walls and houses outside the town to fell and cut up the trees and to bring them in for firewood the enemy had some capital marksmen and several of our men were shot through the loopholes sale now thought it time to put a stop to this for they cut off our supplies and we had only thirty days food in store so he quietly waited until noon when the enemy would be thinking more of food than fighting and a column of eleven hundred infantry was formed in the west street all the cavalry that could be mustered with two of abbott's guns assembled in the south street they had a tough job at first the afghans stood bravely and poured in a heavy fire but the moment the cavalry and guns appeared on the plain clear of piper's hill the whole body of the enemy fled in every direction many were drowned in the river during the pursuit captain oldfield who commanded the cavalry as he galloped up to a party of the fugitives saw one man suddenly stop throw off his turban tear off his clothes wrap his waist cloth round his loins and attempt to personate a hindu calling out shabash anglais well done english but our troopers were not to be deceived the hindu gentleman was instantly cut down doubtless if the afghans had possessed the needful tools they might have succeeded in their plan of cooping us in and starving us out it was to major broadfoot's firmness and foresight that the brigade was mainly indebted for its honor and safety when they were first sent out broadfoot was ordered to proceed without his tools this he respectfully but firmly declined to do and by his manly representations he carried his point and was allowed to take them they returned at dusk very hungry and tired 
our loss had been small our gain great and a further result was that provisions at once began to flow in people flocked to the gates to sell flour grain and vegetables but the officers were all so poor that very few of them could purchase anything the soldiers and camp followers were still worse off the commissariat officer had now six weeks food in store but would the treasure chest hold out copper coinage had nearly disappeared the new year eighteen forty two opened ominously and brought more evil tidings a letter from kabul from pottinger told them of the murder of the envoy the guzni was besieged and the whole country in insurrection but our garrison was not dismayed all scouted the idea of any great disaster happening to our troops at kabul and our works were pushed on with increased vigor provisions kept coming in and the surplus was carefully stored on the nineteenth of january a letter from general elphinstone was brought in by a horseman ordering sale to retire with his brigade to peshawar it was a crushing humiliating blow spreading a gloom over every heart but when sale's determination was made known to hold jellalabad until the kabul force arrived the men's confidence in their commander was greater than ever the greatest harmony existed between the european and native soldiers and there was but one mind in the garrison to defy the afghans and to redeem as far as possible the reverses of the kabul force they had no money they were short of ammunition and had not too much food but there was no thought of giving way on the thirteenth of january seaton was on guard at the south gate when a little after twelve o'clock some one came rushing along the passage leading to the guard-room the door was burst open and lieutenant b threw himself into seaton's arms exclaiming my god seaton the whole of the kabul army has been destroyed What? man are you mad the whole army all but one dr bryden we saw from the top of the gateway a man riding on an old pony he seemed to be wounded he was bending over the pommel we sent two horsemen out to bring him in it was dr bryden he could not speak at first then he murmured the only survivor of kabul army all killed after thinking this over in silence for a minute or two they went outside and saw sale and his staff at the kabul gate hoisting up the colors a sign to any poor fugitive who might have escaped a hearty cheer went up as they looked on their country's glorious colors their spirits were still high instantly the cavalry rode out about four miles from jellalabad they found the bodies of three of bryden's companions lieutenant harper collier and hopkins all terribly mangled at night lights were hung out over the kabul gate and two buglers were put on duty in the southwest bastion to sound the advance every quarter of an hour in hope that some poor fugitive might hear it and be saved the terrible wailing sound of those bugles i shall never forget says seaton it was a dirge for our slaughtered soldiers and had a most mournful and depressing effect dr bryden's tale struck horror into the hearts of all who heard it but mingled with the sorrow and pity came a fierce desire for vengeance little was said but the stern looks of the soldiers the set teeth and the clenched hands showed how deep was the feeling that had been stirred and how stern the vow registered in each man's heart on the nineteenth a servant of captain bazette came in and on the thirtieth a gurkha on the thirty-first they had the pleasure of welcoming another white face a sergeant-major from the accounts of the sergeant they gathered many particulars of this tragedy how after the murder of our envoy general elphinstone agreed to evacuate the country and retire with the whole of his force akbar on his part undertaking to escort the kabul force and guarantee it from attack how the afghans rushed into our cantonments even before the rear of the british force had got outside the walls and began their plundering how our men were shot down in the kurd kabul pass how akbar pretended he could not control his men and advised the english officers to surrender to him how the native soldiers chilled to death in the snow went over to the enemy in hundreds 
the sergeant said in their excuse i can't blame the natives i myself was born in a cold climate i was well clad yet my sufferings from the cold were terrible my fingers were frost-bitten and all my joints were sore why sir in the next pass the afghans after slaughtering our men till they were tired stripped hundreds of poor hindus stark naked and left them there to die in the cold stories such as these only spurred on the garrison of jellalabad to greater exertion for as they would now have to face akbar khan and all his warriors on them devolved the task of redeeming our country's fame on the thirtieth of january our cavalry brought in a hundred and seventy five head of cattle that had been grazing at some distance off and on the next day they shepherded in seven hundred and thirty four sheep now work on sunday was remitted men came to morning service with sword and pistol or musket and bayonet and sixty rounds in pouch ready at a moment's notice to march to battle to me says seaton it was always an affecting sight to see these great rough fellows with their heads bowed humbly confessing their sins before god and acknowledging their dependence on his goodness and mercy and i am sure that afterwards when we were surrounded by greater perils there were many who felt the comfort there was in having one to whom they could appeal in all their troubles in february they knew that akbar was collecting his forces for an attack on our side the general ordered that all able-bodied camp followers who were willing should be armed and receive the pay of native soldiers those for whom there were no muskets were armed with pikes which were made for them on the sixteenth rain came down in torrents on the eighteenth heavy rain again on the morning of the nineteenth seaton was at work outside when he felt a smart shock of earthquake with a rumbling noise at first he did not take much notice but when the rumbling increased and swelled to the loudest thunder as if a thousand heavy wagons were being driven at speed over a rough pavement he turned quite sick an awful fear came over him the ground heaved and set like the sea and the whole plain seemed to be rolling in waves towards them the motion was so violent that some were nearly thrown down and expected every moment to see the whole town swallowed up the houses the walls and the bastions were rocking and reeling in a most terrific manner and falling into complete ruin while all along the south and west faces of the parapets which had cost us so much labor to erect were crumbling away like sand the whole was enveloped in one immense cloud of dust out of which came cries of terror from the hundreds within when the dreadful noise and quaking ceased a dead silence succeeded all being so deeply impressed by the terror of the scene that they dared not utter a sound the men were absolutely green with fear presently a gentle breeze sprang up officers encouraged the men to go on with their work but looking around the valley they saw every fort and village wrapped in dense clouds of dust from some the dust was streaming away like smoke from others it rose high in the air in dense columns when the breeze had cleared away the dust from jellalabad an awful scene of destruction appeared the upper stories of the houses were all gone and beams posts doors windows bits of wall ends of roof earth and dust all were mingled in one confused heap it was as if some gigantic hand had taken up the houses and thrown them down in one rubbish heap the parapets all round had fallen from the walls the walls were split in many places in the eastern wall a breach had been made large enough for two companies abreast to walk through sales bugle sounded the assembly and they went in at once on muster being taken it was found that the loss of life was happily only three men crushed in the cavalry hospital on looking round it was found that a month's cannonading with a hundred pieces of heavy artillery could not have produced the damage that the earthquake had effected in a few seconds the hand of the almighty had indeed humbled our pride and taught us the wholesome lesson that he alone is a sure defence the colonel narrowly escaped with his life he had been standing on the wall which he said after he was taken up from the ruins wriggled like a snake 
in one place as an officer was passing along the ramparts the ground opened beneath him and he fell in but only to be thrown out again an operation which was twice repeated at a spot near the river the wall had opened so wide that a man could have slipped through all the barracks and sheds were in ruins all shelter for the men was destroyed this however was not the time for idle wonder or for despair without delay every man in garrison was set to work and though there were frequent shocks of earthquake during the day the ruins had been cleared away by dusk and a temporary parapet of clods of earth and clay made all round the walls toward sunset a small body of horsemen from akbar's camp came to reconnoitre abbott who was looking out sent a shot right into the party making them scamper off probably to report to their chiefs that the fortifications were uninjured and that our magic had caused the earthquake but we were in a critical state with all defences levelled a huge breach in the works and the destroyer of our kabul force within a few miles of us with the whole power of the country at his back they had now daily fights for their forage the grass cutters went out in early dawn under a strong escort the grass in india is a creeping grass the shoots run along underground or it would perish in the droughts of summer the grass cutter armed with a small hoe sits down on his heels and with a sweeping motion cuts the grass half an inch below the surface of the ground he then collects it beats off the earth and brings it home on his head this grass is very sweet and nutritious as the hot weather advanced they had to go further afield for grass on the second of march akbar sent a large force round to the east and they were invested i find this in my journal for the second of march all our comforts are vanishing tea has long been gone coffee goes to-day sugar on its last legs butter gone no grass for the cows candles not to be had akbar is trying to starve us out lead for the rifles was in great request some officers of the thirteenth hit upon a very comical method of procuring it they dressed up a figure cocked hat red coat painted face and put it on a short pole hoisted up above the ramparts and managed adroitly it created no end of fun eagerly the afghans fired at it thousands of bullets went over their heads or battered against the wall below whenever they thought the general was hit or saw him bob down they yelled and shouted like madmen how many generals must they not have killed generals running short the figure was hit sometimes in the evening or early morning they used to go outside and pick up the bullets of which immense numbers were found in the course of half an hour one morning seaton picked up a hundred and twenty one but several officers picked up more from the second of march the day on which the enemy established a camp east of the city they all slept at their posts on the walls no one took off his clothes none of them wore uniform but clothes made of camel hair cloth too much digging for fine uniforms on the tenth of march as the afghans had been thronging the ravines for many days sale thought it wise to see to it so a sortie with eight hundred men was ordered they thoroughly examined the ravines at night and destroyed the enemy's shelters as they were retiring into the town the enemy came on pursuing with loud yells and screams their horse came boldly down towards the town offering a splendid mark for abbott whose guns plied them with shot and shell with deadly effect not a single horseman could stand before abbott's gun within twelve hundred yards his aim was so unerring ever since the siege of bertpur he had been celebrated for his skill as an artilleryman and they had daily proof of his prowess so the month progressed fighting or working by day watching on the walls by night and all the time on half rations they knew that government was assembling a force at peshawar under pollock in order to relieve them for they got a stray letter now and then hard work poor food anxiety were making all thin and pale and some of them were angry with sale that he would not go out and fight 
for they felt perfectly capable of squaring accounts with akbar and his legions but fighting bob as he was called would not come up to his name night after night they were roused from their short sleep by earthquakes a sharper shock a violent heave a short cracking sound and all would start up listen grumble try to get to sleep again some messengers came in from peshawar on the twenty fifth they heard the men of the thirteenth in fits of laughter at some absurd game they were playing and all the native soldiers singing in chorus their festival songs they were astounded why they said you are besieged and ought to be sad and dispirited but you are all as merry as possible when they saw the ease with which a party of akbar's men were beaten in a fight for some grass they were utterly confounded when they returned to peshawar all this went down the road to the khyber with wonderful additions it was just the sort of tale that in the mouths of such men would not lose in the telling all this time the greatest cordiality and good feeling prevailed between the european and native soldiers i remember one case of disagreement says seaton a sepoy of my company met a soldier of the thirteenth on a narrow path in the town the soldier overbalanced himself and stepped into the mud being very hot-tempered he struck the sepoy a violent blow the latter came to me to make his complaint the matter was referred to sale who was furious blew up the english soldier fearfully and ordered him to confinement as the adjutant was marching the soldier off the sepoy took the soldier by the hand and said general sahib forgive him there has not been one quarrel between any of us ever since the regiments have been together you have scolded with him so i ask you please forgive him the general granted the sepoy's request the soldier said he was sorry he had given way to temper and struck a man who could behave so generously many of our soldiers had friends among the sepoys and i have known more than once a soldier when dying send for his sepoy friend to be with him in his last moments akbar had a new idea he caused large flocks of sheep to be driven over the distant forage grounds on the thirtieth they saw these flocks going within range of the guns they looked at them with hungry eyes on the morning of the first of april a flock of sheep was driven by the enemy's shepherds close to the old ruined fort several officers got round sail and fairly badgered him into making an attempt to carry them off four hundred men all the cavalry and some pikemen were ordered out as they sallied forth seaton heard a man on the wall say to a friend i say bill what a lark if we can get in all them sheep the cavalry rode out and got round them the sheep were given to the pikemen the infantry extended in skirmishing order to check the enemy who were running up the sheep were got in the last one dropping a lamb on the very threshold they had one man killed and eight wounded but were all in the highest spirits and when the afghans dancing with rage showed themselves on the hills they were saluted with shouts of laughter and a thousand cries of ba ba the garrison got four hundred and eighty one sheep and a few goats the general gave forty sheep to the men of seaton's regiment natives but they with great good feeling desired that the sheep should be given to the english soldiers for whom they said such food was necessary while they could do very well on their rations bravo thirty-fifth native infantry a grateful letter came in return from the non-commissioned officers and privates of the thirteenth l i to colonel denny ending with believe me sir that feeling is more gratifying to us than the value of the gift and we shall ever feel the obligation our old comrades and brother campaigners have placed us under on the third a spy came in and told them that when akbar learnt that they had captured his sheep he burst into such a transport of fury that his people were afraid to go near him on the sixth of april they heard that pollock had been repulsed in the khyber pass and at noon akbar fired a royal salute in honour of his victory all the officers now went to sale and urged on him the absolute necessity of going out and fighting akbar sale saw that the time for action had arrived 
on the morning of the seventh strong guards were posted at the gates a picket in the centre of the town and all pikemen sick and wounded soldiers etc were sent to man the walls and a very respectable show they made with the first peep of dawn the gates were quietly opened and the three columns under denny monteith and havelock sallied out the plan was to march direct on akbar's camp burn it drive him into the river and bring off his guns they wasted some time in attacking a ruinous fort and colonel denny was mortally wounded then sale called off the troops and they went straight for akbar the sound of the guns had aroused all the enemy's force and they were turning out in thousands it was a grand sight to see their large masses of horse coming down from the hills they charged boldly on havelock's column which rapidly thrown into square received them with the greatest coolness and repulsed them with heavy loss they then made an attack on seaton's regiment but at this moment two guns of abbott's battery came up and sent shot and shell crashing into the enemy's ranks making them recoil faster than they had advanced the english soon came within sight of the afghan camp from whence the enemy opened fire on them which caused some loss but they made a rush and carried the camp without a check while the enemy fled through the groves of trees beyond they tried to carry off one of the guns but a shot by abbott killed the two horses attached to the limber and the artillerymen fled numbers of the fugitives threw themselves into the river which swollen and rapid destroyed the greatest part of them the whole of akbar's camp fell into our hands his guns ammunition standards plunder everything he had with him the bugle soon recalled the skirmishers and seaton was detached with a party to fire the tents and the huts made of boughs and reeds the smoke of the burning proclaimed our victory to the whole valley numbers of camels and mounds of grain fell into our hands i secured three noble camels for myself and right good service they did me afterwards sale was anxious to get back to jellalabad so the men returned in triumph each man carrying off what he pleased and were received with loud cheers from the walls a little after dark the news was brought in by some hindus living in the valley that every fort and village within eight miles had been deserted this night they slept in bed perfectly undisturbed after passing the last thirty-six nights on the ramparts armed and accoutred constantly roused by the enemy by their own rounds by the relief of sentries by those terrible earthquakes many nights drenched by rain without shelter quiet rest in a real bed for the whole night was an unspeakable luxury but coupled with the thought that unaided we had broken the toils cast round us by akbar khan that we had beaten in fair fight the chief who had destroyed our kabul army that months of toil watching anxiety and peril had been crowned with glorious success that our country's honor was safe in our hands it was positive bliss such as few have had the happiness to taste on this night even the earthquake spared them no sudden roar no sharp electric shock no far-off rumbling sound no sharp crack of doom to startle them from their well-earned repose it was bliss it was observed that earthquakes usually followed much rain thus raising the question whether steam may not often be the origin of the phenomenon next day they found five hundred and eighty rounds of ammunition for the captured guns now food began to pour in from the country and they lived on the fat of the land news came in that pollock had forced the khyber and would arrive about the fifteenth at length on the morning of the fourteenth they could see with their glasses pollock's force coming near they had not arrived in time to help the garrison in their imminent peril they had lost the grand opportunity of joining with them to crush the man whose treachery had destroyed their brothers in arms whose bones lay scattered in the icy passes of kabul a fifth part of pollock's cavalry would have enabled them to annihilate akbar and all his troops so when next morning pollock's force did arrive there was a hearty welcome but a sly bit of sarcasm in the tune to which the band of the thirteenth played them in your o'er lang a comin it was not pollock's fault however 
he had to wait for the troops to join him at Peshawar. Let me relate one incident, writes Colonel Seaton, that will tend to illustrate the character of my old commander, General Sir R. Sale. Shortly after Akbar's camp appeared in sight, it was whispered about in garrison that Akbar intended to bring Lady Sale, then a prisoner in his hands, before the walls, and put her to torture within sight, and so compel Sale to surrender. Every day when the men were at dinner, Sale used to take a turn on the ramparts, ostensibly to have a quiet look round at the progress of our works, but in reality, I believe, to ponder on the desperate situation of his wife and daughter, and debate with himself the means of effecting their rescue. We knew that they were well, had hitherto been kindly treated, and were in Akbar's fort not many miles off one day sale in going his rounds came and stood over the south gate where i was on duty so as i had enjoyed the privilege of great intimacy with him and lady sale at kabul i went out and joined him i ventured to mention this report and asked him what he would do if it should prove true and if akbar should put his threat into execution turning towards me his face pale and stern but quivering with deep emotion he replied i i will have every gun turned on her my old bones shall be buried beneath the ruins of the fort here but i will never surrender could lady sale have heard it her heart would have bounded with pride for the heroine was worthy of her hero the reception of the garrison by Lord Ellenborough at Ferrispur was a noble and ample return for all their toil and suffering. His lordship had taken care that each officer and man of the illustrious garrison, as he termed them, should have a medal, and they were sent out to them before they reached Ferrispur. Not an English officer in India at this time had such a mark of distinction. They were the first to be so honored and were highly gratified by it on the morning on which they marched in the bridge of boats over the sutlej was gaily ornamented with flags and streamers his lordship met them at the bridge head and was the first to welcome them as they stepped on the soil of our own provinces all the troops in camp were drawn up in line at open order and received them as they passed with presented arms lord ellenborough also ordered that at each station they marched through on their way to their destination the same military honor should be rendered to them the garrison were received with similar marks of distinction at karnal at delhi and at agra we may forget everything else but we shall never forget lord ellenborough's noble and ever ready kindness and the many honors he caused to be shown us one word more after the mutiny it is not to be wondered at that the sepoy was written down as a demon and a coward but we had known him as an excellent soldier generally mild and humane and temperate as a man sometimes even generous and forgiving as the best of christians when will it become the english custom to recite before our young of both sexes some of the deeds which have saved the empire lest we forget if not in church at least in school we should make this effort to save our children from ignorance which is ingratitude from major general sir thomas seaton's record from cadet to colonel by kind permission of measures g rutledge and sons end of chapter seven Chapter Eight of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: Siege of Sebastopol, eighteen fifty four, eighteen fifty six. The English land without tents. Mister Kinglake shows off before Lord Raglan. The Alma. Strange escapes. Looted houses. Fair plunder. Balaclava Bay. Horses lost at sea. A derelict worth saving jack very helpful the heavy and light brigades spies fraternizing 
the crimean war fought between russia on the one hand and england france turkey and sardinia on the other consisted mainly in the siege of sebastopol a strong fortified port in the south of russia they fought ostensibly about the guardianship of the holy sepulchre in jerusalem but really because turkey was thought to be decaying and russia wished to protect the slavonic races in her own interest and to extend her power to the dardanelles the war was characterized by the great sufferings of the troops during the winter intensified by storms in the black sea where so many transports laden with warm clothing went to the bottom that our men were left unprotected even at the first landing on the fourteenth of september eighteen fifty four these sufferings commenced imagine a bare and desolate beach the home of seagull and wild fowl suddenly turned into a barrack yard from one end to the other bayonets glistened red coats and brass mounted shakos gleamed in solid masses the transports were tossing yonder out in the offing and as gig or cutter grounded on the sand the officers of each company first landed each in full dress and carried his greatcoat fastened by a strap around his body after the officers came the men bearing rations for three days in their wallets before they were all well on shore the rain began and the wind was sending a little surf on the beach the horses were not yet landed so generals and staff officers might be seen sitting on powder barrels on the shore retiring gloomily within the folds of cape and mackintosh disconsolate doctors were groaning after hospital panniers which had not yet arrived for strange to say more than one man died on that beach the country people though at first full of fear of the invaders soon brought food to sell and retired with twinkling eyes they were of tartar race with small eyes set wide apart and high cheekbones that first night in the crimea twenty thousand englishmen and not one tent among them the wind rose and the rain fell in sheets piercing through the great coats and blankets of the soldiers their only bed was the reeking puddles they had no fire to cheer them no hot grog they were just miserable while the french and the turks were lying snug under canvas no wonder that there was a great increase in illness among the troops next day the surf was so heavy that many boats were stove in and the work of landing horses and guns was difficult on the morning of the twentieth as lord raglan the commander-in-chief was waiting surrounded by his staff for the troops to get into position a gentleman joined them on a handsome gray pony the pony began neighing and screaming so loudly that no one could hear a word that was said lord raglan turned and asked does any one know who that gentleman is one of the staff replied i think it is one of the newspaper reporters my lord shall i ask him to go away lord raglan laughed and said if you do he will show you up you may depend upon it it is mr kinglake the author of eothen said another oh said my lord a most charming man and was going to speak to him when the french marshal st arnaud rode up and prevented it about an hour after as lord raglan was nearing the russian position a pony dashed past at a furious pace and who should it be but mr kinglake the future historian of the crimean war on he went right through the skirmishers with his horse's head between his legs fortunately for the rider the saddle got forward and soon went over the horse's ears of course the author of eothen went with the saddle which was better than riding into the enemy's lines it struck the staff as rather an absurd thing just before a battle and they all laughed but lord ragland rode up and offered him another pony mr kinglake has not mentioned this personal adventure in his history then came the battle of the alma a river at that time of year only knee-deep it cost us nearly three thousand men killed or wounded they say the individual escape of officers and men was miraculous chin straps were shot off buttons carried away belts torn coats ripped all without further injury to the wearer many hundred russians threw away their arms and accoutrements in their flight on the further heights about a mile and a half from the alma the british troops ceased their pursuit 
and then arose such a cheer a cheer from twenty thousand victorious men even some of the wounded fellows joined in it i shall never forget that cheer as long as i live writes an officer it was indeed thrilling i almost pitied the fallen enemy it must have been so galling to them i heard a man of the guards say to a comrade i say bill pleasant for them poor devils pointing to some wounded russians hearing our chaps cheer like that lord raglan rode up and down the line the men cheering him heartily there was such a shaking of hands one felt very choky about the throat and very much inclined to cry as one wrung the hand of a friend god bless you old fellow so glad to see you all right and so on it was a touching sight to see the meeting between lord raglan and sir colin campbell the latter was on foot as his horse had been killed under him he went up to his lordship and with tears in his eyes shook hands saying it was not the first battlefield they had won together the battle was over at twenty minutes to four p m next morning the poor wounded were far more quiet many had died during the night numbers of our men were going about among the wounded before it was light giving them drinks of water all those shot through the head died with a smile on their faces some looked so happy poor fellows that one felt comforted on the twenty third of september order was given to prepare for marching and the army left the heights of the alma but what is that gray mass on the plain almost lying without life or motion now and then indeed an arm may be seen waved aloft or a man raises himself for a moment looks around and then lies down again alas that plain is covered with the wounded russians still nearly sixty long hours have they passed in agony on the wet ground and now the english must leave them as they lie seven hundred and fifty wounded men are still on the ground and we can do nothing for them their wounds have been bound and dressed by us and lord raglan has told the headman of a tartar village to do what he can for them at first the country was hilly and barren but on coming to the valley of the katcha there were beautiful verdure shrubs white villas and snug cottages vineyards and gardens a guide-post showed they were ten miles from sebastopol the road now looked like a byway in devon or hampshire low walls were surmounted by fruit trees laden with apples pears peaches and apricots all ripe and fit for use the first villa they came to was the residence of a country surgeon it had been ruthlessly destroyed by the cossacks a veranda laden with clematis roses and honeysuckle was filled with broken chairs and tables all the glass of the windows was smashed there lay on the grass outside the hall door two side saddles a parasol and a big whip the wine casks were broken and spilt the barley and corn of the granary were tossed about broken china and glass were scattered over the floors and amid all the desolation and ruin of the place a cat sat blandly on the threshold winking her eyes in the sunshine at the newcomers the scene within was awful the beds had been ripped open and the feathers littered the rooms a foot deep chairs sofas bookcases pictures images of saints needlework bottles physic jars all smashed or torn lay in heaps in every room even the walls and doors were hacked with swords it was as if the very genius of destruction had been at work and had reveled in mischief every other house and villa that they passed was a similar scene to this grand pianos and handsome pieces of furniture covered with silk and velvet rent to pieces with brutal violence were found in the larger houses the houses consist of one story only size being gained by lateral extension each house has a large patch of vineyard around it a porch covered with vines protects the entrance they learnt from a deserter that the natives were hiding because they expected to be shot also that the russians in their retreat had been seized with panic in the night and had rushed off pell-mell indeed the state of the roads favoured this for they were littered with linstocks cartridges and caps all the way our soldiers now fared on the richest of grapes and the choicest pears but they were not allowed to waste or plunder september twenty five 
on the march to balaclava they got near the enemy they proved to be the baggage guard of a large detachment a few rounds a cavalry charge the rifles in skirmishing order and they broke leaving baggage of every description strewed over the ground for two miles this was fair and lawful plunder and the troops were halted and allowed to take what they liked and what they could carry the officers presided over it to see that there was no quarrelling immense quantities of wearing apparel dressing cases valuable ornaments and jewellery were found in the carts a russian artillery officer found in one of the carriages was in a very jovial mood beside an empty champagne bottle fine winter cloaks lined with fur were found in abundance this plunder put our soldiers in great good humour and they marched on the whole day in excellent spirits as the baggage was some miles behind lord ragland had to put up in a miserable little lodge while his staff slept on the ground in a ditch outside not the smallest attempt was made by the enemy to annoy the english during this march to balaclava but we could have been greatly harassed by the smallest activity on their part the march lay through woods along bad and often precipitous roads and a few trees felled at intervals could have stopped our army for hours we had it seems taken the russians by surprise and they showed themselves quite destitute of resources balaclava september twenty four i never was more astonished in my life writes sir w russell than when i halted on the top of one of the numerous hills of which this part of the crimea is composed and looking far down saw under my feet a little pond closely shut in by the sides of high rocky mountains on this pond floated six or seven english ships for which exit seemed quite hopeless the bay is like a highland tarn it is long ere the eye admits that it is some half mile in length from the sea and varies from two hundred and fifty to a hundred and twenty yards in breadth the shores are so steep and precipitous that they shut out the expanse of the harbour and make it appear much smaller than it really is towards the sea the cliffs rose up and completely overlap the narrow channel which leads to the haven so that it is quite invisible on the southeast of the poor village which straggles between the base of the rocky hills and the margin of the sea there are extensive ruins of a genoese fort built some two hundred feet above the level of the sea all crumbling in decay bastion and tower and wall a narrow defile leads to the town a few resolute men posted here might have given great trouble to a large army the staff advanced first on the town and were proceeding to enter it when to their surprise from some old forts above came four spurts of smoke and down came four shells close to them the dose of shell was repeated but by this time the agamemnon outside the rocks was heard busily sending her shot against the fort after a few rounds the fort was summoned hung out a flag of truce and surrendered there were only sixty men all made prisoners as lord raglan entered at noon the principal street the inhabitants came out to meet him bearing trays laden with fruit and flowers others bore loaves of bread cut up in pieces and placed on dishes covered with salt in token of good will and submission the fleet and army were once more united lord raglan had secured his base of operations towards evening the huge bulk of the agamemnon glided in between the rocks of the entrance to the joy and delight of all on shore october three sebastopol is not yet invested it is only threatened on the south and southeast side by the army while the fleet attacks it from the east there is an enormous boom across the entrance and many ships have been sunk close to shore the russians can throw shot further from their batteries than we can from our decks their shot went over us the other day when ours were falling five hundred yards short since we landed in the crimea as many have died of cholera as perished at the alma the deserters say that thirty russian ladies went out of sebastopol to see the alma battle as though they were going to a picnic they were quite assured of the success of the russian troops and great was their dismay when they had to fly for their lives 
bad news to-day about the dragoons horses some two hundred horses coming from varna have perished en route the sea ran high fittings and horse boxes gave way and the horses got loose upon the deck and were killed or washed overboard october nine an amusing incident has happened towards noon a large ship under austrian colors was seen standing in towards sebastopol the russian fort constantine opened fire on her at twenty five hundred yards but the ship paid no attention to the shot and shell which flew over her the other russian batteries followed suit still the austrian cared not not a sheet did she slack while the shot struck her hull and riggings she came right up past the batteries and passed them unscathed nearing the shore as she came the firebrand went to her assistance and received several shot in her hull while doing so but captain stewart persevered and brought her off what do you think why she had been deserted by her crew when the wind failed and she was getting too near sebastopol but she was laden with six hundred tons of hay for the english army her escape is almost miraculous but it is a proof of the bad gunnery of the russians october thirteen it is now eighteen days since our army by a brilliant march on balaclava obtained its magnificent position on the south side of sebastopol up to this moment not a british or french gun has replied to the fire of the enemy the russians have employed the interval in throwing up earthworks trenches and batteries to cover the south side of the town the delays had been quite unavoidable we had to send all our guns and materiel round by sea and land it as best we could all these enormous masses of metal were to be dragged by men or a few horses over a steep and hilly country a distance of eight miles you have some idea of the severity of the work in the fact that on the tenth no less than thirty-three ammunition horses were found dead we had now opened out about fifteen hundred yards of trench fit for the reception of heavy guns jack made himself very useful to us the only thing against him was that he is too strong he pulls strong carts to pieces as if they were toys he piles up shot cases in the wagons till the horses fall under the weight for he cannot understand the ship starting till the hold is full but it is most cheering to meet a lot of these jolly fellows working up a gun to the camp from a distance you can hear a hearty english chorus borne on the breeze the astonishment of the stupid fur-capped crim tartars as they stare at the wondrous apparitions of our hairy hercules is ludicrous to a degree but jack salutes every foreigner who goes by with the same cry bono johnny and still the song proceeds october twenty two lord dunkellen captain coldstream guards was taken prisoner this morning he was out with a working party of his regiment which had got a little out of their way when a number of men were observed through the dawning light in front of them they are the russians exclaimed one of his men nonsense they're our fellows said his lordship and went off towards them asking in a high tone as he got near who is in command of this party his men saw him no more the russians fired no shot but merely closed around and seized him before he could get away october twenty five at half past seven this morning an orderly came galloping in to the headquarters camp from balaclava with the news that at dawn a strong corps of russian horse supported by guns and battalions of infantry had marched into the valley and had already nearly dispersed the turks of the redoubt number one and that they were opening fire on the other redoubts which would soon be in their hands unless the turks offered a stouter resistance sir george cathcart and h r h the duke of cambridge were ordered to put their divisions the fourth and the first in motion for the scene of action sir colin campbell who was in command of balaclava had drawn up the ninety-third highlanders in front of the road to the town the french artillerymen and zouaves prepared for action along their lines lord lucan's little camp was full of excitement the men had not had time to water their horses they had not broken their fast yet and had barely saddled at the first blast of the trumpet when they were drawn up on the slope behind the redoubts soon after eight o'clock lord raglan and his staff cantered up towards our rear 
a french general bosquet with his staff and an escort of hussars followed at a gallop never did the painter's eye rest on a more beautiful scene than i beheld from the ridge the fleecy vapors still hung around the mountain tops and mingled with the ascending volumes of smoke from the cannonade the patch of sea sparkled freshly in the rays of the morning sun but its light was eclipsed by the flashes which gleamed from the masses of armed men below to our disgust we saw the turks fly at the approach of the russians but the horse hoof of the cossack was too quick for them and sword and lance were busily plied among the retreating herd the yells of the pursuers and pursued were plainly audible the turks betake themselves to the highlanders where they check their flight and form into companies on the scotsman's flanks the russian cavalry seeing the highlanders halt till they have about fifteen hundred men along the ridge lancers dragoons and hussars they drew breath for a moment and then in one grand line dashed at the highlanders who were drawn up too deep the ground flies beneath their horses feet gathering speed at every stride they dash on towards that thin red streak topped with a line of steel the turks fire a volley at eight hundred yards and run as the russians come within six hundred yards down goes that line of steel in front and out rings a rolling volley of minier musketry the distance is too great the russians come on with breathless suspense every one awaits the bursting of the wave upon the line of gaelic rock but ere they come within a hundred and fifty yards another deadly volley flashes from the levelled rifle carrying death and terror into the russians they wheel about open files right and left and fly back faster than they came bravo highlanders well done shouted the excited spectators but events thicken the russians evidently corps de lit their light blue jackets embroidered with silver lace were advancing at an easy gallop towards the brow of the hill a forest of lances glistened in their rear and squadrons of grey-coated dragoons moved up to support them the instant they came in sight the trumpets of our cavalry gave out the warning blast which told us all that in another moment we should see the shock of battle beneath our very eyes lord raglan all his staff and escort groups of officers zouaves french generals and officers bodies of french infantry on the heights were spectators of the scene as though they were looking on the stage from the boxes of a theatre nearly every one dismounted and sat down in deep silence the russians rode down the hill at a slow canter which they changed to a trot and at last nearly halted their line was at least double the length of ours and it was three times as deep behind them was a similar line equally strong and compact they evidently despised their insignificant-looking enemy but their time was come the trumpets rang out again through the valley the scots greys and the enniskillens went right at the centre of the russian cavalry the space between them was only a few hundred yards it was barely enough to let the horses gather way the russian line brings forward each wing as our horse advance and threatens to annihilate them as they pass turning a little to the left to meet the russian right the greys rush on with a cheer that thrills to every heart the wild shout of the enniskillens rises at the same instant as lightning flashes through a cloud the greys and enniskillens pierce through the dark masses of the russians the shock was but for a moment there was a clash of steel a light play of sword blades in the air and then the greys and the redcoats vanish in the midst of the shaken and quivering columns in another moment we see them emerging and dashing on with diminished numbers in broken order against the second line which is advancing against them as fast as it can to retrieve the fortune of the charge it was a terrible moment god help them they are lost with unabated fire the noble hearts rode at their enemy it was a fight of heroes the first line of russians though broken had turned and were coming back to swallow up our poor handful of men 
by sheer steel and sheer courage inniskellen and scott were winning their desperate way right through the enemy squadrons and already gray horses and redcoats had appeared at the rear of the second mass when with irresistible force the first royals the fourth dragoon guards and the fifth rushed at the remnants of the first line of the enemy went through it as though it were made of pasteboard and dashing on the second body of russians still disordered by the terrible assault of the greys and irish put them to utter rout a cheer rose from every lip in the enthusiasm officers and men took off their caps and shouted with delight clapping their hands again and again lord raglan at once dispatched lord curzon to convey his congratulations to general scarlet and to say well done the gallant old officer's face beamed with pleasure when he received the message our loss was very slight about thirty-five killed and wounded presently general camrobert attended by his staff rode up to lord raglan and complimented him upon the magnificent charge of our cavalry it was shortly after this that the historic charge of the light brigade took place owing to an order misinterpreted lord lucan received a written order from brigadier airy through captain nolan to advance his cavalry nearer to the enemy where are we to advance to asked lord lucan captain nolan pointed with his finger to the mass of russian cavalry the six battalions of infantry and the thirty guns that faced them and said there are the enemy sir and there are the guns it is your duty to take them don quixote in his tilt against the windmill was not so rash and reckless as the gallant fellows who prepared thus to rush on almost certain death it is a maxim of war that cavalry never act without a support that infantry should be close at hand the only support our light cavalry had was the reserve of heavy cavalry a long way behind them as they swept proudly past officers could scarcely believe the evidence of their senses surely that handful of men was not going to charge an enemy in position at the distance of twelve hundred yards from thirty iron mouths there belched forth a flood of smoke and flame there were instant gaps in our ranks dead men and horses riderless horses starting aside but the remnant rode on into the smoke of the batteries you could see their sabres flashing as they cut down the gunners you saw them return break through a column of infantry then exposed to a flank fire from the battery on the hill scattered broken wounded dismounted flying towards their base but at this moment a large body of lancers was hurled on their flank they were cutting their way through this mass when there took place an act of atrocity without parallel in modern warfare the russian gunners had returned to their guns they saw their own cavalry mingled with the troopers who had just ridden over them and to their eternal disgrace poured in a murderous volley of grape and canister thus mingling friend and foe in one common ruin all our operations in the trenches were lost sight of in the interest of this melancholy day in which our light brigade was annihilated by their own rashness and by the brutality of a ferocious enemy november three there were many spies in our camp sometimes dressed like french officers and we not clever enough to detect the bad french the other night the sentinel before the house of the provost-marshal in balaclava was astonished to see a horse with a sack of corn on his back deliberately walking past him in the moonlight he went over to seize the animal when the sack of corn suddenly became changed into a full-grown cossack who drove the spurs into his horse and vanished our sentries often fraternized with the russian sentries a few nights ago our men saw some russian soldiers coming towards them without arms and they supposed them to be deserters but on coming nearer they made signs that they wanted a light for their pipes and then they stayed a few minutes talking first russian inglese bono first englishman ruski bono second russian oslem no bono second englishman ah turk no bono pretending to run away as if frightened upon which all the party go into roars of laughter and then after shaking hands they all retire to their respective beats ready for the bloody work of war 
from sir w howard russell's letters from the crimea by kind permission of messrs george rutledge and sons limited end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. After Inkerman, eighteen fifty four, eighteen fifty five. Valiant deeds. Lord Raglan under fire. Tyrone the best shot. A prince's button. A cold Christmas. Savage horses. The Mamelon Redoubt. Corporal Quinn. Colonel Zia. The Battle of Inkerman was fought on the 5th of November, 1854, in a thick fog. It began very early in the morning with a surprise, and developed into a series of desperate deeds of daring, of hand-to-hand -hand fights, of despairing rallies, of desperate assaults in glen and valley, in brushwood glades and remote dells at six o'clock in the morning our men of the second division were roused by their tents being ripped to pieces by russian shells in darkness gloom and rain the british troops sallied forth to meet the foe with the bayonet if they could many valiant deeds were done some were noted many were unmarked lieutenant cross was surrounded by russians who attacked him with the bayonet though he was badly wounded he shot two with his revolver then a private running up to help him shot another bayoneted the fourth and carried the lieutenant away in his arms mcgrath was captured by two russians but while they were leading him away he seized the firelock of one of them shot the russian and dashed out the brains of the other burke was surrounded just as a ball broke his jawbone he rushed amongst his enemies shot three dead with his revolver and cut two men down with his sword he fell at last with more than thirty wounds on his body. When Sir George Cathcart was shot and our men were retiring, Colonel Seymour of the Guards, a dear friend who had served with him through the campaign at Kafferland, rushed forward to help him and in so doing was shot through the leg. "'Come back, Colonel!' the men shouted as they swept past the two officers. "'No, no, my place is here with Sir George,' replied Seymour. "'You must leave him,' cried General Torrens. "'The enemy are close at hand. You will be killed, man.' But nothing could persuade the Colonel to leave the side of his dying chief. There he remained, alone, against the rushing tide of battle, and met a hero's death in endeavouring to protect his friend from insult and mutilation.' when later in the day some of the french troops were seen to retire before the impetuous onslaught of the russian masses lord raglan dispatched an aide-de-camp to general pennefather who was near the french division to ask him how he was getting on the general sent word in reply that he could hold his own perfectly well and that he thought the enemy looked like retiring if i can be reinforced with fresh troops i will follow the russians up and lick them to the devil lord raglan was so delighted with this spirited answer that he galloped over to the french general canrobert and translated general pennefather's words literally to him jusqu'au diable général that was what he said canrobert who had just remounted his horse after having his arm bound up exclaimed ah quel brave garçon quel brave homme quel bon général the day ended with a great artillery duel in which colonel dixon won great renown and mowed down great lanes through the massed forces opposed to him until they broke and fled captain peel of h m s diamond greatly distinguished himself for his marvellous sang-froid in action a shell fell close to a gun which he was laying in the trenches instead of running to take cover he picked up the shell and lifted it over the parapet the shell exploded just after it left his hands and did no damage whereas had it burst on the spot where it fell probably many men would have been killed and wounded a private of the thirty third duke of wellington's regiment was surprised and made prisoner by two russian soldiers when an advanced sentry one of the russians took possession of his musket and the other of his pouch and they marched him between them towards sebastopol it was not the direction which tommy wanted to take 
so he kept wary watch and when he fancied his captors were off their guard he sprang on the one who carried his musket seized it knocked the fellow down and then shot dead the russian who carried his pouch meanwhile the rusky from whom tommy had taken his own musket rose up from his recumbent position fired and missed his aim tommy promptly hit him on the head with the butt end of his musket after this the englishman proceeded at leisure to take off his foe's accoutrement and he returned to his post laden with spoils being fired at by the russian sentries and cheered loudly by the english pickets but lord raglan himself gave several instances of great coolness under fire he was sitting on horseback during the battle of inkerman in the midst of a battery of artillery watching our men working the guns a very heavy fire was being directed against this part of the field and one of his staff suggested the propriety of his not putting himself in quite so dangerous and conspicuous a place especially as from the number of bullets that came singing by it was clear he was being made a mark for the enemy's riflemen lord raglan however merely said yes they seem firing at us a little but i think i get a better view here than in most places so there he remained for some time and then turning his horse rode along the whole length of the ridge at a foot's pace some of the hangers-on about the staff found they had business elsewhere and cantered unobtrusively away towards evening of the same day lord ragland was returning from taking his last leave of general strangways who had been mortally wounded and was riding up towards the ridge a sergeant of the seventh fusiliers approached carrying canteens of water to take up for the wounded as lord raglan passed he drew himself up to make the usual salute when a round shot came bounding over the hill and knocked his forage cap off his head the man calmly picked up his cap dusted it on his knee placed it carefully on his head and then made the military salute all without moving a muscle of his countenance lord raglan was delighted with the sergeant's coolness and smiling said to him a near thing that my man yes my lord replied the sergeant with another salute but a miss is as good as a mile one of the most painful things during the battle was the number of wounded horses some of the poor creatures went grazing about the fields limping on three legs one perhaps having been broken or carried away by a shot others were galloping about wildly screaming with terror and fright at times two or three horses would attach themselves to the staff as if desirous of company or for human protection one poor beast who had its nose and mouth shot away used to edge in amongst the staff and rub its gory head against their horse's flanks he was at last ordered to be put out of his pain being in this more fortunate than many poor soldiers who lay out for several nights in their agony it was a day or two after that the best shot in the british army was killed lieutenant tryon of the rifle brigade was shot through the head when in the act of firing at the retreating russians he was a great loss much beloved by his men it is stated that he had himself killed over a hundred russians at the battle of inkerman he employed himself the whole day in firing at the russian artillerymen he had two of his men to load for him and they say that he knocked over thirty russians besides wounding several more general conrobert issued a general order eulogizing the conduct of our rifle and lamenting in just terms the death of lieutenant tryon this must be the first occasion on record of a french general particularizing the bravery of a british officer of tryon's rank there is a story told which proves that russian generals were not dead to a sense of humor a mr c an officer in an english regiment was taken prisoner in a sortie of the russians and was sent on to Simferpool a day or two after his arrival there he received some letters from england which had been sent in with a flag of truce one of these letters was from a young lady who was engaged to mr c in this letter she wrote i hope dearest that if you take prince menchikoff prisoner you will cut a button off his coat and send it to me in a letter as you know how fond i am of relics all these letters had been opened and translated at the russian headquarters as is usual prince menchikoff was shown this letter which amused him not a little 
so he wrote to mr c saying how much he regretted he was unable to pose as a prisoner when it was the other way about but he had much pleasure in sending him the enclosed button off his best coat which he trusted mr c would forward to the young lady with his compliments by december the whole army was suffering worn out by night work by vigil in rain and storm by hard laboring in the trenches by cholera and short allowances for nine days there was no issue of tea coffee or sugar to the troops food corn hay were stowed in sailing vessels outside the harbor a hurricane arose to the bottom went provender and food for twenty days of all the horses you could hardly tell an officer from a corporal they were all hairy and muddy filthy worn mounted on draggle-tailed ponies yet withal we are told they were the noblest cheeriest bravest fellows in europe ready to defy privation neglect storm and wounds letters it is true sometimes came from the crimea in which the writer showed a righteous indignation against those who mismanaged affairs and caused so much unnecessary loss and suffering in one of these we read january two we have had a rough and dreary christmas where are our presents where are the fat bucks the potted meats the cakes the warm clothing the worsted devices made by the fair sympathizers at home they may be on their way but they will be too late why are our men still in tents where are the huts that were sent out some of them i have seen floating about the beach others are being converted into firewood there are thirty five hundred sick men in camp there are eight thousand sick and wounded in the hospitals on the bosphorus snow is on the hills and the wind blows cold we have no great coats our friends the zouaves are splendid fellows always gay healthy well fed they carry loads for us drink for us eat for us bake for us forage for us and all on the cheapest and most economical terms the trenches are two and three feet deep with mud snow and slush many men when they take off their shoes are unable to get their swollen feet into them again the other day i was riding through the french camp fifth regiment when an officer came up and invited me to take a glass of the brandy which had been sent out by the emperor as a christmas gift he had a bright wood fire burning in his snug warm pit our presents have so far all miscarried january nineteen after frost and snow milder weather our warm clothing has come many thousands of fine coats lined with fur and skins have been served out to the men together with long boots gloves socks and mitts what a harvest death has reaped how many are crippled by the cold january twenty four i have been viewing sebastopol from a hill the suburbs are in ruins all the streets i saw had their houses broken down roofs doors and windows were all off but the russian riflemen shoot from them i saw many walking from the sea with baskets of provisions the harbor is covered with boats may eighteen the sardinians are encamped on the slopes of pleasant hills their tents are upheld by their lances one at each end of the tent their encampment with its waving pennons has a very pretty effect the sardinians horses are rather leggy but not such formidable neighbors as the horses of the tenth hussars which are the terror of the camp breaking their picket ropes and tearing about madly yesterday i was riding peaceably along with an officer of artillery and of eighth hussars when suddenly we heard cries of look out and lo there came a furious steed down upon us his mane and tail erect he had stepped out of a mob of hussar horses to offer us battle and rushed at full gallop towards our ponies out swords was the word as the interesting beast circled round us now menacing us with his heels now with his teeth but he was repelled by two bright swords and one strong whip 
and at last to our relief he caught sight of colonel mayo who was then cantering by in ignorance of his danger till he was warned by the shouts of the soldiers the colonel defended himself and horse with great resolution and drawing his sword gave point or cut right and left as the case required till the men of the tenth came up and beat off the creature it is rather too exciting this hot weather to have to run the risk of being demolished by the heels of an insane arab june seven it has leaked out that something of import was to take place to-day between five and six p m lord raglan and his staff took up a conspicuous position looking straight into the teeth of the redan the man with the signal rockets was in attendance about half past six the french attacking column was seen to be climbing the arduous road to the mamelon fort the rocket was fired and our small force rushed for the quarries to divert the russians the french went up the steep to the mamelon in beautiful style and in loose order their figures like light shadows flitting across the dun barrier of earthworks were seen to mount up unfailingly in the evening light seen running climbing scrambling like skirmishers up the slopes amid a plunging fire from the guns as an officer who saw bosquet wave them on said at the moment they went in like a clever pack of hounds then we see the zouaves standing upon the parapets and firing down into the fort from above now they are in the heart of the mamelon and a fierce hand-to-hand -hand encounter with musket and bayonet is evidently taking place it was only seven minutes and a half from the commencement of the enterprise there is still another sharp bayonet fight and this time the russians run out on the other side spiking their guns but the roar of guns is heard on the side towards the town the russians have been reinforced when rocket after rocket went up ominously from the french general's position we began to be nervous it was growing darker and the noise of the fight seemed to be on our side of the fort at last the swell and babble of the fight once more rolled down the face of the hill they are well into it this time said a general handing over his glass to his neighbor all was still no more musket flashes no more lightning of the heavy guns from the embrasures a shapeless hump upon a hill the mamelon was an extinct volcano until such time as we should please to call it again into action how are our men getting on says one oh take my word for it they're all right said another they were in the quarries but had to fight all night and repel six successive attacks of the russians who displayed the most singular pertinacity and recklessness of life meanwhile the zouaves emboldened by success carried their prowess too far and dreamt of getting into the round tower by a coup de main the fire of the musketry from the round tower was like a shelf of flame and the shells of our gunners for we were supporting the french stood out dark against the heavens as they rose and swooped to their fall june nine as an illustration of character i note that one of our sailor artillerymen being desired to keep under cover and not put his head out to tempt a rifle bullet grumbled at the prohibition saying to his comrades i say jack they won't let a fellow go and look where his own shot is we ain't afraid we ain't that's what i call hard lines lance corporal quinn of the forty seventh has been brought to notice for bravery in one of the attacks made by the enemy on the quarries the russians had some difficulty in bringing their men again to the scratch at length one russian officer succeeded in bringing on four men which corporal quinn perceiving he made a dash out of the work and with the butt end of his musket brained one bayoneted a second and when the other two took to their heels he brought in the officer as a prisoner having administered to him a gentle prick by way of quickening his movements after delivering him up he said to his comrades there's plenty more yonder lads if so you're a mind to fetch in a prisoner or two june twenty a plan of attack was proposed that the french were to assault the malakoff and we the radan but though they got into the malakoff they were driven out again with loss as our thirty seventh regiment advanced they were met by a well-aimed fire of mitraille which threw them into disorder 
poor colonel zia in vain tried to steady them exclaiming this will never do where's the bugler to call them back but at that moment no bugler was to be found in the gloom of early dawn the gallant old soldier by voice and gesture tried to reform his men but as he ran to the head of the column a charge of the deadly missile passed and he fell dead next day we had to ask for an armistice to bury our dead which was not granted until four p m it was agonizing to see the wounded men who were lying out under a broiling sun to behold them waving their caps or hands faintly towards our lines over which they could see the white flag waving and not to be able to help them many of them had lain there for thirty hours as i was riding round i came upon two of our men with sad faces what are you waiting here for said i to go out for the colonel sir was the reply what colonel why colonel zia to be sure sir said the good fellow evidently surprised at my thinking there could be any other colonel in the world ah they liked him well under a brusque manner he concealed a most kind heart and a soldier more devoted to his men and to his country never fell in battle the fusiliers were the first who had hospital huts when other regiments were in need of every comfort zia's regiment had all that exertion and foresight could procure I ride on and find two voltigeurs with a young English naval officer between them. They are taking him off to shoot him as a spy. He has not enough French to explain his position to his captors. He tells us he is an officer of the Viper, that he got into the Mamelon by mistake. The matter is explained to our allies, who let him go with the best grace in the world as to the attack which failed we are disappointed yet we do not despair but we learn now that we are going to attack the redan and malakoff by sap and mine a tedious process of many weeks september five the russians have evacuated the forts of sebastopol and withdrawn to the north side of the harbor the crimean war is over from sir w howard russell's letters from the crimea by kind permission of messrs george rutledge and sons limited end of chapter nine chapter ten of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the indian mutiny delhi 1857-1858. The mutiny begins, a warning from a sepoy, a near thing, a noble act of a native officer, in camp at Delhi with no kit, a plan that failed, our first check, Wilson in command, Seaton wounded, arrival of Nicholson, captures guns, the assault, the fate of the princes, Pandy in a box a rumour had been going through the bazaars of india that the british rule was to be limited to one hundred years from the date of the battle of Plassey, seventeen fifty seven the sepoy troops had grown self-confident and arrogant through the victories they had won under english officers and fancied that they held the destiny of india in their own hands then came the story that the cartridges of the new infield rifles which were then just being introduced among the native troops were greased with the fat of beef or pork and were thus rendered unclean for mohammedan and hindu alike the sepoys or native troops believed that the new cartridges were being given out solely for the purpose of destroying their caste and so of introducing christianity by force delhi where the deposed king badhur shah was living was the centre and focus of rebellion it was to delhi that the first mutineers marched after killing their english officers sir thomas seaton has left us some picturesque stories of his part of the mutiny he had rejoined his native regiment at rotuck forty-five miles from delhi after some years leave in england and found the manners of the sepoy greatly changed for the worse he writes on the fourth of june i was in the mess tent writing to the adjutant-general about the hopeless state of the regiment when the native adjutant came in and said colonel i wish particularly to speak to you it was close upon five p m and as several officers were in the tent i went outside with the adjutant well shibir what is it 
why colonel i have just heard from two of our drummers who have their information from friends amongst the men that the regiment is to mutiny to-night murder the officers and be off to delhi though i expected this it was startling enough to hear it was so close at hand and now that the great difficulty stared me in the face how with this small body of officers was i to meet and grapple with reckless and determined mutineers but as this was not the time to flinch or show indecision i said well shabir let me see the men i'll make a few inquiries first i will go to the hospital do you lounge out that way too as i had been used to visit the hospital about this hour my going there would excite no suspicion in a few minutes i had found out that it was too true that an outbreak was planned for that night meanwhile i addressed the adjutant now shabir will you stand by me yes colonel replied the gallant fellow that i will very well now i'll tell you what i propose to do i will go on parade and as there is nothing like facing a difficulty i'll tax them with their intended outbreak and we will see what they will do tell the officers to look out seaton's idea was that the men finding he knew all about their plans would be so disconcerted that they would put off the mutiny we should probably gain a day or two of delay and might hear that delhi was taken or the mutineers defeated so at sunset he went on parade assembled the native officers in front at some distance from their companies and taxed them with their intended treachery as he had expected the sepoys were utterly confounded they flatly denied the intended treachery and swore by all their gods that they would be faithful to their salt and that no harm should happen to the officers the native officers then begged permission to appoint a guard to keep watch in the camp at night as there might be some bad mashes in the regiment it was a dangerous experiment but the only chance was to take things coolly still seeming to trust the men keeping at the same time a sharp lookout it was seaton's duty to keep the regiment together as long as possible at any risk the commander-in-chief was marching on delhi with a small force hurriedly put together to have placed at this critical moment a regiment of mutineers in his rear would simply have been destruction for they could have fortified some spot on the road and so cut off supplies from our camp whilst he was taxing the native officers the men of their companies were looking on they were too far off to hear but they took their cue from their officers and were quiet and respectful seaton left the circle of native officers and went up and addressed each company meeting with the same vows of fidelity as he came from parade after this trying scene some officers inquired anxiously what is it colonel is it all right oh yes i think our throats will not be cut to-night but his mind was not at ease until he had seen the guard for the night however a few days passed quietly enough but on the eighth a curious thing happened as seaton was going in the evening to visit the hospital and was crossing a ditch a young sepoy gave him a hand and whispered in his ear colonel sahib when your highness's people shall have regained the empire i will make my petition to your highness this was all he said but seaton could not help pondering on his meaning was this a warning to him of the coming outbreak of the regiment resistance was out of the question as he had only twelve english officers with him and one english sergeant he was tormented by the ever-recurring thought that not only the lives of his officers but perhaps the safety of our little army might be dependent on himself all i could do he says was to trust in god's mercy and goodness the night of the ninth passed off quietly all was still in the morning he could detect nothing suspicious in camp the men were civil and respectful to him personally some were parading for guard some going to bathe others preparing their food five of the young officers asked leave to go out shooting seaton had no objection and they went at four p m when he was in the usual camp hot weather de chabille all at once he was startled by a loud explosion he ran out to see what was the matter but neither saw nor heard anything strange no crowd not a sound the men mostly sleeping after their day's meal 
He was going on when the Havildar Major, native sergeant major, came rushing up to him. Catching him in his arms, he said in a very agitated voice, "'Colonel Sahib, don't go to the front.' "'Why not? The grenadiers are arming themselves. They have mutinied.' The hour for which he had trembled had come at last. He tried to collect one or two of the native officers, but in vain. The Havildar Major entreated him to be off whilst there was time. While the grooms were saddling the horses, they heard musket shots, and the Havildar rushed past him. Immediately the whole body of the grenadiers burst out of their tents, firing and shouting, in order to rouse the regiment and hurry it into mutiny. The shouts and cries of terror the galloping of horses, the report of muskets, all tended to confusion. Seaton had not time to take his sword, for the mutineers were within ten paces of him. He had got a few seconds' start, and in a melee like this a second makes all the difference between life and eternity. Just outside camp they overtook Major Drought, who was walking. The Havildar instantly cried, "'Colonel, the poor old fellow will be murdered. I'll put him on my horse and run for it.' It was a noble and heroic act, for Shabir had been wounded by the mutineers. So they made Shabir get on the lee side of the colonel's horse. He laid hold of the stirrup, and off they went at a round canter. After running four hundred yards, he got blown, and they pulled up to a walk. Soon they found the officers waiting for them at a bend in the road. They were all unhurt. After a time they saw clouds of smoke ascending, and knew that they were burning the tents. They kept on all night at a moderate pace. About 3 a.m. they heard a horseman coming along. Who could it be? They drew up and challenged. Who is there? Sowar. Trooper. What Sowar? Hodson Saib Ka Sowar, one of Captain Hodson's troopers. And then saluting, he continued, Are you the Saib log? I have a letter for Colonel Chitan Saib. Yes, come along. Here is the Colonel Seaton. Seaton read the note by the light of a cigar vehemently smoked by an officer. It was to the effect that we had driven the rebels from the ridge into Delhi, and that our camp was pitched in the cantonments. So now they were all right, and knew where to find their camp. At 9 a.m. the colonel dismounted at Sir H. Barnard's tent. They were all surprised to see him, as they had been informed that he and his officers were all killed. The young officers who had gone out shooting had been so informed, and had ridden to Delhi before them with the news. Now all the belongings the colonel had were his horse and the few clothes he stood in. He had to go round camp and beg. One gave him a coat, a shirt, and some cigars, another a sword and belt. He was made a member of the mess of the first E.B. Fusiliers, but had neither fork, spoon, plate, nor glass, for the mess merely provides food and dishes. However, he soon begged these, or bought all he needed at a sale of an officer's effects. My first night's rest was heavenly, he says. I heard distinctly the firing, but it did not disturb me. I was lulled by a feeling of security to which I had been a stranger for many nights before the sixtieth mutinied. No wonder my sleep was profound. Delhi is situated on the right bank of the river Jumna. The walls are pear-shaped on the river or eastern side, rendered irregular by the excrescence of the old fort of Selimgur. To the south the walls run to a point. Inland from Delhi is a ridge of rocks, which at its nearest point is about 1,400 yards from the walls. Our camp lay under the ridge, on the side away from the city. There were canals and swamps to protect us in rainy seasons. It was quite evident that a regular siege was out of the question from the vast size of the place and from our want of guns, etc. A coup de main was our only resource. Accordingly, a plan was drawn up by the engineers and Hodson, and approved by the general. It was a dangerous step, but one and all were crying out, "'Take Delhi!' Nor was this cry to be wondered at. Delhi, once the capital of the great Mughal Empire in India, strongly fortified and supplied with war material, was now in the possession of our own trained sepoys. The king, once our puppet, had placed himself at the head of the rebellion, and Delhi had become the focus of insurrection. 
moreover there was a vehement desire in camp for instant vengeance on the traitors in the city who had cruelly murdered their officers our brethren in arms with their wives and little ones one bold stroke now every one said would make us masters of delhi at the appointed hour the troops began to move down to their allotted posts all were waiting impatiently for the pickets from the ridge but the proper time slipped by and the assault was countermanded the storm of indignation in camp at the failure of this bold design was frightful but as colonel norman justly remarked it was one of those happy interpositions in our behalf of which we had some numbers to be thankful for for even if the rebels should have been driven out of delhi what if they rallied and returned in force our poor three thousand men would have been swallowed up in the immensity of the city the postponement of the assault gave the rebels full scope it bred anarchy confusion and disorder and the native trading population soon felt the difference between the violence and robbery of the sepoy domination and the peace and security they had enjoyed under us but in camp the abandonment of the assault was followed by a period of despondency and gloom in a few days cheering news came from the punjab the chief commissioner john lawrence aided by worthy officers had made all safe at the chief points of danger all through the punjab the hindu cavalry and sepoys were being disarmed the magazines had been secured the sikhs and punjabis men who had no sympathy with the mutineers were being enrolled and formed into corps and rearmed with bold and daring hand that out of this nettle danger plucks the flower safety lawrence was gathering as volunteers from the warlike frontier tribes all the restless turbulent spirits who might have been bitter foes in extremity he took them into pay and made them eager to march on delhi to assist in its capture and share in its plunder there were several sorties to repulse and these small successes kept up the men's spirits in the first six weeks of the siege or until the reinforcements began to flow in night or day no man undressed except for a few minutes for the necessary ablutions and changes of clothes and this was not always possible they lay down and slept in their clothes with arms and ammunition either on or by their sides ready to slip on the moment the alarm should be sounded the heat was fearful yet day after day they had to stand for hours in the sun and hot wind or worst of all to endure the torture of lying down on the burning rocks on the ridge baked by them on one side whilst the sun was doing the other many an officer and man struck by the sun and unable to rise was carried off to hospital delirious and raving the flies were in myriads and added to their torments they clung to hands and faces they covered the food until it was uneatable and they worried all incessantly until dusk many men had sunstroke twice some who were wounded suffered from it also and the great heat and fatigue began to tell on the soldiers and sent them into hospital from whence many were never to return fortunately food in camp was both abundant and good the troops got their meals and their dram of grog with great regularity it was quite amusing to see the cook boys of companies bring up the dinners to their respective squads battery or advanced picket it was the same to them cannonade or no cannonade it made no difference they were sure to come a large flat shallow basket held twenty or more metal plates on each a piece of beef and some nicely browned potatoes all smoking and frizzling from a few bits of live charcoal in a small earthen pan under each on the eighteenth the fifteenth and thirtieth native infantry with the famous jellalabad battery abbott's battery that was marched into delhi to the great joy of the mutineers and the king at noon on the nineteenth the rebels began to pour out of delhi in great numbers the alarm was sounded and in a few minutes every one was at his post but as no enemy appeared the troops were allowed to return to their tents
a gun fired in their rear startled the english then galloped up a trooper to say that the pandies as they called the rebels were killing the grass cutters and carrying off the cattle then troops were sent out and fighting went on long after dusk the casualty list was heavy a limber of scott's battery was blown up while one of the turner's guns was disabled and left on the field i well remember the gloomy impression which the result of this fight made on our minds it was our first check next morning a strong party was sent out to the scene of action to their great surprise there was turner's gun there was also a gun and two ammunition wagons abandoned by the rebels there were so many evidences on the field that the enemy had suffered severely that all gloom and despondency were quite relieved this was the most trying period of the whole siege if an officer sat down to write a letter or to shave himself the alarm was sure to sound and he was compelled to throw down his pen or razor buckle on his sword and rush out to his post the twenty third of june was the centenary of the battle of plessy and their spies told the english officers they were to be attacked at all points they began to fight at sunrise and strange to say in the very height of the melee our first reinforcements marched into camp three times the rebels assaulted our position each time being repulsed with great loss we drove them back and then we began a series of attacks on houses gardens and enclosures filled with mutineers whom we cleared out our heavy guns hastened or retarded their flight into the city i look upon this day as the turning point in the siege our first reinforcements had come in and had gained an important victory over the rebels soon was seen a great smoke beyond delhi they were burning their dead of the many interpositions of a merciful providence in our behalf during this wonderful siege says seaton i think the most striking was this that the rains were so abundant and the season so favorable that cholera was in a comparatively mild form the rains filled the jumna on one side and the canal on the other thus forming as it were a wall to the right and left of our road to the punjab guarding it more effectually than many thousand men could have done during the night of the fourth it rained in torrents colonel seaton was driven into the flagstaff tower for shelter but could only get standing room so he went and visited the pickets and sentries and returned soaked through and through he then lighted a cigar and stood about till daylight when the picket turned out and he turned in and slept till sunrise at sunrise he was relieved after thirty-six hours on duty on getting into camp he found his own tent pitched his servants all waiting clean clothes washing tackle a clean breakfast table and hodson with a smiling face waiting for him we felt like men who had just inherited large fortunes my things had been sent on from alipore oh it was a comfort to get my own clothes and uniform to be able to appear in camp once more dressed like a gentleman and to have the attendance of my own servant on the night of the fifth of july general sir h barnard died of cholera brought on by fatigue and anxiety of mind general wilson began on a new system they no longer attacked the villages losing men and gaining little they were now to remain on the defensive and to burn or bury all corpses for it was sickening to see the dogs and jackals disturbed by the burying parties slowly waddling off fat and gorged with their horrible feast until buried the rebels were still enemies their effluvia carried death into our ranks as a sergeant once said them pandies sir is wuss when they are killed on the nineteenth they received the first intelligence of the Kaunpur tragedy of wheeler's capitulation and destruction causing great depression in camp and more cholera they had been clearing the gardens of rebels beyond the metcalf grounds when seaton saw two of coke's men coming along carrying captain law who had just been killed he stopped to help them and was stooping to take the men's muskets when he was struck full on the left breast by a musket ball fired at thirty-five paces distance the blow was so violent that he was nearly knocked off his horse and for some seconds could not breathe the blood rushing from his mouth in foam 
He naturally thought he was done for, but as soon as his breath came again, he opened his clothes and found out the course of the ball. Seeing that no air issued from the wound, he secured his sword and pistol, and dismounting from his horse, led him over a broken wall, and was on the point of falling headlong in a faint when the two men he had tried to help took him under the arms and got him to the Metcalf picket. The men there ran to meet him. One gave him a drop of rum and water, others brought a sharpoy, native bedstead, and carried him off to the doctor. On the way he met Hodson, who galloped off at once to camp, so when they reached his tent he found the doctor waiting and everything ready. The ball had struck on a rib, fractured it, driven it down on the lung, and then had passed out at his back. Hodson cared for him with the affection of a brother. He was to lie quite still and not speak for a week. On the 1st of August the doctor took off his embargo. Seaton was recovering rapidly. In Delhi, our spies said, the Pandies were all jealous of one another and would not act in concert. The rebel sepoy carried in a purse round his waist the gold he had made by selling his shares of our plundered treasures. This gold made him unwilling to risk his life in battle and made him suspect his comrades. Their wounded were in a horrible state. There were no surgeons to perform any operations, no attendants to bring food or water. The limbs of some were rotting off with gangrene, others had wounds filled with maggots from neglect. All were bitterly contrasting their lot with the life of comfort they had enjoyed under British government. The old king, too, was in despair, and vented it in some poor poetry. On the 7th of August there was a tremendous explosion in the city, and next day they heard that a powder manufactory had blown up, killing 400 people. About this time, to quote the words of one who wrote a history of this siege, a stranger of very striking appearance was remarked visiting all our pickets, examining everything, making most searching inquiries about their strength and history. His attire gave no clue to his rank it evidently never gave the owner a thought he was a man cast in a giant mould with massive chest and powerful limbs and an expression ardent and commanding with a dash of roughness features of stern beauty a long black beard and deep sonorous voice there was something of immense strength talent and resolution in his whole gait and manner and a power of ruling men on high occasions that no one could escape noticing at once his imperial air which never left him and which would have been thought arrogant in one of less imposing mien sometimes gave offence to his own countrymen but made him almost worshipped by the pliant asiatics such a man would have risen rapidly from the ranks of the legions to the throne of the caesars but in the service of the british it was thought wonderful that he became a brigadier-general when by seniority he could only have been a captain the stranger thus described was nicholson the best man that sir john lawrence possessed in the punjab he had ridden ahead of his force to consult with general wilson before delhi on the following day he returned to his force on the fourteenth he again rode into the english camp at the head of his column a splendid addition of forty two hundred men to the besiegers the small force upon the ridge now amounted to eight thousand men of all arms the siege train was on its way and despair began to settle down on the rebels in the city and on the princes they had heard of the defeat of the nana and of havelock's entry into cawnpore they knew that fresh troops were coming from calcutta and that nicholson whose name had spread far and wide had arrived in our camp with a large force they knew too that this compact force of white men was swayed by one arm and governed by one will every soul in delhi knew that john lawrence directed the storm that was gathering around them and the cold dread shadow of the coming event was creeping over the shuddering city a look through our camp would have shaken the courage of the boldest rebel instead of tents half filled with sick men our camp now was teeming with soldiers of various races all cheerful and confident 
Hodson's men were mostly Sikhs, tall and slender, yet wiry and strong. Their clothes of ash color, with wristband, turban, and sash over the left shoulder, all of bright crimson. In contrast with these were Coke's men, more wild and picturesque, with large turbans of dark blue and enormous waistbands. Their lofty stature, long hair, bright black eyes, sandaled feet, and bold look would have made them remarkable anywhere. Our artillery park, too, was filled with guns captured from the mutineers. The battery train was on its way, but it was reported by spies that a very strong body of rebels was about to leave the city to attempt its capture. Nicholson was sent out with 700 cavalry and 1,200 infantry and three troops of horse artillery to head them off. He returned in triumph, bringing with him thirteen captured guns. In Nicholson's fight the following incident occurred, which shows a little bit of the native character. A rebel native officer was overtaken in his flight from the field by a man of Green's Punjab regiment. The officer immediately went down on his knees in the midst of a pool of water, and putting up his hands roared out, I've been forty years in the company's service and thirteen years a subadar. Spare, oh, spare my life. With an execration and a very rude term of abuse, the Punjabi thrust his bayonet into the traitor. On the 4th of September, the long-expected battery train arrived in camp with an ample supply of shot, shell, and powder for all the guns. The activity in the engineers' camp was now pushed to the utmost, and all the material for trenches and batteries was accumulated with great rapidity. To prevent the men plundering, the general promised that all the captured property would be prize, and prize agents were appointed. We were about to throw a small force of about 4,500 men into a city seven miles in circumference, a perfect maze of narrow streets and gullies, abounding in strong blocks of houses where one might expect that the defense would be obstinate. On the night of the 7th, 1,300 men in working and covering parties were sent down with the engineers to open trenches and erect the first siege battery against Delhi. On the 12th, the whole of the batteries were completed and in full play on the parts of the walls intended to be breached or shelled. The parapet was soon knocked off, each block of masonry rarely requiring more than two well-planted shots to demolish it completely. There was outside the wall a ditch 25 feet wide and 16 feet deep, before crossing which it was necessary that all the parapets and bastions should be cleared of their defenders. The army inside Delhi numbered at least 40,000 men, the besiegers only 11,000 after all their reinforcements had come in. Of these only 3,300 were Europeans our heavy guns were fifty-four in number while those in the city amounted to three hundred there was considerable risk in attempting to storm under such conditions one of the batteries was only a hundred and sixty yards from the water bastion and the heavy guns had to be dragged up to it through the open under a heavy fire of musketry baird smith the chief engineer prepared all the plans alexander taylor superintended their execution with the very first shot the masonry of the fortifications began to fly fifty-four guns and mortars belched out havoc on the city cheers rang out from our men as the smoke cleared away and they saw the dreaded bastions crumbling into ruins while the defenders were forced to seek shelter far away in the city for the next forty-eight hours there was no cessation of the roar of artillery the worn-out gunners would throw themselves down to snatch a short sleep beneath their very guns while volunteers filled their place then springing up again they would go on with their task with fresh ardor the sepoys were fighting on with the courage of despair they ran out light guns to enfilade our batteries, they manned the gardens in front of the city with sharpshooters to pick off our gunners. On the evening of the 13th, the breaches in the walls were to be examined, and so at dusk, Lieutenants Grated, Holm, Medley, and Lang of the engineers were sent to execute their dangerous mission. 
as the hour struck ten the batteries ceased firing and the four young officers slipping out of the gardens with a small covering party of the sixtieth rifles crept forward to the edge of the glacis grated and home going to the water medley and lang to the cashmere bastion a ladder was quietly lowered medley and lang descended and found themselves on the edge of the ditch but the enemy heard them and several ran towards them the englishmen saw that the breach was practicable so rose and ran back being followed by a harmless volley grated and home returned safely also and reported that all was favourable then was the thrilling order made known the assault at three a m number one column under nicholson were to assault the cashmere bastion number two under colonel james the water bastion number three under colonel campbell to enter by the cashmere gate number four under major reed to attack kissengunge to nicholson fell the post of honour sir john lawrence had sent him down to take delhi and the whole army was willing that he should have the honour he was to head the first column in person our batteries redoubled their roar whilst the columns were taking up their positions throwing shells to drive the enemy away from the breaches the morning was just breaking the thunder of our artillery was at its loudest when all at once it stopped every one could hear his heart beat the rifles now ran forward as skirmishers to cover the advance of the assaulting columns and the men who had been lying on the ground now sprang up and with a cheer made for the walls they crossed the glacis and left it behind them dotted with wounded men they went down into the ditch many to stay there but the ladders were planted against the scarp and very soon the dangers of the escalade were over soon the whole line of ramparts which faced the ridge was ours the british flag was once more run up upon the kabul gate meanwhile at the cashmere gate there had been some delay lieutenants home and salkeld with some sergeants and native sappers had at sunrise crossed the beams of the bridge from which the rebels had removed the planking and in broad daylight without a particle of cover had laid their powder bags the enemy were so daunted by this daring act that when they saw home coming they hastily shut the wicket and he and his men laid the bags and jumped down into the ditch unhurt Stalkeld was not so fortunate the rebels fired on him from the top of the gateway and he fell sergeant burgess caught up the port fire but was shot dead carmichael fired the fuse and fell mortally wounded sergeant smith finding the fuse was alight threw himself into the ditch and instantly the gate was burst open with a tremendous crash the bugler sounded the advance and with a cheer our men rushed through the gateway and met the other columns who had carried their respective breaches the lahore gate alone defied our attempts and nicholson called for volunteers to follow him through the narrow street towards the lahore gate as he strode forward sword in hand though there was death in every window and in every housetop his great stature marked him out as a target for the enemy and he fell mortally wounded the one man england wanted most the long autumn day was over and we were in delhi but had not taken it sixty-six officers and eleven hundred men had fallen while not a sixth part of the city was ours many of our men were lying drunk in the shops had the sepoys possessed a general they might have recovered the ridge and taken our whole camp defended as it was mainly by the sick and wounded on the next day by order of general wilson vast quantities of beer wine and brandy were destroyed on the sixteenth active operations were resumed by sapping gradually from house to house we managed to avoid street fighting and slowly pressed the rebels back into the ever-narrowing part of the city from which like rats they streamed whilst seaton was in the cashmere gateway he saw some artillerymen who were on duty there rummaging about one of them was looking into a long arm chest when all at once he slammed down the lid sat upon it sharp and roared out hey bill run be quick here's a devil of a pandy in the box 
Bill lost no time in attending to his comrade's request, and others running up to see what it was, they pulled out of the box a fine, powerful sepoy who was taken at once to the ditch and disposed of without ceremony. On the 18th, between 9 and 10 a.m., there was an eclipse of the sun. There is little doubt that this had a great effect on the minds of the superstitious natives, for they now began to leave the city in streams. On the morning of the 20th, as the city in the direction of the palace seemed to be deserted, Colonel Jones came down with a column. A powder bag was applied to the palace gates, a few defenders were slain, and the British flag was hoisted. That night the mess dinner was laid in the celebrated Dewan Kas, the marble building that Moore described in La La Rook. The inner room is the king's throne room, and round the walls, inlaid with black marble, are the famous words, If there be an Elysium on earth, it is this. The habits of the late king and family rendered the Elysium a very dirty one, though the white marble was inlaid with colored stones in flowers and arabesques. The houses and huts in which the princes of the royal blood lived with their wives and children were a perfect rabbit warren, so closely packed were they. The exterior walls enclosing the palace are sixty feet high and built of red sandstone, loopholed and crenellated, and make a noble appearance but the squalor and filth in the whole place were inconceivable. As none of the princes could engage in any business, the pittance they had to live on barely supplied the necessities of life. Seaton saw some of the princes. He says there was no trace of nobility, either of birth or of mind, in their faces. They were stamped with everything vile, gross, ignoble, sensual noble blood is a fine thing but a noble heart is better and will shine through the most forbidding features but these wretches with the cold calm hand of death on them showed nothing of kingly descent or nobility of heart their countenances being as forbidding as the despicable passions in which they had indulged could make them it was laughable to see what rubbish was found in the palace in one room were found at least two hundred pair of those trousers which mohammedan ladies wear instead of petticoats some of these were so stiff with brocaded silk that they must have needed a hearty kick with each foot at every step the quantities of pots and pans which they had amassed would have furnished a whole street of dealers then there were telescopes and guns and other valuables much blame has been cast on hodson for his severity to the royal family he fetched out the king and three princes from the tomb where they had taken refuge the princes were in native carriage and as they drew near to delhi an immense crowd surged round them which was increasing every moment pressing on hodson's few men they could hardly proceed hodson perhaps fearing a rescue ordered the three prisoners to get out the poor wretches seeing that something was about to happen put up their hands and fell at his feet begging that their lives might be spared hodson merely said chup ruho be silent take off your upper garments they did so then get into the cart they obeyed hodson then took a carbine from one of his men and shot them all three then turning to his men he said these three men whom i have just shot are the three princes who contrived and commenced the slaughter of our innocent women and children and thus retributive vengeance has fallen on them the crowd overawed parted and the carriage passed on the bodies were exposed on the very spot where our unfortunate countrymen had been exposed it seems cruel and vindictive but we are judging in security hodson had an angry public to daunt and their sense of justice to satisfy one must do our soldiers the justice to say that though infuriated by the slaughter of their officers and countrymen with their wives and children inflamed by the news of the Kanpur massacre not an old man not a woman or child was wilfully hurt by them as seaton was waiting on the twentieth by the palace gate some soldiers were bringing along an old man whom they held by the arms he went up and said to them remember you are christian men and he is very old oh sir was the reply we doesn't forget that we don't mean him no harm we only wants a bit of baccy 
so he let them go on and in a few minutes saw them stuffing their pipes and the old fellow genially bringing a coal to light them i have seen hundreds of instances where the greatest humanity and kindness were shown both to young and old as well as to females by our noble-hearted fellows even in their wildest moments from major general sir thomas seaton's from cadet to colonel by kind permission of measures g rutledge and sons end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: The Defence of Lucknow, thirty-first of May to twenty-fifth of September, eighteen fifty-seven. Firing at close quarters. Adventures of fugitives. Death of Sir H. Lawrence. His character. Difficulty of sending letters. Mines and countermines. Fulton killed, signs of the relief coming, a great welcome, story of the escape from Cawnpore. For about ten days previous to the outbreak at Lucknow, daily reports were made that an emeute was intended, and Sir Henry Lawrence, the brother of Sir John Lawrence, had ordered all kinds of stores to be bought and stored. The ladies and children had been removed from the cantonments to the residency in the city, which was already occupied by a party of the 32nd foot and two guns. The 9 p.m. gun on the 30th of May was evidently the signal for the mutiny to begin, as a few minutes after it had been fired, whilst Sir Henry and his staff were at dinner at the residency, a sepoy came running in and reported a disturbance in the lines. Sir Henry took two guns and a company of the 32nd, and took post on the road leading to the town. Meanwhile, bands of insurgents began to plunder and burn our officers' bungalows. Many officers had wonderful escapes from death. Some were killed by the rebels. Muchi Bawan, the residence of the late king, had been selected as a fitting place of security and retreat. It was being strengthened and supplied with stores. On June 10, houses and buildings around began to be demolished. Tents were set apart for the European refugees who arrived daily from the districts. On June 12, the military police mutinied in a body and went off to Kanpur. They were pursued for eight miles, and about twenty were killed. On June 15, a hundred barrels of gunpowder were brought from the Muchi Bawan and buried in the residency enclosure. Twenty-three lakhs of rupees were also buried in front of the residency to save the use of sentries. Cash payments were now suspended, the men being paid by promissory notes. On June 20, large stacks of firewood covered with earth were placed to protect the front of the residency. They formed an embankment six feet high, and embrasures were cut through them for the guns, of which there were four nine-pounders on that side. A letter arrived from Kanpur, giving very bad news. The enemy had shelled them for the last eight days with fearful effect within their crowded trenches, and one-third of their number had been killed. More guns were brought in. They hear that eight or ten regiments of rebels are within twenty miles of Lucknow. On June 28, Mrs. Doran, wife of Lieutenant Doran, arrived at evening in a country cart, disguised as a native and accompanied by some clerks. The enemy are nine miles off. Though a force was sent out to meet them, we had to retire before overwhelming numbers, with the loss of the eight-inch howitzer and three nine-pounders. The rebels came boldly on, investing the English on all sides, and firing from all the houses round, which they rapidly loopholed. July 1. We managed to send message to blow up the Muchi Bawan fort, and come to the residency at 12 p.m., bringing the treasure and guns. We opened fire from our batteries in order to distract the attention of the enemy from them. At 12.15 they were at the lower water gate. 
here there was some delay as the gates had not yet been opened a very serious accident had nearly happened for the leading men finding the gate closed shouted out open the gates but the artillerymen at the guns above which covered the entrance mistook the words for open with grape and were on the point to fire when an officer ran up and put them right the whole force came in safely not a shot being fired the explosion which had been ordered had not yet taken place but soon a tremor of the earth a volume of fire a terrific report and a mass of black smoke shooting up into the air announced to luke now that two hundred and forty barrels of gunpowder and five hundred and ninety four thousand rounds of ball and gun ammunition had completed the destruction of muchi bowen which we had fortified with so much labor strange stories were told by some of the refugees from outlying districts here is one told by the wife of a surgeon i heard a number of shots fired in our station and looking out i saw my husband driving furiously from the mess house i ran to him and catching up my child got into the buggy at the mess house we found all the officers assembled with sixty sepoys who had remained faithful as we went our homes were seen to be on fire next morning our sepoy escort deserted us we were fired on by matchlock men and lost one officer we had no food an officer kindly lent us a horse we were very faint our party now was only nine gentlemen two children the sergeant and his wife on the twentieth captain scott took my little two-year-old lottie on to his horse soon after sunrise we were followed by villagers armed with clubs and spears one of them struck captain scott's horse on the leg he galloped off with lottie and my poor husband never saw his child again we rode on several miles keeping away from villages and then crossed the river our thirst was extreme soon i saw water in a ravine i climbed down the steep descent our only drinking vessel was m s cap which had once been a sepoy's our horse got water and i bathed my neck i had no stockings and my feet were torn and blistered my husband was very weak and i thought dying he wished me good-bye as he lay on the ground my brain seemed burnt up no tears came our horse cantered away so that escape was cut off we sat down on the ground waiting for death poor fellow he was very weak his thirst was frightful and i went to get him water some villagers came and took my rupees and watch i took off my wedding ring twisting it in my hair and replaced the guard i tore off the skirt of my dress to bring water in but it was no use for when i returned my beloved eyes were fixed and though i called and tried to restore him and poured water into his mouth it only rattled in his throat he never spoke to me again and he gradually sank down and died i was alone in an hour or so about thirty villagers came they dragged me out of the ravine and took off my jacket then they dragged me to a village mocking me all the way the whole village came to look at me i lay down outside the door of a hut they had dozens of cows and yet refused me milk when night came and the village was quiet some old woman brought me a leafful of rice the next morning a neighboring rajah sent a palanquin and a horseman to fetch me who told me that a little child and three sahibs had come to his master's house that little child was my lottie she was sorely blistered but thank god alive and well that is the sort of experience some ladies went through ladies that had never before known what thirst or privation or insult was like july two about eight a m sir henry returned to the residency and lay down on his bed soon after an eight-inch shell from the enemy's howitzer entered the room at the window and exploded a fragment struck the brigadier-general on the upper part of the right thigh near the hip inflicting a fearful wound captain wilson who was standing alongside the bed with one knee on it reading a memorandum to sir henry was knocked down by falling bricks 
Mr. Lawrence, Sir Henry's nephew, had an equally narrow escape, but was not hurt. The fourth person in the room, a native servant, lost one of his feet by a fragment of the shell. The ceiling and the punkah all came down, and the dust and smoke prevented any one seeing what had happened. Neither Sir Henry nor his nephew uttered a sound, and Captain Wilson, as soon as he recovered from the concussion, called out in alarm, "'Sir Henry, are you hurt?' twice he thus called out and got no reply after the third time sir henry said in a low tone i am killed his bed was being soaked with blood some soldiers of the thirty-second soon came in and placed sir henry in a chair when the surgeon came he saw that human aid was useless look now and england had lost what could never be replaced for all who ever came in contact with sir henry lawrence recognized in him a man of unstained honor a lover of justice pure unselfish and noble his successor brigadier inglis wrote of him few men have ever possessed to the same extent the power which he enjoyed of winning the hearts of all those with whom he came in contact he gained also by his frankness the trust of the natives who said of him when sir henry looks twice up to heaven and once down to earth and then strokes his beard he knows what to do his dying wish was that if any epitaph were placed on his tomb it should be this here lies henry lawrence who tried to do his duty he had indeed tried to do his duty toward the defense of lucknow three weeks before any one else thought of a siege he began to collect supplies and even paid for them much over their market value he collected and buried much treasure in the grounds of the residency he stored up in underground cellars guns and mortars shot and shell and grain strengthened the outworks and cleared the ground of small buildings around even then the assailants and the besieged were quite close to each other and no man on either side dared expose himself to fire his musket they fired through loopholes in the walls this placed a never-ending strain on the besieged for they never knew when to expect an assault on the one side of a narrow lane were myriads of swarthy foemen on the other side a few hundreds who were bound always to be ready day and night to meet a storming party all through the siege officers and men alike stood sentry all bore an equal burden of toil and fighting the stench too from dead animals was dreadful they had so few servants and the fighting men were so harassed that they were helpless to bury them heavy showers night and day kept the garrison drenched to the skin and they had no change of clothes the sick and wounded were much crowded as they could not use the upper story of the hospital because it was under fire of round shot august twelve a letter to general havelock rolled up and put inside a quill was dispatched by the hands of an old woman she left the position about nine p m and it was hoped she would be permitted to pass the enemy's sentries during the past forty-five days they had sent by different hands in a similar manner some twenty letters to only one of these was any reply received august eighteen at daylight the enemy exploded a large mine under one of the principal posts the three officers and the three sentries on the top of the house were blown up into the air the guard below were all buried in the ruins the officers though much stunned recovered and escaped a clear breach had been made in our defences to the extent of thirty feet in breadth one of the enemy's leaders sprung on the top of the breach and called on his comrades to follow but when he and another had been shot the rest hung back boxes doors planks etc were rapidly carried down to make cover to protect the men august twenty three there was work nightly for at least three hundred men as they had the defences to repair daily mines to countermine guns to remove corpses to bury rations to serve out the europeans were not capable of much exertion as from want of sleep hard work and constant exposure their bodily strength was greatly diminished the ladies had to be removed as the upper story of mr gibbon's house was no longer safe owing to the number of round shot through it 
it was difficult to find quarters for them every place being so crowded and the ladies were already four and five together in small badly ventilated native dwellings dreadful smells pervaded the whole place from the half-buried bodies of men horses and bullocks and also from the drains september nine during the night a shell exploded in a room occupied by a lady and some children and though almost every article in the room was destroyed they all escaped unhurt finding that the enemy were rapidly mining towards the Kanpur battery they sprung a mine containing two hundred pounds of powder the effect was tremendous and it evidently astonished the enemy to see their miners going up skywards in fragments as the uniforms wore out they clothed themselves as they could one officer had a coat made out of an old billiard cloth another wore a shirt made out of a floor cloth they had no tobacco and had to smoke dried tea leaves september fourteen a grievous loss to-day captain fulton of the engineers while reconnoitring from a battery was killed by a round shot which struck him on the head he had conducted all the engineering operations of the siege for a long time he was a highly gifted brave and chivalrous officer and a great favorite september twenty two about eleven p m ungood pensioner returned to look now bringing a letter containing the glad tidings that the relieving force under general outram had crossed the ganges and would arrive in a few days his arrival and the cheering news he brought of speedy aid was well timed for daily desertions of servants were becoming the rule all the garrison were greatly elated at the news and on many of the sick and wounded the speedy prospect of a change of air and security exercised a most beneficial effect september twenty five about eleven a m increasing agitation was visible among the people in the town an hour later they heard guns and saw the smoke all the garrison was on the alert the excitement amongst many of the officers and men was quite painful to witness at one thirty p m many were leaving the city with bundles of clothes on their heads the rebels bridge of boats had evidently been destroyed for they could see many swimming across the river most of them cavalry with their horses bridles in their hands during all this apparent panic the guns of the enemy in position all round were keeping up a heavy cannonade and the riflemen never ceased firing from their loopholes at four p m report was made that some officers dressed in shooting coats and caps a regiment of europeans in blue pantaloons and shirts could be seen near mr martin's house at five p m volleys of musketry rapidly growing louder were heard in the city but soon the firing of a minie ball over their heads gave notice of the still nearer approach of their friends it was very exciting but they as yet could see little of them though they could hear the rebels firing on them from the roofs of the houses will they again be repulsed the heart sickens at the thought no five minutes later and our troops are seen fighting their way through one of the principal streets and though men are falling at almost every step yet on they come nothing can withstand the headlong gallantry of our reinforcements once fairly seen and all doubts and fears are ended and now the garrison's long pent-up feelings of anxiety and suspense burst forth in a succession of deafening cheers from every pit trench and battery from behind the sandbags piled up on shattered houses from every post still held by a few gallant spirits rose cheer on cheer ay even from the hospital many of the wounded were crawling forth to join in that glad shout of welcome to those who had so bravely come to their assistance the ladies were in tears tears of joy some were on their knees already thanking god for a deliverance from unspeakable horrors it was a moment never to be forgotten soon all the rear-guard and heavy guns were inside our position and then ensued a scene which baffles description for eighty-seven days the lucknow garrison had lived in utter ignorance of all that had taken place outside wives who had mourned their husbands as dead were again restored to them 
others fondly looking forward to glad meetings with those near and dear to them now for the first time learnt that they were alone in the world on all sides eager inquiries were made for relations and friends oh what a hubbub of voices what exclamation of delight what sad silences the force under the command of sir james uttram and havelock had suffered heavily out of twenty six hundred who had left cawnpore nearly one-third had been either killed or wounded in forcing their way through the city indeed their losses were so heavy that they could effect little towards the relief for the rebels were in overpowering force so that the garrison remained on three-quarter rations as closely besieged as before looking for a day when they might be more effectually relieved by a larger and stronger force then after the personal inquiries had died down with bated breath they asked for news of cawnpore what a tale of horror of pride of shame on the fifth of june so they were told the cawnpore regiments mutinied and set off for delhi on the sixth they were brought back by nana sahib a man who had once been well received in london drawing-rooms now the arch traitor and murderer not less than a thousand persons took refuge in the residency which nana proceeded to invest it was a poor weak place to defend yet they kept the flag flying till the twenty fourth of june when their ammunition and provisions were all gone time after time the gallant little garrison repulsed all the nana's attacks at length he approached them with treacherous smiles and offered to transmit them safely to allahabad on condition of surrender general sir hugh wheeler undertook to deliver up the fortifications the treasure and the artillery on condition that our force should march out under arms with sixty rounds of ammunition to every man that carriages should be provided for the conveyance of the wounded the women and the children that boats provided with flour should be in readiness at the landing-place what happened was described by one who had been on the spot he said the whole of Kanpur was astir at an early hour to see the English depart. They poured down to the landing place in thousands. Meanwhile, a crowd of carriages and beasts of burden had been collected outside the entrenchments. The bullock carts were soon filled with women and children. A fine elephant had been sent for the general, but he put his wife and daughters in the state howdah and contented himself with a simple palanquin the wounded were placed in litters with such care as soldiers could employ many sepoys mingling with the crowd expressed admiration for the british defence some even wept over the sufferings of their late masters eleven dying europeans were left behind too ill to be moved they set off with the men of the thirty second regiment at their head then came a throng of naked bearers carrying the palanquins full of sick and wounded then came the bullock carts crowded with ladies and children and next musket on shoulder came all who could still walk and fight major vibart of the second cavalry came last colonel and mrs ewart started late she on foot walking beside her husband who was borne by four native porters as they dropped astern some natives belonging to the colonel's own battalion approached him they began to mock him and then cut him in pieces with their swords they did the same to his wife the road to the landing-place which is about a mile from the entrenchments runs down a ravine which in summer is dry and is enclosed on either side by high banks and crumbling fences as the van turned down this ravine a great mob of natives watched them go in strange silence rather disorderly with swaying howdahs and grunting beasts the unwieldy caravan wound along the sandy lane when they were all entangled in the little defile some sepoys quietly formed a double line across the mouth of the gorge shutting as it were the top of the trap meanwhile the head of the caravan had reached the landing-place being a little surprised at the want of a pier or planks to serve as gangway 
but the english officers went in knee-deep and hoisted the wounded and the women into the covered barges which had been hauled into the shallows and were in many cases grounded on the sandy bottom the boats were thirty feet from stem to stern and twelve feet in beam roofed with straw having a space at each end for the rowers and the steersmen they looked very old and dilapidated but beggars may not choose hindu boatmen were waiting sullenly and silently not deigning to return a smile to the little english children who already began to scent fun and enjoyment in a long river excursion all at once a bugle rang out from the top of the defile away splashed the native rowers jumping from their boats into the water the rebels put up their muskets and fired point-blank into the laden boats but the english had their rifles and returned the fire yet another surprise suddenly the straw roofs of the native boats burst into flame and from either shore of the river grape and musket shot were poured in relentlessly the wounded lay still and were burnt to death ladies and children sought the protection of the water and crouched in the shallows under the sterns of the barges the men tried to push off but the keels stuck fast out of two dozen boats only three drifted slowly down from the stage of these three two went across to the Uda bank where stood two cannon guarded by a battalion of infantry and some cavalry the third boat containing vibart and whiting and ush delafosse and bolton burney and glanville and moore the bravest of the brave got clear away and drifted down the main channel mrs bradshaw thus describes what she saw in the boat where i was to have gone were the schoolmistress and twenty-two missies general wheeler came last in a palkey they carried him into the water near a boat i was standing close by he said carry me a little further near the boat but a trooper said no get out here as the general got out of the palkey head foremost the trooper gave him a cut with his sword into the neck and he fell into the water my son was killed near him i saw it alas alas some were stabbed with bayonets others were cut down with swords and knives little infants were torn in pieces we saw it we did and tell you only what we saw other children were stabbed and thrown into the river the schoolgirls were burnt to death i saw their clothes and hair catch fire in the water a few paces off by the next boat we saw the youngest daughter of colonel williams a sepoy was going to kill her with his bayonet when she said my father was always kind to sepoys he turned away and just then a villager struck her on the head with his club and she fell into the water after a time the women and children who had not been shot stabbed or burnt were collected and brought to shore some of them being rudely handled by the sowers who tore from ear or finger such jewels as caught their fancy about a hundred and twenty sat or lay on the shore or on the logs of timber full of misery fear and despair there they waited in the blinding sun on the ganges shore all that morning then they were herded back along the narrow lane by which they had come with hope in their bosoms while the sepoys who guarded them grinned with fiendish delight and showed gleefully all their spoils past the bazaar and the chapel and the racket court and the entrenchments they limped along until they were paraded before the pavilion of the maharaja who looked them well over and ordered them to be confined in the sabata house two good-sized rooms which had been used by native soldiers for a month were given them to live in and a guard was placed over them one witness says i saw that many of the ladies were wounded their clothes had blood on them some were wet covered with mud and blood and some had their dresses badly torn but all had clothes i saw one or two children without clothes there were no men in the party but only some boys of twelve or thirteen years of age some of the ladies were barefoot and lame two i saw were wounded in the leg and what of the third boat which floated downstream more than a hundred persons had taken refuge in it 
some officers and men seeing how hopeless was the fight on the bank had swum out to vibart and his crew now they stranded on a mud bank now they drifted towards the guns on the other shore ever under a hot fire of canister and shell and continually losing brave men who were shot at point-blank range down in the bottom of the great barge lay dying and dead till at last the survivors were compelled to throw the bodies overboard at night a fire-ship was sent down to set them alight and fire-tipped arrows were shot into the thatched roof forcing our people to cut them away then they came under a fierce fire from the militia of ram bucks pelting rains came down and they drifted up a backwater and soon after a host of rebels surrounded the poor stricken fugitives and took them back to Kampur. the doomed boatload were seen to be drawing near the landing place early on the morning of the thirtieth this is what a native spy said of them they were brought back sixty sahibs twenty-five mem sahibs and four children the nana ordered the sahibs to be separated from the mem sahibs and shot by the first bengal native infantry but they said we will not kill the sahibs put them in prison then said the nadiri regiment what word is this put them in prison we will kill the males ourselves so the sahibs were seated on the ground two companies stood with their muskets ready to fire then said one of the mem sahibs the doctor's wife i will not leave my husband if he must die i will die with him so she ran and sat down behind her husband clasping him round the waist when she said this the other mem sahibs said we also will die with our husbands and they all sat down each by her husband then their husband said go back but they would not do so so then the nana gave order and his soldiers went in and pulled them away by force but they could not pull away the doctor's wife who stayed there then the padre asked leave to read prayers before they died he did so and then shut the book then all the sahibs shook hands and said good-bye then the sepoys fired one sahib rolled one way one another but they were not quite dead so the sepoys went at them and finished them off with their swords can you imagine the breathless horror with which the garrison of lucknow listened to these details of a most cruel and treacherous onslaught upon wounded men upon refined ladies and innocent children how they sighed for a force strong enough to take an adequate revenge upon these miscreants but for the present they were besieged themselves though reinforced and who of them could count upon a day's security perhaps if the bullet spared them at lucknow their would-be rescuers might be unable to fight their way through the city and these poor ladies and children of the lucknow garrison might be reserved for a lot even worse than death will they come will they come to help us here at lucknow that is our anxious thought night and day End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: The Relief of Lucknow, 1857. The scene at Kanpur. Fights before Lucknow. Nearly blown up. A hideous nightmare. Cheering a runaway. All safe out of the residency. A quick march back. Who stole the biscuits? sir collins own regiment i had enlisted in the ninety-third sutherland highlanders to go to india to put down the mutiny writes mr forbes mitchell an old friend of the author we reached kampur on the twenty seventh of october having marched the last forty-six miles in two days we were over a thousand strong and many of us had just been through the crimean war after a few hours rest we were allowed to go on in parties of ten or twelve to visit the scene of the late treachery and massacre wheeler's entrenchments at the highest place did not exceed four feet and could not have been bullet-proof at the top 
the wonder was how the small force could have held out so long in the rooms were still lying about broken toys pictures books and bits of clothing then they went to see the slaughter-house in which our women and children had been barbarously murdered and the well into which their mangled bodies were flung on the date of this visit a great part of the house had not been cleaned out the floors of the rooms were still covered with congealed blood and littered with trampled torn dresses shoes locks of long hair many of which evidently had been severed by sword cuts but the most horrible sight they saw was an iron hook fixed into the wall this was covered with dried blood and from the marks on the whitewashed wall it was evident that a little child had been hung on to it by the neck with its face to the wall where the poor thing must have struggled for long because the wall all around the hook was covered with the hand prints and below the hook with the footprints of a little child in blood the number of victims killed at Kanpur, counted and buried in the well by Havelock's force, was 118 women and 92 children. This sight was enough, they said, to make the words mercy and pardon appear a mockery. The troops crossed into Oud on the 2nd of November, and on the 3rd a salute fired from the mud fort on the Kanpur side told them that, to their great delight, Sir Colin Campbell had come up from Calcutta. They were all burning to start for Lucknow. Every man in the regiment was determined to risk his life to save the women and children from the fate of Kanpur. On their march they saw they were at once in an enemy's country none of the villages were inhabited there was no chance of buying chupatis griddle cakes or goat's milk it was the custom to serve out three days biscuits at one time running four to the pound most men usually had finished their biscuits before they reached the first halting ground before they made their first halt they could hear the guns of the rebels bombarding the residency foot sore and tired as they were the report of each salvo made the men step out with a firmer step and a more determined resolve to relieve those helpless women and children on the tenth of november they were encamped on the plain about five miles in front of the alambah about five thousand of them the only really complete regiment being the ninety-third highlanders of whom some seven hundred wore the crimean medal they were in full highland costume feather bonnets and dark waving plumes a solid mass of brawny limbed men the old chief rode along the line saying a few words to each corps as he passed the regiment remarked that none of the other corps had given him a single cheer but had taken what he said in solemn silence at last he came to the ninety-third who were formed close column so that every man might hear when sir colin rode up he seemed to have a worn and haggard expression on his face but he was received with such a cheer or rather shout of welcome as made the echoes ring his wrinkled brow at once became smooth and his weary features broke into a smile as he acknowledged the cheer by a hearty salute he ended his speech thus ninety-third you are my own lads i rely on you to do the work a voice from the ranks called out aye aye sir colin ye ken us and we ken you we'll bring the women and children out of look now or die in the attempt and the whole regiment burst into another ringing cheer on the morning of the fourteenth of november they began the advance on the dilkusha park and palace the fourth brigade composed of the fifty third ninety third and fourth punjab regiments with a strong force of artillery reached the walls at sunrise here they halted till a breach was made in the walls the park swarmed with deer black buck and spotted there were no signs of the enemy and a staff officer of the artillery galloped to the front to reconnoitre this was none other than the present lord roberts known to the men then as plucky wee bobs about half of the regiment had passed through the breach when a masked battery of six guns opened fire on them from behind the palace the first shot passed through the column the second cut in two a trooper's horse close to roberts who dismounted and helped the trooper to his feet 
they all cheered the young lieutenant for his coolness under a point-blank fire of nine pounders they kept on pegging away until the sepoys bolted down the hill for shelter in the martiniere about two o'clock they drove the rebels out occupied the martiniere and erected a semaphore on the roof to communicate with the residency they next fought their way to a village on the east side of the secundabra here they saw a naked wretch with shaven head and body painted and smeared with ashes he was sitting on a leopard skin counting a rosary of beads james wilson said i'd like to try my bayonet on that fellow's hide but captain maine replied oh don't touch him these fellows are harmless hindu jogis mendicants the words had scarcely been uttered when the painted scoundrel stopped counting his beads slipped his hand under his leopard skin brought out a short brass blunderbust and fired it into captain maine's chest a few feet off the fellow was instantly bayoneted but poor maine died from the secundabra came a murderous fire and they had to wait for the guns to make a breach lie down ninety-third lie down shouted sir colin every man of you is worth his weight in gold to england to-day when the breach was large enough the fourth punjabis led the assault but seeing their officers shot down they wavered sir colin turned to colonel ewart and said bring on the tartan let my own lads at them before the buglers had time to sound the advance the whole seven companies like one man leaped the wall with a, such a yell of pent-up rage as never was heard before nor since the bayonet did the work effectually many of the highlanders were wounded in the leg because the native tulwars were as sharp as razors and when the rebels had fired their muskets they hurled them like javelins bayonets first and then drawing their tulwars slashed in blind fury shouting dean dean the faith and some threw themselves down and slashed at the legs of the highlanders in the centre of the inner court of the secundabra there was a large peepul tree indian fig with a very bushy top and round the foot of it were set some jars full of cool water captain dawson noticed that many of our men lay dead under this tree and he called out to wallace a good shot to look up and try if he could see any one in the top as the dead seemed to be shot from above wallace stepped back and scanned the tree i see him sir he shouted and cocking his rifle he fired down fell a body dressed in a tight-fitting red jacket and rose-colored silk trousers the breast of the jacket bursting open with the fall showed that the wearer was a woman she was armed with a pair of heavy old pattern cavalry pistols from her perch in the tree which had been carefully prepared before the attack she had killed more than half a dozen men poor wallace burst into tears saying if i had known it was a woman i would never have harmed her when the roll was called it was found that we had lost nine officers and ninety-nine men sir colin rode up and said fifty-third and ninety-third you have bravely done your share of this morning's work and count poor is avenged on visiting lucknow many years after this i saw no tablet or grave to mark the spot where so many of the ninety-third are buried it is the old old story which was said to have been first written on the walls of badajos when war is rife and danger nigh god and the soldier is all the cry when the war is over and wrongs are righted god is forgot and the soldier slighted after the secundabra we had to advance on the shah najif as the twenty-four pounders were being dragged along by our men and peel sailors a poor sailor lad just in front had his leg carried clean off above the knee by a round shot and although knocked head over heels by the force of the ball he sat bolt upright on the grass with the blood spouting from the stump of his leg like water from the hose of a fire engine and shouted here goes a shilling a day a shilling a day pitch into em boys remember Kanpur, ninety-third remember Kanpur. go at them my hearties and then he fell back in a dead faint he was dead before a doctor could reach him sir colin himself was wounded by a bullet after it had passed through the head of a ninety-third grenadier amongst the force defending the shah najif 
there was a large body of archers on the walls armed with bows and arrows which they discharged with great force and precision and on sergeant white raising his head above the wall an arrow was shot right into his feather bonnet inside the wire cage of his bonnet he had placed his forage cap folded up and instead of passing right through the arrow stuck in the folds of his cap white drawing out the arrow cried my conscience bows and arrows have we got robin hood and little john back again well well jack pandy since bows and arrows are the word here's at you and with that he raised his bonnet on the point of his bayonet above the top of the wall and at once another arrow pierced it through while a dozen more whizzed past a little wide of the mark just then penny of number two company looking over the wall got an arrow right through his brain the shaft projecting more than a foot at the back of his head then they all loaded and capped and pushing up their bonnets again a whole shower of arrows went past or through them up they sprang and returned a well-aimed volley from the rifle at point-blank range and more than half a dozen of the rebels went down but montgomery exposed himself a little too long to watch the effects of the volley and before he could get down into shelter an arrow was sent through his heart passing clean through his body and falling on the ground a few yards behind him he leaped about six feet straight up in the air and fell stone dead but as yet we had made little impression on the solid masonry walls and one of our ammunition wagons exploded killing several men and our storming party was repulsed just then sergeant patton came running up out of breath to say he had found a wide breach on the other side it seems our shot and shell had gone over the first wall and had blown out the wall on the other side patton had climbed up easily and seen right inside the place so captain dawson and his company were sent with patton and when the enemy saw them come in behind them they fled like sheep thus ended the terrible sixteenth of november eighteen fifty seven an adventure happened to me in the shah najif says forbus mitchell which i still sometimes dream of with horror this place was the tomb of the first king of oud and a place of mohammedan pilgrimage it had a number of small rooms round the enclosure for the pilgrims these the enemy had used for quarters and in their hurry to escape many had left their lamps burning as i had lost my greatcoat in the fight and felt very cold at night so that i could not sleep it struck me that some of the sepoys might have left blankets behind them with this hope i went into one of the rooms where a lamp was burning took it off its shelf and walked to the door of the great domed tomb which was only twenty yards or so away from the spot where the army were piled and the men lying round the still burning fire i peered into the dark vault but could see nothing so i advanced slowly holding above my head the clay saucer of oil containing a loose cotton wick i was looking cautiously round for fear of surprise from a concealed foe till i came near the centre of the great vault where my progress was obstructed by a big black heap about four feet high which felt to my feet as if i were walking in loose sand i lowered the lamp to see what it was and discovered that i was standing up to the ankles in loose gunpowder about forty hundred weight of it lay in a great heap in front of my nose while a glance to my left showed me a range of some thirty barrels also full of powder and on the right lots of eight-inch shells all loaded with the fuses fixed by this time my eyes had become accustomed to the darkness of the mosque and i took in my position at a glance here i was up to my knees almost in powder in the very bowels of a magazine with a naked light my hair literally stood on end i felt the skin of my head lifting my feather bonnet off my scalp my knees knocked together and despite the chilly night air the cold perspiration burst out all over me and ran down my face and legs i had neither cloth nor handkerchief in my pocket and there was not a moment to be lost as already the overhanging wick was threatening to shed its smouldering red tip into the live magazine at my feet quick as thought i put my left hand under the down-dropping flame and clasped it firmly 
Holding it so, I slowly turned to the door and walked out with my knees knocking one against the other. I never felt the least pain from the wick fear had so overcome me but when i opened my hand on gaining the open air i felt the smart acutely enough i poured the oil out of the saucer into the burnt hand then kneeling down i thanked god for having saved me and all our men around from terrible destruction i then got up and staggered rather than walked to the place where captain dawson was sleeping I shook him by the shoulder till he awoke, and told him of my discovery and fright. "'Bah! Corporal Mitchell,' was all his answer. "'You have woke up out of your sleep, and have got frightened at a shadow,' for he saw me all trembling. I turned my smarting hand to the light of the fire, and showed the captain how it was scorched, and then, feeling my pride hurt, I said, sir you're not a highlander or you would know the gaelic proverb the heart of one who can look death in the face will not start at a shadow and you sir can bear witness that i have not shirked to look death in the face more than once since morning he replied pardon me i did not mean that but calm yourself and explain i then told him that i had gone into the mosque with a naked lamp and had found it half full of loose powder are you sure you're not dreaming from the excitement of this awful day he asked with that i looked down to my feet and my gaiters which were still covered with blood from the slaughter in the secundabra the wet grass had softened it again and on this the powder was sticking nearly an inch thick i scraped some of it off throwing it into the fire and said there is positive proof for you that i'm not dreaming nor my vision a shadow on that the captain became almost alarmed as i was and a sentry was posted near the door of the mosque to prevent any one entering it the sleeping men were aroused and the fire smothered out by jars of water then captain dawson and i with an escort of four men went round the rooms as wilson one of the escort was peering into a room a concealed sepoy struck him over the head with his tulwar but his bonnet saved him and captain dawson put a pistol bullet through the sepoy to save further trouble after all was quiet the men rolled off to sleep again and i too lay down and tried to sleep my nerves were however too much shaken and the burnt hand kept me awake so i lay and listened to the men sleeping round me and what a night that was the horrible scenes through which the men had passed during the day had told with terrible effect upon their nerves and the struggles with death in the secundabra were fought over again by some of the men in their sleep oaths and shouts of defiance being often strangely intermingled with prayers one man would be lying calmly asleep and then suddenly break out into a fierce battle cry of con poor you bloody murderer another would shout charge give em the bayonet and a third keep together boys don't fire yet forward forward if we are to die let us die like men then i would hear one muttering oh mother forgive me and i'll never leave you again so it was through all that memorable night and i have no doubt it was the same at the other posts at last i dozed off and dreamed of blood and battle and anon of d and dawn side and the bramer gathering then the scene would change and i was a little boy again kneeling beside my mother saying my evening hymn verily campbell's soldier dream is no fiction next morning they found plenty of pumpkins and piles of flat cakes already cooked but no salt but mitchell had an old matchbox full of salt in his haversack an old veteran who used to tell stories of waterloo had said to him at home always carry a box of salt in your haversack when on active duty it will be useful so it was very often after breakfast they sponged out their rifles which had become so foul that the men's shoulders were black with bruises from the recoil they had to assault the mess house next and after they had driven the rebels into the river gumti they peppered every head that showed above water one tall fellow acted as cunningly as a jackal whether struck or not he fell just as he got into shallow water on the opposite side and lay without moving with his legs in the water and his head on the land he appeared to be stone dead 
and every rifle was turned on those that were running across the plain, while many that were wounded were fired on, as the fellow said, in mercy to put them out of pain. For this war of the mutiny was a demoralizing war for civilized men to be engaged in. The cold-blooded cruelty of the rebels branded them as traitors to humanity and cowardly assassins of helpless women and children. But to return to our pandy. He was ever after spoken of as the jackal, because jackals often behave as he did. After he had lain apparently dead for about an hour, some one noticed that he had gradually dragged himself out of the water. Then all at once he sprang to his feet and ran like a deer. He was still within easy range, and several rifles were leveled at him, but Sergeant Findlay, who was on the rampart, called out, "'Don't fire, men! Give the poor devil a chance!' So instead of a volley of bullets, the men's better feelings gained the day, and Jack Pandy was relieved with a cheer to speed him on his way. As soon as he heard it, he realized his position, and like the Samaritan leper of old, he halted, turned round, and putting up both his hands with the palms together in front of his face, he salaamed profoundly, prostrating himself three times on the ground by way of thanks, while the men on the ramparts waved their bonnets and clapped their hands to him in token of good will. Just at this time was heard a great sound of cheering near the residency, the cause of which they shortly learned. It was because General Sir Colin Campbell had met Havelock and Outram. So then they knew the residency was relieved, and the women and children were saved, though not yet out of danger. Every man in the force slept with a lighter heart that night. A girl in the residency, Jessie Brown, had stated that she heard the skirl of the bagpipes hours before the relieving force could be seen or heard by the rest of the garrison. And I believe it was quite true. I know we heard their bagpipes a long way off. Well, we had relieved Luke now, but at what a cost! No less than forty-five officers and four hundred and ninety-six men had been killed, more than a tenth of our whole number. The residency was relieved on the afternoon of the 17th of November, and the following day preparations were made for the evacuation of the position and the withdrawal of the women and children. To do this in safety, however, was no easy task, for the rebels showed but small regard for the laws of chivalry. There was a long stretch of plain, exposed to the fire of the enemy's artillery and sharpshooters, from the opposite side of the Gumti. To protect this part of the route, all the best shots were placed on the northwest corner of the ramparts next to the Gumti. They were under the command of Sergeant Findlay. One very good shot that excellent marksman made. A rebel officer rode out with a force of infantry from the east gate of the Badshah Hiba. They had a couple of guns, too, to open fire on the line of retreat. They might have played havoc with the retiring garrison, but Finley managed to unhorse the officer at long distance, and as soon as he was knocked over, the enemy retreated into the Ba and did not show themselves any more that day. By midnight of the 22nd of November, the residency was entirely evacuated, and the enemy completely deceived as to the movements. The women and children had passed the exposed part of their route without a single casualty. The roll was called on reaching the Martiniere, and two were found to be missing. They had been left asleep in the barracks, and came in later, saying that the rebels had not yet discovered that the English had gone, and were still firing into the residency. Shortly after the roll call, a most unfortunate accident took place. Corporal Cooper and four or five men went into one of the rooms of the Martiniere, in which there was a quantity of loose powder which had been left by the enemy, and somehow the powder got ignited and they were all blown up, their bodies completely charred and their eyes scorched out. The poor fellows all died in the greatest agony within an hour or so of the accident, and none of them could tell how it happened. This sad accident made me very mindful of and thankful for my own narrow escape and that of my comrades in the Shah Nujif. An amusing thing occurred on the march to Kanpur. As all the subaltern officers in my company were wounded, I was told off, with a guard of twenty men, to see all the baggage carts across Buni Bridge. A commissariat cart, loaded with biscuits, got upset, and its wheel broke just as we were moving it on to the road. 
The only person in charge of the cart was a young babu, a boy of eighteen years of age, who defended his charge as long as he could. But he was soon put on one side, the biscuit bags were ripped open, and the men commenced filling their haversacks. Just at this moment an escort of the Ninth Lancers, with some staff officers, rode up from the rear. It was the commander-in-chief and his staff. The boy Babu, seeing him, rushed up and called out aloud, "'O oh, my lord, you are my father and my mother. What shall I tell you? These wild highlanders will not hear me, but are stealing commissariat biscuits like fine fun.' Sir Colin pulled up and tried not to smile. "'Is there no officer here?' he asked. The Babu replied, "'No officer, sir, my lord, only one very big corporal, and he tell me grandly, "'Shut up, you, or I'll shoot you, same like rebel mutineer.' Hearing this, I stepped out of the crowd, and saluting Sir Colin, told him that this cart had broken down, and as there were no other means of carrying the biscuits, the men had filled their haversacks with them rather than leave them on the ground. Then the Babu again came to the front with clasped hands, saying, Oh, my lord, if one cart of biscuits short, Major Fitzgerald not listen to me, rather order thirty lashes with Provost Marshal's cat. Oh, what can a poor Babu do with such supreme and wild Highlanders? Sir Colin replied, Yes, Babu, I know these Highlanders are very wild fellows when they are hungry. Let them have the biscuits, and turning to one of the staff, he directed him to give a voucher to the Babu that a cart loaded with biscuits had broken down, and the contents had been divided amongst the rear guard by order of the commander-in-chief. Sir Colin then turned to us and said, Men, I give you the biscuits. Divide them with your comrades in front but you must promise me should a cart loaded with rum break down you will not interfere with it we all replied no no sir colin if rum breaks down we'll not touch it all right said sir colin remember i trust you and i know every one of you we honestly shared those biscuits and it was well we had them for about five miles further on a general halt was made for a short rest and for all stragglers to come up Sir Colin ordered the 93rd to form up, and calling the officers to the front, he announced to the regiment that General Wyndham had been attacked by the Nana Sahib and by the Gwalior contingent in Kanpur, that his force had been obliged to retire within the fort at the bridge of boats, and that we must reach Kanpur that night, because if the bridge of boats should be captured before we got there, we should be cut off in Oud with 50,000 of our enemies in our rear, a well-equipped army of 40,000 men in our front, together with a powerful train of artillery numbering over forty siege guns to face and with all the women and children sick and wounded to guard so ninety-third said the old chief i don't ask you to undertake this forced march in your present tired condition without good reason you must reach kampoor to-night at all costs as usual when he took the men into his confidence he was answered from the ranks all right sir colin will do it and we did by this time they could hear the guns of the gwalior contingent bombarding general wyndham's position in kampoor although terribly footsore and tired not having had their clothes off for eighteen days they trudged on their weary march every mile hearing the guns more clearly there is nothing to rouse tired soldiers like a good cannonade in front it is the best tonic out but they will never forget the misery of that march they reached the sands on the banks of the Ganges, on the Oud side of the river, opposite Kampur, just as the sun was setting, having covered the forty-seven miles under thirty hours. And when they got in sight of Kampur, the first thing they saw was the enemy on the other side of the river making bonfires of their spare kit and baggage, which had been left at Kampur when they advanced for the relief of Lucknow how on the twenty ninth of november they crossed the bridge of boats how by the third of december all the women and children and wounded were on their way to allahabad how they smashed up the famous gwalior contingent and sent the nana flying into the desert all this belongs to another story sir colin thanked his old regiment for their great toil and prowess but we old soldiers should like our deeds and the deeds of those who gave their lives for england to be remembered by our children's children and to be studied with a grateful sympathy 
from reminiscences of the great mutiny by william fords mitchell by kind permission of measures macmillan and company this is one of the most interesting books that has been written by a soldier who took part in the mutiny war end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen, Running the Blockade, eighteen sixty one. North versus South. A new president hates slavery. Fort Sumter is bombarded. Ladies on the housetop. Niggers don't mind shells. A blockade runner comes to Oxford the banshee strips for the race wilmington high pay lights out cast the lead a stern chase the run home lying perdu the night hawk saved by irish humor southern need at the end of the war negro dignity waxes big in november eighteen sixty abraham lincoln was elected president of the united states as the new president was in sympathy with those who wished to abolish slavery and as the southern states were mostly inhabited by large landholders possessing thousands of slaves this election was felt to doom their ascendancy unless they could resist the will of the north therefore on the seventeenth of december a convention of the state of south carolina was held at charleston which formally repealed their acceptance of the united states constitution neither side at first foresaw the results of succession each thought the other would offer little resistance the north were totally unprepared for war the south were weakened by internal dissensions but they fought as long as they had any soldiers left and at last robbed the cradle and the grave the south were in the end quite exhausted while the north seemed to gather new strength every month as the war went on the soldiers of the south or confederates wore out their clothes and could not replace them things were so scarce and dear that it became a proverb in going to market you take your money in your basket and bring your purchases home in your pocket planters in the south had to borrow money to support their hordes of negroes in idleness while they themselves were away at the front on the fourth of march lincoln formally entered on office succession he said meant rebellion the constitution must be preserved if necessary even by force major anderson who held a small fort in charleston harbor for the north spiked his guns and moved into fort sumter also in the harbor this was considered an act of war and fort sumter was bombarded and taken the little town was full of excited soldiers singing and shouting we have a peep of what was going on and what it felt like in mrs chestnut's diary for the twelfth of april i do not pretend to go to sleep how can i if anderson does not accept terms at four the orders are he shall be fired upon i count four st michael's bells chime out and i begin to hope at half past four the heavy booming of a cannon I sprang out of bed, and on my knees prostrate, I prayed as I never prayed before. There was a sound of stir all over the house, pattering of feet in the corridors. All seemed hurrying one way. I put on my double gown and went on the housetop. The shells were bursting. The roar of the cannon had begun. The women were wild there on the housetop. Prayers came from the women and imprecations from the men then a shell would light up the scene and we all wondered why fort sumter did not reply on the next day fort sumter was on fire the warships of the north were outside the bar and could not enter for want of depth of water on the fifteenth anderson had to give the fort up to the south the slaves were taking it all very quietly seemed not much moved by the thought of being free rather preferred to be slaves and be well fed a negro was rowing in the bay towards charleston during the bombardment with some supplies from a plantation he was met and asked are you not afraid of colonel anderson's cannon no sar mars anderson ain't hit me he knows master won't low it 
the next step taken by the president was to declare all the southern ports in a state of blockade in order that the seceding states might be starved out the coast line was some three thousand miles in length and the whole fleet of the united states did not reach a hundred and fifty ships of which many were unseaworthy but the energy of the north increased this fleet to nearly seven hundred vessels thus any attempt to run in through the blockading squadron was very dangerous a royal proclamation in england admonished all loyal subjects to respect the federal blockade but the high profits to be made tempted many liverpool firms to adventure their argosies a ship taken while running the blockade is treated as an enemy and if she resists she is treated as a pirate during the first year of the war many captures were made and stories came to england of hair-breadth escapes which set many young men longing to join in the exciting game i remember a man coming to oxford when i was an undergraduate with a letter of introduction from a friend he was running into charleston and had brought from that port a store of watches and jewellery which he persuaded us to take in exchange for a quantity of discarded clothing the lady's gold watch which i got is i hear still going strong and belies the suspicion with which i took it at this time there were no mills and almost no manufactories in the southern states so that they soon began to feel the want of clothes buttons boots socks medicines and chemicals nassau a little island in the bahamas was the chief base for the steamers that were running the blockade it was about five hundred and sixty miles from charleston and six hundred and forty from wilmington the bahama group afforded neutral water to within fifty miles of the american coast but it required a very fast vessel to succeed in evading the chain of cruisers which soon patrolled the coast these fast vessels were being built in england and elsewhere let us follow the fortunes of one of them the banshee she arrived safely across the atlantic and put into nassau there she was stripped for the work that lay before her everything aloft was taken down and nothing was left standing but the two lower masts with cross trees for a lookout man the ship was painted a dull white and the crew wore a gray uniform as the success of a blockade runner depends much on her speed the qualities of the engineer are important the banshee possessed a model chief engineer in mr erskine a man cool in danger and full of resource in her pilot tom burroughs she had a man who knew the waters thoroughly and was a genius in smelling out a blockader on the darkest night a good pilot received about eight hundred pounds for the trip there and back for there was some risk in the service and if they were captured they went to prison the pay of the seamen was from fifty pounds to sixty pounds for the trip so the banshee stole out of nassau harbor on a dark night laden with arms gunpowder boots and clothing on her way to wilmington wilmington lies to the north of charleston some sixteen miles up the cape fear river off the mouth of this river lies smith's island which divides the approach to the port into two widely different channels fort fisher placed at the northern point obliged the blockaders to lie far out beyond the range of the guns further out still was a cordon of cruisers and outside these were gunboats always on the move so that it required speed and a good lookout to elude the three lines of blockaders they crept as noiselessly as possible along the shores of the bahamas and ran on safely for the first two days out though as often as they saw a sail on the horizon they had to turn the banshee's stern to it till it vanished the lookout man had a dollar for every sail he sighted and was fined five dollars if it were seen first from the deck on the third day they found they had only just time to run under cover of fort fisher before dawn and they tried to do it now the real excitement began says mr taylor who was in charge of the cargo and nothing i have ever experienced can compare with it hunting pig sticking big game shooting polo all have their thrilling moments but none can approach running a blockade 
consider the dangers to be encountered after three days of constant anxiety and little sleep in threading our way through a swarm of blockaders and the accuracy required to hit in the nick of time the mouth of a river only half a mile wide without lights and with a coastline so low that as a rule the first intimation we had of its nearness was the dim white line of the surf they steamed along cautiously until nightfall though the night was dark it was dangerously clear no lights not even a cigar the hatchways of the engine room were covered with tarpaulins and the poor stokers had to breathe as best they could all hands were on deck crouching down behind the bulwarks on the bridge were taylor the captain mr steele and the pilot all straining their eyes into the vasty deep presently the pilot muttered better cast the lead captain steele murmured down the tube that led to the engine room and the vessel slowed down and then stopped a weird figure crept into the fore chains and dropped the leaded line while the crew listened to see if the engines would seize the opportunity to blow off steam and so advertise their presence for miles around in two minutes came the seaman saying sixteen fathoms sir sandy bottom with black specks we are not so far in as i thought said the pilot port two points and go a little faster he knew by the speckled bottom where they were they had to be north of that before it was safe to head for the shore in an hour or less the pilot asked for another sounding no more specks this time starboard and go ahead easy was the order now the paddle floats were flapping the water softly but to the crew the noise they made was terrifying they could be heard a long way suddenly the pilot said there's one of them mr taylor on the starboard bow presently straining eyes could see a long low black object lying quite still would she see the banshee they passed within a hundred yards of her and were not heard soon after burroughs whispered steamer on the port bow a second cruiser was made out close to them hard a port said the captain and the steamer swung round bringing the enemy upon her beam no sound the enemy slept then suddenly a third cruiser came out of the gloom and steamed slowly across the banshee's bows stop her said captain steele down the tube and the blockade runner gurgled to a standstill while the cruiser moved across and was lost in the darkness then slow ahead was the order until the low-lying coast and the gray surf came dim to the eye but it was getting near dawn and there was no trace of the river mouth they knew not quite where they were and thoughts of prison and prison fare would come uppermost at length the pilot said all right boys i can see the big hill yonder the only hill on the coast was near fort fisher now they knew where they were so did six or seven gunboats which in the silver light of early dawn catching sight of their prey steamed hard and fast toward the banshee with angry shots from the bow gun the balls were dropping all around and turning up the sea it was mighty unpleasant to men who knew they had several tons of gunpowder in the hold and just then they were obliged to steer out to avoid the north breaker shoal so that the gunboats crept ever nearer and nearer barking like disappointed puppies the pilot looked at the captain and the captain at the supercargo their lips tightened and their breath came faster as they eyed the gunboats askance one good shot into the paddle will end this trip thought mr taylor and it is my first run in too then came a welcome sound overhead a shell from the fort whirred its way towards the gunboats and warned them off with a parting broadside they sheered off out of range and after half an hour's run the banshee was over the bar and in quiet waters they soon sped up the sixteen miles to wilmington and found a large posse of willing slaves ready to discharge their cargo the poor folk in wilmington were then very much pinched for want of good food and drink and the advent of the banshee restored smiles all round 
living on cornbread bacon and water grows monotonous and invitations to lunch on board the banshee were never declined in fact many friends did not even wait for an invitation within a very few days the banshee was again ready for sea ballasted with tobacco and laden with cotton three tiers even on deck high profit tempted them to pile up their vessels like hay wagons and put to sea in a condition quite unfit to meet a boisterous wind it was fortunately more easy to run out than to run in as there was no harbor mouth to find in the dark and the open sea lay before them they learnt that the admiral's ship remained at anchor during the night while the other vessels moved slowly to and fro across the mouth of the river so they formed a bold plan thinking that security lay in a startling impudence they hid the banshee behind fort fisher till nightfall rowing ashore to get the latest news from colonel lamb who commanded the fort which sir is the admiral's flagship the minnesota a sixty-gun frigate don't go too near her that is just what we mean to do colonel but first we will take her bearings exactly we don't want to bump into her the colonel was very kind and helpful and they often enjoyed his society and that of his wife who lived in a cottage not far off as soon as night fell over the sea the banshee slipped quietly from her secret anchorage crossed the river bar and following the observations they had taken ran close by the flagship and so out to sea clear of the first cordon but in trying to pass the second they ran across a gunboat which at once opened fire the men lay down on the deck and the engines throbbed and thumped luckily the gunboat was very low and they soon lost one another but as they could hear her pounding along behind they attempted a ruse the helm was put hard over so that they steamed in a direction at right angles to their former course and in a few minutes their engines were stopped the banshee lay perfectly still the crew rose on their elbows and peeped over the bulwarks following the course of the gunboat by the flashes of her guns and by the rockets she was sending up madly to attract or warn her consorts so they saw her go plunging past them and firing madly into the dark abyss of the night after resting five minutes on the heaving wave the banshee started again as noiselessly as she could one danger remained the third cordon you may be sure they stared wide-eyed round the horizon as morning broke with the banshee so heavily laden it would be fatal to meet a cruiser in the daylight no smoke visible no sail all that day and for two days more they steamed on with fear beside them on the evening of the third day they steamed proudly into nassau though a heavy list to starboard made them present a rather drunken appearance the profits of blockade running may be estimated by the fact that though the banshee afterwards became a total loss by capture she earned enough on her eight successful trips to pay the shareholders seven hundred per cent on their investment the northerners turned her into a gunboat but she asserted her sympathies for the south by running foul of the jetty in the naval yard at washington on another run in the night hawk after getting safely through the blockading fleet they grounded on the bar and two launches speedily boarded them the northerners were very excited and evidently expected to meet with desperate resistance for firing of revolvers and wild cutlass blows surprised the crew of the night hawk who stood quietly on the poop waiting to be taken prisoners this roused my wrath said taylor and i expostulated with the lieutenant upon his firing on unarmed men they then cooled down and began a search for portable valuables but perhaps because they feared colonel lamb might come to the rescue they made haste about this and then set fire to the ship fore and aft they were quickened in their departure by the humour of an irish fireman who sang out lustily bagora bagora but we shall all be in the air in a minute with this ship full of gunpowder the men who were holding taylor dropped him like a hot potato and away they rode taking some of the crew as prisoners the gunpowder existed only in the fancy of the irishman the blockaders opened fire on the night hawk which was blazing merrily and colonel lamb shelled the blockading fleet 
then through the boiling surf the rest of the crew rowed safely wet through and exhausted with the rising tide she bumped herself over the sandbank still burning they telegraphed to wilmington for help and some three hundred negroes came down the river to assist in bailing and pumping so they managed to save the night hawk and make her fit to undertake other voyages though to look at she was no beauty for her sides were all corrugated with the heat and her stern twisted and not a bit of woodwork on her was left unconsumed by the fire yet she managed to stagger across the atlantic through some very bad weather such were some of the adventures of the blockade runners in the civil war of the united states to those who bought the ships it was a matter of pecuniary profit merely to the southerners in richmond wilmington and charleston and even on the plantations inland the arrival of these vessels staved off famine and cold and nakedness to the northerners they meant a prolongation of the unequal struggle and it was no wonder that they dealt rather harshly with those whom they caught a rich lady of south carolina wrote during this war i have had an excellent pair of shoes given me for more than a year i have had none but some dreadful things made by our carpenter and they do hurt my feet so uncle william says the men who went into the war to save their negroes are abjectly wretched neither side now cares a fig for these beloved negroes and would send them all to heaven in a handbasket to win the fight the negroes on the whole were very faithful to their old masters for many of them had been treated with all justice and kindness of course some of them gave themselves airs on becoming free and independent voters one old negro said to his master when y'all had de power you was good to me and i'll protect you now massa no niggers nor nobody shall tech you if you want anything call for sambo ahem i mean call for mr samuel that my name now from running the blockade by t e taylor by kind permission of mr john murray end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen the first ironclads eighteen sixty two will they sink or swim captain ericsson the swede the merrimac raised and armored the monitor built by private venture merrimac surprised fort monroe the cumberland attacked the silent monster comes on her ram makes an impression morris refuses to strike his flag the cumberland goes down the congress is next for attention on fire and forced to surrender blows up at midnight the minnesota aground shows she can bite general panic was it providence a light at sea only a cheese box on a raft sunday's fight between two monsters the merrimac finds she is deeply hurt wounded to death the four long hours warden and buchanan both do their best signals for help the fiery end of the whitehall gunboat the war of succession between the federals and confederate states gave rise to a new kind of warship the ironclad the merrimac was converted into such a vessel by the south and the monitor was built by the north or federals in the space of a hundred days most people experts and others predicted a watery grave for a ship cased in iron very few ventured on board at the launching of the monitor and even the builders provided a steam tug to save the passengers in case she went to the bottom but the monitor after the first graceful dip sat like a wild duck on a mere being flat bottomed having a turret nine feet high capable of revolving with two circular portholes to fire from captain ericsson a swede was her architect the south had seized all the forts and dockyards below chesapeake bay and had struck great consternation into the federal hearts when the federals burnt and evacuated the norfolk navy yard they scuttled the steam frigate merrimac but the confederates raised her plated her with railroad iron and fitted her with a slanting roof to serve as a shield 
the merrimac when finished did not take the water so gracefully as the monitor for her weight was so enormous that she nearly broke her back in launching it was known that both sides were at work upon some monster of the deep but which would be ready first no one could predict however on the eighth of march the merrimac left norfolk accompanied by two other war vessels the jamestown and yorktown and followed by a little fleet of armored tugs she was heading for newport news where there was a federal garrison guarded by the sailing frigates the cumberland and the congress which rode at anchor within half a mile of the shore battery their boats were hanging at the booms and the week's washing fluttered in the rigging as peaceful a scene as could be imagined but the lookout on fortress monroe caught sight of a monster vessel ploughing the waves and signalled to the warships to get under way the minnesota had her steam up and soon went off towards newport news where the cumberland and congress lay on blockading duty the crew of the cumberland seeing a strange ship come round craney island recognized her as the expected ironclad all hands were beat to quarters and the cumberland swept across the channel in order to bring her broadside to bear the slanting roof of the merrimac puzzled them and the long iron ram churned up the water as she advanced relentlessly and in silence at the distance of a mile the cumberland began to use her pivot guns but the merrimac made no reply only steamed majestically on though broadside after broadside was poured upon her like hail but the heavy shot glanced off harmlessly and ever the merrimac came closer and closer as she passed the congress the merrimac fired one broadside and then leaving her to the tender mercies of the jamestown and the yorktown made straight for the cumberland both the federal ships discharged their broadsides against the armored monster she just quivered under the blow and came on in silence the national battery at newport news opened upon her at point-blank range and every man on board the cumberland drew a breath of relief now they thought our massive guns will teach her a lesson but it seems as if the merrimac had received no damage not a soul could be seen on her decks not a splinter on her sides but she was coming towards them coming madly as it seemed to destruction what did the merrimac mean why did she not fire her guns the crew on the cumberland soon found out when the great ram struck their frigate amidships with a shock that threw every man down on the deck crushed in the ribs and heeled the ship over till her topsail yards almost splashed the water the merrimac reversed her engines and backed away under a murderous broadside replying as she too turned her broadside with a deadly volley of shot and shell which swept her enemy's decks of guns and men meanwhile the water was pouring into the terrible gaping wound in the side of the cumberland but lieutenant morris who was in command fought her to the last with unflinching courage yet once again the merrimac turned her prow and crushed in close upon the old wound and the great oak ribs snapped like twigs under the weight of iron the cumberland began to ride lower in the water but still aimed with calm accuracy at the merrimac riddling her smokestack and bending her anchor but the merrimac lay off a little and poured a storm of shot into the sinking frigate dealing death and mutilation yet morris refused to yield and the whole crew in their desperate plight thought of nothing but saving the honor of the flag one sailor with both his legs shot off hobbled up to his gun on bleeding stumps and pulled the lanyard then fell in a swoon by the gun she is sinking was the cry but they still fought on though the frigate was settling deeper every minute then the water came gurgling into the portholes and choked the guns and drowned the gunners the last gunner was knee-deep in water when he fired the last shot and then the cumberland careened over on her side down she sank amid a whirl of circling waters a cauldron of wave and air caught in one and vomiting steam all around and over the dying vessel and in a moment four hundred men were on the verge of death some being carried down into the revolving vortex some being cast up on the outside some swimming frantically towards the shore or reaching desperately for fragments of wreck about one hundred went down with the ship 
the chaplain went down with the wounded who were below deck it took forty-five minutes for the merrimac to finish off the cumberland and she now turned her ram towards the congress which spread all sail and endeavored to get clear away but at this moment the congress grounded and became helpless the gunboats of the confederates were still firing heavily at her from a respectful distance but as they saw the merrimac approaching they too drew near under her protection the merrimac chose her position at about a hundred yards range despising the guns of the congress and raked her fore and aft dismounting guns and covering her deck with mangled limbs in three places the congress burst into flames and the dry timber crackled and blazed and smoked like a volcano the men could not stand by the guns for the fervent heat the wounded were slowly burned alive the officers could not bear this sight and hauled down the flag a tug was sent by the confederates to take off the prisoners from the burning wreck but unfortunately some sharpshooters from the shore still kept up a hot fire upon the southern vessels in consequence of this the merrimac fired another broadside into the sinking congress and killed many more of her crew the congress being deserted still burned on till darkness fell and the ruddy glare lit up the moving waters as if they had been a sea of blood at midnight the fire reached her magazine and with a thunder of explosion the congress blew up into a myriad fragments the northern warship minnesota had also grounded so had the frigate st lawrence and the merrimac while it was still light enough to aim a gun steamed towards them to see what little attention she could bestow upon them the merrimac was perhaps a little overconfident in her coat of mail anyhow she risked receiving a broadside at very short range from the heavy guns of the minnesota a shot seemed to have entered her porthole and damaged her machinery for she hesitated put about and returned to safe anchorage behind craney island meanwhile a very natural terror was gnawing at the hearts of the federal crews and garrison in hampton roads they had listened to the sounds of the conflict and seen the dire results in wonder almost in despair the merrimac they said was invulnerable not a shot could pierce her on sunday morning she would return and destroy the whole federal fleet at her leisure she would shell newport news point and fortress monroe at the entrance of hampton roads set everything on fire and drive the garrisons from their guns nay as the telegraph wires flashed the news to washington it was foreseen with an agony of horror that the merrimac might ascend the potomac and lay the capital in ashes baltimore philadelphia new york boston were in a state of panic no one knew what might not follow it was a blind horror of a new and unknown danger for the experience of one hour had rendered the shipbuilding of the past a scorn and a laughing-stock wooden frigates might go to the scrap-heap now with the cumberland had gone down morally all the great navies of europe a new order had to be found for ship and battery and steel must take the place of planks of oak such a night of anxiety and alarm the northern states had never experienced it was ten o'clock at night when the lookout in the garrison thought he saw lights out at sea in chesapeake bay he called his mate by and by they made them out to be two small steamers heading for old point comfort an eye-witness from fort monroe thus describes what happened oh what a night that was i can never forget it there was no fear during the long hours danger i find does not bring that but there was a longing for some interposition of god and waiting upon him from whom we felt our help must come in earnest fervent prayer while not neglecting all the means of martial defence fugitives from newport news kept arriving ladies and children had walked the long ten miles from newport news feeling that their presence only embarrassed their brave husbands sailors from the congress and cumberland came one of them with his ship's flag bound about his waist as he had swum with it ashore dusky fugitives came mournfully fleeing from a fate worse than death slavery 
these entered my cabin hungry and weary the heavens were aflame with the burning congress but there were no soldiers among the flying host the sailors came only to seek another chance at the enemy since the cumberland had gone down in deep waters and the congress had gone upward as if a chariot of fire to convey the manly souls whose bodies had perished in that conflict upward to heaven the heavy night hung dark the hills and waters o'er but the night was not half so heavy as our hearts nor so dark as our prospects all at once a speck of light gleamed on the distant wave it moved it came nearer and nearer and at ten o'clock at night the monitor appeared when the tale of bricks is doubled moses comes i never more firmly believed in special providence than at that hour even skeptics for the moment were converted and said god has sent her but how insignificant she looked she was but a speck on the dark blue sea at night almost a laughable object by day the enemy call her a cheese box on a raft and the comparison is a good one could she meet the merrimac the morrow must determine for under god the monitor is our only hope now lieutenant warden the commander of the monitor on arriving at fort monroe was instructed to lie alongside the minnesota to guard her in case of a night attack at eleven o'clock she set out and her arrival was hailed with delight by the men on board the frigate though some shook their heads at the strange unshapely toy which a private individual had constructed to save the federal fleet but few slept that night the odds against the monitor seemed too great she mounted but two guns while the merrimac carried ten sunday morning broke sunny and beautiful and the sea was peaceful and calm near sewell's point opposite hampton roads three vessels were at anchor one of them the merrimac about nine o'clock glasses showed a stir amongst them and instantly the monitor awoke to life and action closing her iron hatches and putting on the dead light covers the monitor like a great griddle cake only stood two feet out of the water her smooth surface was broken only by the turret and the pilot house then they saw the merrimac coming looking like a submerged house with roof only out of the water after her came the jamestown and yorktown and a fleet of tugboats crowded with ladies and gentlemen from norfolk eager to see the fun the merrimac entirely unconscious of the new enemy she had to encounter steamed slowly along and fired upon the minnesota which was still aground the minnesota replied with a broadside and the usual result but the monitor steamed out from behind and boldly advanced to meet her antagonist and while at a distance of half a mile lieutenant warden from the pilot house gave the order to fire the ball weighing a hundred and seventy pounds rattled against the mailed side of the merrimac she staggered under the force of the concussion and at once seemed to realize that in this floating turret she had no mean antagonist at the range of only a few yards she poured in a terrible broadside to her disgust the shots seemed to have glided off and done no harm then the two vessels closed and poured a hail of heavy metal upon each other the monitor being the quicker would circle round the merrimac while the turret turning with ease always presented the guns to the foe warden in his pilot house could speak through the tubes to lieutenant green who commanded the gunners in the tower once green trained his guns on the merrimac's water line and the shot penetrated splendid sir splendid roared warden you have made the iron fly but the spectators who lined the ramparts of fort monroe could not see what was happening for the clouds of smoke and they stood silent and wretched almost afraid to look but at last the veil parted and they saw the little monitor lying alongside the merrimac trim and spiteful with the stars and stripes flying proudly from her stern and a great cheer arose from every throat then they saw the merrimac bear down upon the little flat cheese as if to sink her she struck fair and square but the iron ram glided up on her low sheathed deck and simply careened her over 
but in so doing the merrimac showed her unarmed hull below the iron coat of mail and the monitor planted one of her shots in a vital place four long hours had this strange duel lasted the merrimac firing heavily the monitor steaming round and choosing her place and time with careful aim at rudder screw and water line at last buchanan the commander of the merrimac was severely wounded and as his ship began to take in water through three gaping wounds the helm was put over and the conqueror of yesterday limped away but her last shot struck point blank upon the iron grating of the pilot house just where lieutenant warden was looking out the concussion threw him down senseless and minute pieces of iron and powder were driven into his eyes so that he was blinded when after a time he recovered his consciousness he asked have i saved the minnesota yes sir and whipped the merrimac was the reply then i care not what becomes of me murmured the lieutenant the merrimac slowly made her way to a safe anchorage under the batteries at sewell's point here she signalled for help and tugs came up took her in tow and escorted her to norfolk her injuries were so severe that after months of work upon her she never ventured to quit her retreat whereas the monitors seemed but slightly damaged she had been hit twenty-two times and only showed slight indentations but a ball striking full on the pilot house had bent a huge iron beam the ram of the merrimac had torn off some of the plating from the side of the monitor the latter drew only ten feet of water and could go where the merrimac could not venture but though the merrimac had fired her last shot she gave the north a great fright in the night which followed the battle at midnight thousands of people along the coast were roused from their sleep by cries that came over the water fire fire for god's sake save us the shore was soon lined by spectators who stood unable to get a boat to put out or help in any way there was the gunboat whitehall roaring with flames and the dark figures of the crew were plainly visible on her deck either wrapped in red fire or jumping into the deep water beneath the whitehall's shotted guns were going off here and there through the thick crowds or clustering houses and one shell struck the hospital making the inmates believe that the merrimac had returned it transpired that a red-hot shot had been thrown from the merrimac during the day and had lodged between the whitehall's timbers where the fire smouldered until late at night the general conclusion from this momentous fight between the two ironclads was that england's naval supremacy is gone forever but men are more potent than masses of metal america and england have navies now in comparison with which the merrimac and monitor are but tin kettles yet we must remember that russia too a few months ago possessed a strong navy as far as metal goes but once again the japanese proved to the world that it is in the hearts of brave men the science of clever men and the enduring patience of patriotic men that the issues of victory or defeat are mainly determined. End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen capture of new orleans eighteen sixty two new orleans and its forts farragut despises craven counsel the mortar fleet in disguise fire rafts rush down a week of hot gunfire a dash through the defences the varuna's last shot oscar aged thirteen ranged before the city anger of the mob summary justice soldiers insulted in the streets general butler in command porter nearly blown up in council fort jackson in ruins the fuse is out new orleans on the mississippi river was the great market of the south a rich and powerful city of two hundred thousand inhabitants 
everything possible had been done to defend it from the northern arms sixty miles below new orleans the river makes a sharp bend and here fronting each other on either side stood the forts of jackson and st philip these strong forts the confederates had seized and the federal fleet had to pass them on its way to new orleans they were heavily armored with a hundred and eighty pieces of ordnance but besides the forts the warships would have to cut through an iron cable stretched across the river and supported by seven hulks and rafts above these were eighteen gunboats and floating batteries with fire rafts and rams so that the city felt itself tolerably secure behind these obstructions and laughed to scorn any thought of being besieged besides had not english and french officers examined the forts and pronounced the attempt to pass them madness but commodore farragut who was in command of the national fleet answered them in these words you may be right gentlemen but i was sent here to make the attempt i came here to reduce or pass the forts and take new orleans and i shall try it on the federal mortar fleet was getting ready for action topmasts were lowered all spars and booms unshipped the main decks cleared and armor of chain cables was improvised to protect the gunners the ships were painted with mud to make them invisible on the seventeenth of april the order was given to advance upstream there was a thick forest on the western bank a low bank and marshy ground on the east in order to confuse the enemy the masts and riggings of the northerners were festooned with leafy branches others were sheathed with reeds to blend with the background of the river bank five sloops of war waited behind the mortar boats carrying a hundred and four guns a hundred and fifty boats supplied with grapnel ropes axes and buckets were ready to deal with the fire ships and they soon had the work to do for one dark night a blazing raft came down upon them lighting up water and bank trees and rushes but the westfield dashed into the burning pile and turned her hose upon it and the boats leapt forth to hack and grapple and plunge the burning timbers into the river then cheers broke out when the peril had been subdued at nine a m of the sixteenth of april fort jackson threw a shell into the northern flotilla a mile off and at once the mortar boats replied sending their big shells with great accuracy into the very ramparts new orleans seventy-two miles away distinctly heard the thunder of the bombardment kept up for more than a week the citadel was set on fire the walls cracked and shattered and the forts were flooded the men on deck would fall down and sleep in the midst of the great thunder so exhausted were they by toil night and day on the second day the carleton received a shell into her magazine which exploded and she sank at the end of a week after all this terrible storm of flying metal only one man had been killed and six wounded in the federal fleet but the forts had not been silenced on the twenty fourth of april at two a m two red lights were run up on the flagship and very soon the fleet was under way for the passage between the forts as each ship passed it delivered its broadside and swept on towards the gunboats beyond fire rafts kept floating down and the roar of five hundred cannon shook the air the ithaca was riddled by shot and fell behind the ram manassas came down on the flagship and admiral farragut got aground while trying to avoid her his ship took fire from a fire raft but it was extinguished captain boggs in the varuna sunk five gunboats one after another then his vessel's sides were stove in by a ram but with his last broadside before he sank he disabled her a boy named oscar was on board the varuna only thirteen years old and during the fight was very busy passing ammunition to the gunners all covered with dirt and powder begrimed he was met by captain boggs who asked where he was running in such a hurry to get a passing box sir my other was smashed by a ball when the varuna went down with her crew boggs missed the boy and feared he was among the drowned but presently he saw the lad gallantly swimming toward the oneida a neighbor ship oscar clambered on board dripping and grinned from ear to ear as if he had just enjoyed the finest fun in life seeing his captain he put his hand to his forehead in the usual salute and saying all right sir i reported myself on board shook off the water and was ready for the next duty to hand 
on the morning of the twenty fifth the federal ships ranged up near the city batteries and silenced their fire in a few minutes soon the whole fleet was moored opposite new orleans with the stars and stripes proudly flying from every masthead and the bands playing their national airs the citizens of new orleans had rested in full persuasion that they were absolutely safe behind their forts and gunboats and now that they saw the enemy actually threatening their city they were transported by a passion of panic mortification and rage when they first heard that the forts had been passed and that the yankee ships were coming up the river the mob of the city became so desperate in their fury that martial law had to be proclaimed at least they said these hated yankees should not get the wealth of the city and they put the torch to everything that would burn offices banks ships cotton piers warehouses coal and sugar all were fired and consumed in one vast conflagration the river was dotted with floating islands of flame as richly freighted merchantmen were fired and cut adrift the confederate general lovell and his troops were withdrawn as no reasonable promise of a successful defence remained two iron rams of immense power which had been in building were destroyed before admiral farragut arrived as soon as the fleet appeared before the city some of the citizens who favoured the union foolishly expressed their delight by cheers civil war is always conducted with greater bitterness than war with a foreign power these unfortunates were promptly shot down in the street or on the quay on the twenty sixth of april the city was formally surrendered and a body of troops was landed to raise the stars and stripes over the public buildings crowds of angry men followed the marines with hoot and yell and were only prevented from inflicting actual outrage by the fear of being shelled from the ships it is said that captain bailey and his men on landing at the crowded pier were jostled and jeered at by angry bands of rowdies we have to remember this when we pass judgment on general butler's order to treat all ladies who insulted the troops as disorderly women we may wonder how the german would have treated the french in paris had the parisians dared to conduct themselves so outrageously general butler writes thus to a friend we were twenty five hundred men in a city seven miles long by two to four wide of a hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants all hostile bitter defiant explosive standing literally on a magazine the devil had entered the hearts of the women to stir up strife in every way every opprobrious epithet every insulting gesture was made by these bejeweled becrinolined and laced creatures calling themselves ladies towards my soldiers and officers from the windows of houses and in the streets how long do you think our flesh and blood could have stood this it is clear that general butler was as angry as the ladies the albany journal adds this fact women who have been regarded as the pattern of refinement and good breeding not only assail our men with the tongue but with more material weapons buckets of slops are emptied upon them as they pass decayed oranges and rotten eggs are hurled at them the forbearance of our troops is wonderful commander porter had been left behind to receive the capitulation of the forts jackson and st philip when the federal fleet steamed up to new orleans he pitched a few shells into fort jackson but there was no response the fight had all been taken out of them on the twenty eighth a flag of truce from fort jackson came on board the harriet lane with offer to surrender when officers of both sides were assembled in the cabin of the harriet lane discussing the details of surrender an officer came below and informed commander porter that the southern battery louisiana had been set on fire and was drifting down upon them she was a steam floating battery of four thousand tons mounting sixteen heavy guns the battery had been fired so quietly that no one suspected any such thing until it blazed up for flags of truce were flying upon both forts and ships porter proceeded with the conference as if nothing were the matter soon another officer came down reporting that the battery on fire from stem to stern was drifting down upon them turning to the confederate officers porter asked has she powder and loaded guns on board gentlemen we presume so but we know nothing of naval matters here just at this moment the hot guns began to go off and throw shot and shell at random amongst friends and foes 
Commander Porter, with severe coolness of manner, only said, Then we will go on with our business, gentlemen. If you don't mind the effect of the explosion, which is soon to come, we can stand it. Fortunately, the Louisiana drifted across toward St. Philip and exploded her magazine when just abreast of it. The sound of the explosion was heard for miles up and down the river. When the smoke cleared away, the battery had gone into fragments and sunk in the Mississippi. If it had drifted upon the Harriet Lane, as had been intended, and blown into smithereens the consulting officers of both North and South, that would have been a consequence of treachery almost worse than the insults of the New Orleans ladies or the indiscreet edict of General Butler. Fort Jackson had crumbled into powder under the impact of the huge shells from the mortars. On the first night of the bombardment, the magazine was in such danger that only wet blankets saved it from blowing up. One bomb came leaping into the officers' mess room when they were dining. With a thud and a rumble, it rolled under the very table. All rose and clustered in a corner in some consternation, expecting to go skyward with the crockery. They waited one minute two minutes. Not yet had death come. Then a young officer crawled under the table and burst into a hearty laugh. What is it, Jimmy? Oh, you can go on with that Irish stew now. The fuse is out. They returned to their dinner with such appetite as they could. Fortunately, men who are living at high pressure and strain, meeting death at every turn, are easily moved to see the funny side of things. End of chapter 15「Chapter sixteen of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixteen The Siege of Richmond, eighteen sixty two and eighteen sixty five. Fair Oaks, a drawn battle. Robert Lee succeeds Johnston. Reforms in the army. Humors of the sentinels. Chaffing the niggers. Their idea of liberty. The pickets chum together. Stuart's raid a duel between a texan and a german effect of music on soldiers a terrible retreat to james river malvern hill battle scenes three years after general grant before richmond colored troops enter the southern capital in triumph lee surrenders friends once more the battle of fair oaks had been fought and general mcclellan began to entrench himself in view of the siege of richmond it had been a drawn battle the south had taken some guns but the federal forces were too strong for them and swamps rough ground and woods all helped to throw the south into confusion upon a field hardly a mile square were lying some seven thousand or eight thousand dead and wounded many of them having been there for twenty-four hours some had gone deep into the muddy swamps and stuck fast there dying or laying the foundation of some terrible disease Acres of forest had been slashed, or cut, about five feet from the ground, to prevent the passage of troops and artillery. The southern commander-in-chief, General Johnston, had been killed by a shell in this battle, but the substitution of General Robert E. Lee as commander led to great reforms in the Confederate Army. Lee at once removed the camps from malarious swamps. He provided supplies of wholesome provisions and reclothed the hungry, starving, and mutinous men, so that in a few weeks they looked stronger, fought better, and behaved as men under discipline. Every evening the countersign was given out, and sentinels were posted to prevent spies crossing the Chickahominy. In the Federal Army were men of many nations, Scotch, Irish, German, Norsemen, and others it was told of an irish sentinel that he stopped a stranger halt who comes there me a friend of the chaplain have ye the countersign no faith and if you were a friend of the divil and had no countersign you couldn't pass this way not on no account sore but i tell you i am a friend of your chaplain and i forgot to ask him for the countersign don't you see that it sore then be jabbers what's to prevent me giving to you the countersign eh nothing i suppose if you will be so kind come closer and be jabbers i'll just whisper it in your ear there now stand and answer who comes here a friend a friend right and maybe you have the countersign i have it is good night mother quite correct sore pass on and good luck to you 
a long siege is such dull work that the northerners used to amuse themselves by chaffing the young negroes when they caught them in the lines perhaps they would give the nigger boy a bit of food then suddenly say sambo what relation are you to jeff davis's coachman the black eyes would roll and the whites enlarge as the grinning nigger replied i ain't no sort of connection with that ere sir you're a sakesh i reckon na sir i'm union boy oh then we shall have to flog you sambo don't you know that in this part of mcclellan's army we are all at heart good rebels lord a mercy i never thought of that and now i do think on it i do agree that i am a bit of a rebel anyhow then all the listeners would burst out laughing at poor sambo and he left the camp befogged and bewildered once an old gray-headed negro came into camp and some young officers began to tackle him think we can take richmond boy dar be right smart a men round here but i don't know about dar being able to take richmond sir right smart a men said a captain why this is only a flea bite to what's coming to eat up the rebel army you'll see em coming up like locusts here's mcclellan and half a million around here and there's burnside down there coming from carolina with a hundred thousand more and general banks with two hundred thousand more and general fremont why he can't count his men he has so many the old fellow opened his eyes wider and wider as the list of imaginary armies was run over then gazing up intently in the officer's face got all dem men he asked in a subdued voice yes and more the negro threw out his arms and ejaculated oh dear mesopotamia whatever will become a massa i wonder the negroes wanted to be free but they did not want to work many of them who had run away from their masters were employed by the federals in unloading stores they worked from daylight until dark singing over it talking shouting arguing making such a shindy a virginian negro never did a quarter of a day's work on his master's plantation and they soon found out the difference when they became free niggers and earned wages they did not much relish their rise a party of niggers would come up to the colonel's tent well boys what made you leave your master wasn't he kind to you oh yes massa very kind very kind indeed well didn't he give you enough to eat oh yes plenty of dat plenty of dat enough to eat well boys what made you leave him why de truf him dat he made us work mong sugar canes said one and we heard about de north as such a place so we taught that we might go to um said another nice place why how do you mean a nice place well sir we was told dat nobody did no work up dar even the white peasants in virginia seemed to be lazy and indolent they lived in little cabins and only the very young or old were left as every able-bodied man was in the army they were dressed in homespun and spoke with a drawl they did not wish to be richer content with one acre and a single cow tories of a most old-fashioned kind and the women like the boers were far more dangerous rebels than the men and tried to entrap unwary federals when they got them drinking in their houses all round by the river four miles from richmond was a succession of dark swamp yellow field and brown hillside batteries were placed on all the ridges guarded on either side by woods and in front by earthworks the confederates on the other side of the river had fewer trees but stronger earthworks on the first of june there was an artillery duel begun by the richmond batteries but they had to beat a retreat into the woods before the precision of some german gunners sometimes the pickets of both armies were so close to each other that they made an agreement not to fire at one another then they got to exchanging newspapers and tobacco telling the news and altogether behaving as if they were rational human beings and not machines sent to kill one another for political ideals far beyond their kin once when a new jersey regiment was upon picket federal scouts were being served with their allowance of coffee and one of these latter observing a southerner gazing wistfully at his smoking cup beckoned him to come over and have a drink he came drank smacked his lips and walked slowly back then he looked round and said i say friend how many times a month do you fellows get this good coffee oh just three times a day said the jersey man three times a day why if that's true i'll not stay a day longer in the confederate army here lad i give myself up 
and the fellow actually let his friend take him prisoner on the twentieth of june general mcclellan reported that he had a hundred and fifty six thousand eight hundred and thirty nine men but he could get no reinforcements and the armies of the south were increasing the rains were making quagmires all around and disease was rife among the troops about this time the confederate general stuart led a successful raid with twelve hundred horse and two pieces of artillery round the rear of the federals driving in their cavalry pickets till he came to garlic's landing where he destroyed two schooners and many wagons and captured many prisoners one federal a german dragoon scorned to fly with his comrades and fought a duel with a texan trooper the german was a veteran in the wars of europe and attacked the texan who was a little advance of his troop both were skilled swordsmen and while they fought the rest pulled rein and looked on the german sat his horse as if he were part of the animal and wielded his sword with parry cut and thrust like lightning flash the texan on his fleet barb wheeled swiftly round and round seeking in vain for an opening at last the texan slashed the german's shoulder and as blood spurted from the wound the texans looking on raised a cheer but as quick as thought with a backstroke the german cut through the sleeve and flesh of the texan's left arm and his blood began to flow then the texan backed his horse and spurred again upon his opponent making a lunge at his breast this the dragoon parried with great dexterity and brought down his sharp blade upon the other's shoulder thereat the texan wheeled his horse once more drew a pistol and shot the dragoon through the heart Colonel Estran, a Prussian officer in the service of the South, who witnessed this scene, but disapproved of the Texan having recourse to his pistol, writes this. Much moved by his fate, I ordered a grave to receive the remains of the brave German trooper. We buried him in his regimentals, with his trusty sword on his breast and his pistols by his side. I then sent for the Texan, and after reprimanding him severely for his cowardly conduct, I ordered him to seek service in some other corps, telling him that I could not think of allowing a fellow of his stamp to remain in my regiment. The Texan scowled at me with his cat-like eyes, and, muttering a curse, mounted his horse and rode away. I think some of us may deem that the Texan was hardly treated by this Prussian officer, who felt so indignant at the shooting of the German trooper. The Texan had received two severe wounds. He was not bound to fight only with the sword. He carried pistols. So did the German. Why, if they were not to be used, why carry them? It was the Texan's duty to kill the German, and he did so. No wonder the poor fellow muttered a curse. Days of disaster were coming for the Northern Army. They were spread along the river and through the swamps for more than twenty miles. The South could sally out of Richmond and strike any one point before support could be sent up. Part of the army was north of the river, part south. They dared not march on Richmond, now so strongly fortified, and to retreat was fatal. General Jackson had joined General Lee, and every day there was fierce fighting. In the Battle of Gaines Mill, where the North lost twenty-two guns, the Federal General Butterfield, at a critical moment, came coolly down the knoll in the thick of a hot fire, and sword in hand, seized the colors, waved them aloft, and so encouraged the valor of his regiment, shouting, Your ammunition is never exhausted while you have your bayonets, and use them to the socket, my boys. Seventy thousand men were hurling grape, canister, and bullet against thirty thousand. It was one loud and continuous roar. It was only gradually that it was forced upon the Federal troops that they were beaten and were in full retreat to the James River. Battles are like games of chess. The great thing is to bring as many pieces into play as you can and mass them on one or two points. The Federals had over a hundred thousand fighting men, but only thirty thousand were engaged in the Battle of Gaines Mill. On the 28th, McClellan wrote to the Secretary for War, I have lost the battle because my force was too small. If I save this army now, I tell you plainly that I owe no thanks to you or to any other person in Washington. You have done your best to sacrifice this army. The Federal rearguard did their best to cover the retreat. 
they blew up the ammunition which had to be deserted emptied the barrels of whiskey and molasses bent the muskets and dismantled the forsaken wagons but the roads were thronged with sick and wounded and hundreds lay down to die in the awful sun ever the victorious south were riding in upon them and making havoc on one of these charges general butterfield seeing the utter misery and downheartedness of the men gathered together all the regimental bands and placed them at the head of a brigade in one great burst of sound which rose above the clamor of the battle they started the star-spangled banner with the first few notes the men's spirits rose and a new energy came to them they stepped out and sang lustily and other regiments caught the brave infection and cheered in chorus such are the uses of music in war in our own regiments in the boer war when the men got weary with the long march a colonel would shout to his sergeants have you any men who can sing put them in front then the regiment would step out and forget their weariness the richmond dispatch describes the battlefield thus money was found abundantly among the slain one man found not less than a hundred and fifty dollars in gold one lucky finder had no less than six chronometers ticking in his pocket at the same time our men seemed to take great delight in assuming federal officers uniforms and strutting about serio-comically much to the amusement of powder-begrimed youths who sat lolling and smoking in the shade the cannon and arms captured in this battle were numerous and of very superior workmanship the twenty-six pieces were the most beautiful we have ever seen while immense piles of guns could be seen on every hand many even hardly tarnished the road to james river was strewn with stragglers tired to death hospitals were filled to overflowing when they came to white oak swamp bridge there was a block of wagons cannon ambulances etc twenty rows of wagons stood side by side teamsters swore and horses jibbed and officers shouted a confederate officer writing of the battle of malvern hill describes how the gunboats on the james river helped the federal retreat how shot from rifled guns came hurtling through the woods tearing down the largest trees we passed over four lines of our own men who lay close to the ground and dare not rise to face the grape and canister our men trampled them into the mud like logs one man in his haste to get out of danger shoved me on one side and just at that instant a canister shot tore his head off as you may suppose i was not much vexed at his want of politeness early next morning i rode over the battleground i came upon numbers of dead and dying horses and the wounded one a fair-haired yankee boy of sixteen was lying with both legs broken half of his body submerged in water his teeth clenched his fingernails buried in the flesh his whole body quivering with agony and benumbed with cold in this case my pity got the better of my resentment and i dismounted pulled him out of the water and wrapped him in my blanket for which he seemed very grateful one of the most touching things i saw was a couple of brothers both wounded who had crawled together and one of them in the act of arranging a pillow for the other with a blanket had fallen they had died with their arms around one another and their cheeks together but your heart will sicken at these details as mine did at seeing them and i will cease the word resentment in this letter reveals the bitter feeling that springs up when men of the same nation are at war the battle of malvern hill was the fiercest of the seven days battles and the loss on both sides was terrible when the troops came in sight of james river muddy current and low banks they rushed down with mad impetuosity many plunged into the stream in a very frenzy of delight those who for hours had suffered agonies from thirst now stood knee-deep in the water and drank like fish the horses were as delighted as the men and neighed to their friends here the troops rested and enjoyed the supplies sent up from white house but a storm came on the second of july and changed all to mud and sticky surfaces but the sound gave up their tents to the wounded and soon many steamers took the poor victims of the fight to a more comfortable abode 
mcclellan had lost fifteen thousand men in the awful struggle of the last seven days but the south had suffered more heavily and richmond was crowded with the wounded and dying the president thanked the general in a letter saying i am satisfied that yourself officers and men have done the best you could it was not until three years after this in april eighteen sixty five that richmond was evacuated by general lee before generals grant and sheridan president davis was in church when an orderly splashed with mud walked up the aisle and handed him a paper in the first glance he saw that all was over and a few hours after he was in full flight on monday morning weitzel with his army composed partly of colored troops marched into richmond with bands playing the city had been fired and the stores plundered main street was in ruins and the bridges over the river were broken a thousand prisoners were taken and five hundred pieces of artillery it is said that the colored troops entered richmond with proud gait and shouts of ecstasy welcomed enthusiastically by their dusky brethren who thronged the streets they laughed and shouted prayed and wept and kissed one another in a delirium of happiness they thought that now at last the white races would acknowledge their equality but the world has not yet got rid of its old prejudices and their sun of happiness was doomed to suffer an eclipse in a few days lee surrendered the federals first heard the news from the cheers of the poor famished army of the south twenty-two thousand all that was left of them stacked their arms and filed past in a great and solemn silence the cruel devastating war was over now was seen the strange spectacle of the enemy sharing their rations with a conquered foe they were no longer north and south now they were all americans citizens once more of the united states destined perhaps in a not distant future to teach europe that peace is better than war love is stronger than hate god's kingdom supreme over the transient empires of this little world End of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: The Siege of Paris, eighteen seventy, eighteen seventy one, with the Germans outside. The Germans invest Paris. Trochu's sortie fails. The English ambulance welcomed. A prince's visit to the wounded. In the snow. Madame Simon. A brave lieutenant piano and jam the big guns begin st denis old jacob writes to the crown prince a dramatic telegram spy fever journalists mobbed after the french emperor was defeated and taken prisoner at sedan a revolution broke out in paris and the terms of peace which had been agreed upon were refused by the parisians so the germans marched on paris arriving on the eighteenth of september by the end of october two hundred and forty thousand men began to encircle the ring of fifteen outer forts which guarded paris trochu was the governor of paris on the thirtieth of september he made a vigorous sortie across the marne to the southeast where he hoped to join the french army of the loire and also at the same time to relieve paris of some hungry mouths but the grip of the germans was too strong they had been allowed time to strengthen their positions and the sortie failed though the great guns of the forts had boomed and crashed until they were glowing hot an english ambulance under mr young and captain furley was received by the german doctor with great enthusiasm for medical comforts were growing scarce in the field hospital the stores were carried into the doctor's own room and as the box of sundries was unpacked it was splendid to see the delight of the good man porter he cried ganz gut ale ganz gut chloroform ach gott twelve hundred cigars du lieber gott and his hands and eyes went up in delight and gratitude the woolen clothing alone must have saved many lives after supper that evening the german doctor got up and made a little speech gentlemen some people go about and make large promises which are never fulfilled what an example of the contrary we have now before us mr young and captain furley 
heard of our state they let no red tape stand in their way and now this afternoon there comes jogging up our avenue a wagon bringing what is health nay what is life to our poor sick and wounded here is the englander all over gentlemen the bulldog that has no wind to spare in superfluous barking the officers present raised their glasses and shouted hawks for the english ambulance it is pleasant to hear of such comradeship between men of different nations the next day we are told that after desperate fighting the headquarters staff of the german twelfth army corps sat down to a very sombre dinner-table and spoke to one another in hushed voices for many chairs were empty this dinner-time that had been occupied at breakfast not a man in the room but had lost dear friends and many had lost kinsmen and some had brothers lying out on the snow on the forenoon of the fourth day there were found eight poor wretches who had survived the inclemency of two nights hard frost frost-bitten they lived two days after they were found the germans after two days hard fighting drove the french back into paris with the loss of six thousand men but they themselves were very disheartened their loss in officers was very large the hundred and eighth regiment lost thirty-six officers out of forty-five in the knapsacks of the french soldiers were found provisions for six days showing that they had hoped to cooperate with the southern army of the loire one day the prince of saxe weimar went to visit the wounded Württembergers, a big man and a kindly heart he went round with a box of cigars under his arm asking each patient can you smoke it was pitiful to see how they all tried to smoke though some were too weak to enjoy their weed now the prince comes upon a stalwart under officer are you married no highness but my mother she has three sons down all wounded and it might be bad for her the prince took out a gold piece here my man send that to the mother and let her know it comes from your queen it seems that the germans had quite mistaken the amount of provisions existing in paris according to their calculations by the middle of december paris ought to be feeling very hungry on salt rations at the very best they had not yet prepared for a bombardment with siege guns hoping that lady famine would drive the parisians to surrender but they made no sign down at Argenteuil, on the northwest of Paris, there was the crackling of the chasse from over the river, and yet most of the population had come back to their shops. They gossiped in the streets with French gaiety and unconcern, while the bullets sang overhead freely. The steeple of their beautiful church made a good observatory, though its sides were riddled with holes made by shells. The French peasants drove their carts into the market-place below the church, and sold eggs and butter full merrily. Yet somehow, if a German stood at a window to gaze out, the French sharpshooters would aim at him. At Longy there were generally a thousand prisoners a day passing through to Germany some were so ravenous with hunger that they stooped to pick up turnip tops and bones from the gutter until the british society organized a relief with stores of preserved meat and bread and there was no hospital for the wounded the poor creatures were dumped down in sheds vans the station rooms the church the marie in one day there arrived eighteen hundred wounded they were bestowed frozen hungry hopeless in the cold comfort of the church madame simon the lady superintendent of the saxon ambulance did noble things day and night a most devoted woman there were feats of quiet bravery done every day there was a colporteur of the english bible society who used to drive his wagon on a road between jeunesse and aulnay a road exposed to shell-fire more than most yes he said it is a good time for the men to read good words when they are standing with the shadow of death hanging over them there is a story of a boy lieutenant von schramm who found himself suddenly in a crowd of frenchmen he leapt from his horse and hid in a house in the hope of escaping by the back door but his pursuers caught him and were taking him toward st denis which lies in the north of paris in going through the park of le berger the officer who carried von schramm's sword was shot and fell the boy made a dash for his own sword grasped the hilt and cut down the man on his other side rushed the small lake dived in to avoid pursuing bullets and swam safely across to rejoin his regiment 
The strange thing was that he had been on the sick list before his winter ducking, but now he was blessed with a boy's appetite. It spoke well for the German besiegers that they got on so cordially with the villagers round Paris. These were mostly of the humbler sort, or servants left behind to take care of their master's house. There were lovely country houses inhabited by a few German officers, and were it not for the rents made by shot and shell, the owners would not have grumbled much at their condition when they returned to them, though of course there were cases where the boisterous fun of German lieutenants played havoc with ormulu and gilding. I remember hearing of a grand piano which gave forth reluctant sounds when the notes were pressed down. It was discovered that the strings had been plentifully smeared with jams and sweetmeats. But these jests were the exception. The bombardment by the big guns had begun late in December, with much excited wonder on the part of the Germans. Surely in a few days the Parisians would have had enough of exploding shells. Now here was almost the middle of January, and no effect visible. But the forts round Paris had no living population, no houses to be burnt, no women and children to mutilate. They had to be battered to bits, if possible, and Paris was behaving very heroically now. By the middle of January she was living very poorly indeed, but she endured yet another fifteen days longer. As for the German soldiers, they began now to feel bored to death, as so often happens in a long siege. The first excitement evaporates. Each day's unlovely duties recur with abominable sameness, and the Germans could find no beer to drink. A German is used to drink plenty of beer, and can carry it without ill effects, but when Fritz took to drinking rum, schnapps, or arrack, he began to reel about the village streets and look rather disreputable. It was a strange sight to mount some hill and get a view of Paris surrounded by its fifteen forts, and in a yet wider circle by the German lines. The foam of white smoke surged up all around. The thundering roar of cannon, the dull echo of distant guns, made dismal music to the ear. The air of Paris was so clear compared to our English cities that all was quite visible, and now that wood was scarce and fires few, it was easy to mark the outlines of the larger buildings, though above them hung a brown pall of smoke caused by exploding shells or houses that had caught fire. Day after day there were rumors of this or that fort having been silenced. Now it was Saint-Denis on the north side, now Valerian on the west, now Vincennes on the east, but the respite was only given to cool the guns or renew the emplacements, and all was as it had been. Besides this, there was the daily fear of a new sortie, as Issy or Ivry broke out into fierce clamor on the southwest and southeast. Then troops would be hurriedly transferred along frozen or sometimes muddy roads, while splinters of shell were whizzing about rather too familiarly. It was calculated that on a fierce day of firing the Germans shot away ten tons of powder and nearly two hundred tons of heavy matter, iron and steel, were hurled upon the forts and city in twenty-four hours. There is a story of the Crown Prince of Prussia which illustrates his kindness of heart. In the third Württemberg dragoons was a certain Jakob, who had an aged and anxious father. This father had not heard from his son Jakob for so long a time that the old man, in his rustic simplicity, sat down and laboriously wrote a letter to the crown prince, asking, Can your highness find out anything about my son? The old man knew his son had fought at Wirth and at Sedan, but nothing later than Sedan. The crown prince did not throw this letter into the waste-paper basket, but sent it to the officer commanding the Third Württembergers, requesting that the old man's mind should be set at ease. Jacob was sent for by his commanding officer, and asked why he had not written home. "'Do you know that His Royal Highness the Crown Prince wants to know why you have not written home for many weeks?' The man saluted. His purple face was a study." go and write instantly and bring the envelope to me sirrah how the story got about among the men how often has the same experience come to housemasters when some loving mother appeals for help please make harry write home 
both harry and fritz need a touch of the spur at times but how promptly the letter is written when they feel that touch the town of st denis suffered terribly the front of the theatre was in ruins the cathedral being banked up high with sandbags had not suffered so much the tombs of the kings had been thus protected so had the statues and not even a nose had been knocked off but the bombardment had shattered many houses and churches and the shells had ploughed up the streets or rather hoed them up into holes it was only in the cold and dark cellars that safety could be found even there people were not always safe and when they were pressed to take refuge in paris they peeped forth shuddering and swore they would rather die in their own cellars than sally forth through a tempest of shell-fire at nine o'clock on the evening of the twenty eighth of january eighteen seventy one while the headquarters staff of the may's army were assembled in the drawing-rooms of the crown prince's chateau after dinner an orderly brought in a telegram to the crown prince his royal highness having read it handed it to general von schlotheim the chief of staff that officer perused it in his turn and then rising walked to the door communicating between the billiard room and the saloon and there read the telegram aloud it was from the emperor and it announced that two hours before count bismarck and m jules favre had set their hands to a convention in terms of which an armistice to last twenty-one days had already come into effect this startling news meant that paris was ready to surrender how many hearts were lighter in both camps next day war is not all glory and heroic achievement those who know what war is pray to god that statesmen and nations may think twice before they rush into so terrible a calamity in this war of a hundred and eighty days the germans had won fifteen great victories captured twenty-six fortresses and made three hundred and sixty-three thousand prisoners paris is utterly cowed fairly beaten so they said who came from paris to the german lines and a few non-combatants journalists and philanthropists ventured to enter the city before the german troops passed in on the first of march they found the streets crowded with men in uniform the food shops had nothing to sell there were a few sickly preserves nothing solid worth eating some horses fat for a delicacy to help down the stuff they called bread a fowl was priced at forty-five francs sticklebacks were fourteen francs a pound butter forty francs a pound outside the baker's shop stood a shivering line of ladies and women waiting their turn for loaves that tasted like putty and pulled to pieces like chopped straw but there were in side streets many of the roughest the most cowardly and cruel ruffians of the worst parts of paris they were on the prowl waiting for their prey so no wonder that mr archibald forbes journalist and several others in diverse parts of the city had unpleasant experiences forbes tells us he was walking down the champs elysees when he met the crown prince of saxony with his staff riding by forbes raised his hat the prince returned the salute and passed on but the dirty gamins of paris had been looking on they hustled the englishman called him mouchard spy sacre prussien cochon tripped him up hit him on the back of the head with a stick then when he was down they jumped on his stomach with their sabots or wooden shoes he struggled as a scotsman can got up hit out right and left but numbers prevailed and he was dragged by the legs on his back with many bumps and bruises to the police station there he showed his papers and the prefect released him in a humour that said i am mighty glad you parisians have had a good thrashing another journalist so he told me in london a few weeks later also had ventured to stray away from the german sentries in order to see what paris thought of a siege he soon found himself the centre of an angry throng some cries he is a sacre poussien see his yellow hair no i am an english artist shouted my friend still smiling he is a confounded spy take him to the seine duck him in the river they dragged him towards the river bank out of his eye corners my friend saw several boys pick up stones to help him to sink he thought his last hour was come they were close to the river the water looked very cold then there came to his ears the tuck of a drum 
a company of french soldiers was marching by a colonel on horseback rode beside them the artist recognized him for they had once chummed together near metz he called to him by name and the colonel cried halt he spurred his horse through the evil-smelling crowd and seeing who it was whom the rascals were going to plunge into the seine held up his hand and cried let that english gentleman go he is no prussian but an artist who has drawn my portrait mine i tell you for the london journals he is my friend an english friend like mr wallace this testimony was enough for them the excitable crowd flew to the opposite extreme those who had made ready to stone him like a water rat now dropped those stones and rushed up with remorse and even affection in their changed looks threw fusty arms round his neck kissed him on both cheeks sobbed and cried for forgiveness for their little mistake indeed it is not safe to enter too soon into a conquered city from my experiences of the war by archibald forbes with the kind permission of measures hurst and blackett End of chapter seventeen